to like know when you're shooting? Yes, so I can just res in here. Now we're having and there's little arrows that let you know where the bogeys are. That's right, yeah. So I can shoot at them, they shoot back at me. And then what will happen is because we're over a multiplayer system, uh, over Wi-Fi, we can actually play against other friends. Oh, so this is multiplayer. So yes. you could be two people in, in the room Yeah, battling. we could have a room full of friends and we could all be battling against these alien robots or against each other. And we could also send robots out to attack. Or you can have them come back and defend against you. So. Well, that's, that's just pretty cool. There you go. All right, I see zombies here. Zombies okay. are trendy. Yeah, zombies are very popular. Um, and, and also a very trendy zombie. I mean, this teenage girl zombie is dressed. Oh, so cute. So, <laughs> so what's going on here? So basically, what this game is, it's called Zombie Burbs. And what, what we've done is we've tried to demystify what zombies are all about. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, I think they're just misunderstood. They don't want to eat your brains. They just want to eat trash. Oh. So this game is a combination. I never knew that. Yeah, that's right. See, it's something you find every day. So what we're doing is we're, we're combining like the, the play and the fun of The Simpsons with the Munsters. And we're creating a little uh, gaming system that you actually take this figure and it unlocks different levels in the game. Well, how is it able to know? I mean, it's conductive paint, you told me earlier. Is yes. that how it is? And what is, yeah. what's on the bottom So there? each each figure that unlocks the levels has a, its own unique fingerprint. Uh -huh. So I literally, I control the game with this figure. So just this, I'll, I'll put some, I could give him a zombie roar. And wherever I aim is where I shoot. So the, the figure is controlling the game. Zombie gas is always a good defense. Yes. So I've seen something like this too that uh, Disney has done with their Cars game where like you put the physical car on the iPad screen. Is this a trend that retailers are getting interested about? I think this is a big market that's starting to uh, come to fruition this year. What we're finding is that there was one or two apps individually and this is one of the reasons we created a whole line of apps is to make sure that there was different ways to interact and people understood that there's a lot of different ways to play with these, these, this gaming system. So. And, I mean, kids are already playing with iPads, iPhones. Uh, wasn't an iPhone like one of the biggest requested gifts this year when they do surveys from kids? That's, that's right. I mean, is there a worry that maybe this is too young? I mean, are kids actually owning these devices? Well, what we're finding, we did a lot of research, and, and, and even internally we found that we were, people were nervous about doing something like this. Mm -hmm. And when we started doing our homework, we found that a lot of kids, the number one, like you said, the number one requested gift was an iPhone this year for kids, 8 to 12. So, and then when you go to the ballpark, when iPad 2 came out, guess who got all the iPad 1s? It was all these kids Hand dragging me down around iPads. these things. That's right. So, what are you going to do with those systems, right? You're going to play games on them. So, right. you go to restaurants, you're in the, a car trip. They're going to get these devices to play with. And this holiday alone, there was over a billion apps that were sold. So, I guess app toy accessories is just a natural fit, but are retailers now making new aisles in their stores yeah, for these kinds of it, things? It's exciting because I think we're kind of inventing a new genre in uh, gaming and, and gaming uh, platforms. When we started, um, we were thinking it was going to end up in toys, but what we're finding is a lot of people are creating whole new sections. Uh, some, some people are calling it app accessories. Some people are putting in the video sections, and then there's whole new sections that are just dedicated to this type of gaming system. Wow, pretty fun. All right, so overall, most prices for these things are around $10? Yes, $9.99 for everything that you've seen here, except for the, uh, the Elite Command R, which is $19.99, and that's because you get a gun packed full of electronics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the idea is to make it easy and accessible for people, just like uh, when you download an app for 99 cents. It's not a big risk. People can try it. They can have fun with it. Uh, and we want to do sa the same thing with uh, app gear. We want to make it fun and accessible and easy to try. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, I appreciate the demo of all these fun little toys. No problem. All right, we're going it back to you with more first looks at some cool tech. From iHome, the first one is an executive iPad system. Uh, it's a keyboard, it's a speakerphone, and a speaker, and it has USB charging on the side, two USB, USB slots. Um, so it's a little executive system. It kind of looks like an old style computer, a little bit like a Tandy computer when you put the iPad in it. Uh, the other product is the IP4, the iHome IP4. This is a retro style boombox, comes in two colors pink and dark gray, very funky, uh, has a dock inside it, also an FM radio and a line input, you can carry it with you on the go. I'm David Carnoy and that's iHome here at CES Unveil.
Paul Sloan with CNET here at CES Unveiled a day or two days before the show, and we're here to see something called GoPanel. Tell us what it does. GoPanel Micro is an accessory for your iPhone 4 and 4S that lets you capture 360 degree panoramic videos straight from your phone. So we can see it here. There we go. And I can spin around and look at the camera person, look at the crowd around. All right, that's super neat. Why does anyone want it? Well, it's a uh, it's a way to experience uh, a scene in a way that you can't do with just a single viewpoint of the camera. Uh, if you're at a party and you want to share uh, your experience with your friends who couldn't be there, this lets you capture the entire event. And then they at home can look at it uh, any direction that they want and uh, choose, uh, choose their own viewpoint. And how much does it cost and when's it available? $79, it's available now. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ray Needleman, and joining me now on the CNET stage are Samsung's Ryan Biden and Jay Kelby. Uh, thanks, guys, so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk first about a quintet of cameras here. Uh, Jay, what do we got here? These are, uh, they're all little point and shoots except for one little uh, zoom yeah. cam there. What do we got? Uh, Samsung's announced a bunch of new cameras at CES. These five in particular are interesting because we, we're, we're, we've launched them under our smart camera moniker. They're all connected cameras with Wi-Fi. They um, all have Wi-Fi. They all have Wi-Fi, yeah. Okay. This one is my favorite. I know this has been out for a while, but you guys got to check this out. If you're uh, taking pictures of yourself, it's got the little front view thing, which is now stealth. When you turn it off, you can't even see it's there. So, uh, but this is the this is the low end one. That, well, that's our DV three hundred. It's okay. at one ninety nine. It'll be available in March. That one has um, Wi Fi. It'll go. You can go right to Facebook. You can email. Um, we also have apps for all these cameras as well. That'll be out for. Remotely uh, control it. Uh, okay. We have a browsing app that allows. Put that over here. Okay, sorry. There you go. Hang on a second, guys. We're doing it live here. There we go. All right. Oh, where were we? That'll be on the blooper reel. <laughs> um, we have a, a, a Smart Connect app that allows you to uh, browse to your camera from, from your, your smartphone, your tab, uh, any, any iOS or Android OS device. Select your images, move them over um, so that you can then edit connected uh, 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 so interactivity with an as operation. You, as you move up the line here, we've got some bigger, chunkier, more, uh, more rugged cameras. What, what do these guys have that the lower end ones don't? Um, Really long zoom, low light capabilities, mm -hmm. things that, that, that are differentiated from what you get off your, your, your smartphone or your, or your, or your tab. Mm -hmm. um, really give people reasons to, to, to use a camera um, beyond the, the smartphone they've already got. Uh -huh. um, so we, just saw, we just saw the other day, uh, uh, HTC I think, they have a smartphone with a 16 megapixel camera. So how do you get people uh, off of their super convenient smartphones and, and into using something like this? Yeah. Really, the, the, the reason these are better, um, long zoom. This, this camera has a 21x zoom on it, which, oh, okay. which you're not going to get on, a, on a, an integrated device. Um, it has a backside illuminated CMOS sensor in it, so it's a crazy low light camera. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the kind of things you can't do with, with a smart device today to give you better pictures. But instead of really fighting your, your smart device, this, this, this interoperates with it. It works with it. So you can connect, share, control with your smart device that you've got with you anyway. So that's the uh, top of the line there, that yeah. guy? And what's that called? It's and a, our WB850. Yeah. Um, it has GPS in it as well. It's got a bunch of other really cool features. It's the only camera on the market that, that does true dual capture. Because of the way we, we make the sensor and clock the sensor, mm -hmm. you can, while you're shooting HD video, it can also take full res still images, uh, which is unique oh, in the really? marketplace. Yeah. yeah, OK. That's pretty cool. Uh, and when, is, when and how much? Uh, May at uh, 349. 349. Okay, so that's a, that's a good I'm investment. Sorry, May 379. I 379. Apologize. You do have a 349 dollar model too. No. Okay. <laughs> What's the next one down? Uh, ST 200 10x yeah. zoom piece, yeah. also Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, 10x zoom. Okay. As well. Cool. And you've got another uh, uh, traditional. Um, this is, looks like a uh, video camera form factor here. Uh, pretty light for one of these things. Yeah, that's our, our QF 20. Again, it's it's Wi-Fi connected. Um, we had a it's a follow-on piece to one we, we had out last year called a, a, a Q10, and it's a switch grip camcorder. Switch grip. So if Go you're left-handed, right-handed, yeah, it'll automatically <laughs> orient. This one also has another cool feature for people who shoot uh, 
vertical, it'll automatically correct and orient for that, which is unique in the market as well. Ah, for skyscraper photographers. Right, right. There you go. All right, well, thanks so much. Uh, we also, um, Samsung also brought a bunch of uh, the new tablets, including one of the talks of the show, which is uh, the world's largest phone or the world's smallest <laughs> tablet. Now, that's called, uh, tell us about that product. What's it called yeah, so and what's it do? This is the Samsung Galaxy Note. Yeah. This is our 5.3 inch smartphone. So it is very much at that larger end of the smartphone scale. Okay. What makes this really unique is a couple of features. I mentioned it's 5.3 inches, Super AMOLED, mm -hmm. uh, 1280 by 800 resolution. So uh, HD resolution screen. Mm -hmm. But what really sets that device apart is the integrated S Pen. So it actually slides out of the bottom. And yes, it th is a phone and you can make calls on it. So this one has a, this is a, uh, uh how does the pen come out? We got a pen. Yeah. Okay. So that's the S Pen. Um, it's yeah. similar to a capacitive stylus in that you can use it to interact with the device, but it's a little more active than that. So we've actually integrated a digitizer into the device as well. So you can get really fine accuracy and control, like 0.7 of a millimeter accuracy with the device. Mm -hmm. It's got uh, various levels of pressure sensitivity. So depending how hard you press on the screen, you can impact oh, okay. what you're doing. And you might notice there's a side button on the stylus as well. Yes. That we've integrated with both the applications and the operating system. So what you can do is, for example, if you hold the button and press the screen, it'll actually t just hold it static for a second. It'll actually take a screen capture. Oh, OK. So I'm taking ah, took a screen cap. OK. Yeah. Um, if you hold the button and double tap, it actually brings up an app called S-Memo Lite. And so what that allows you to do is on top of any application, quickly jot a note. So think while you're on a phone call, you want to take some information down, um, do something like that. Okay. And then save it. And then because we've got that fine stylus control, you can do a lot of things with photo editing, um, like being able to free crop and very delicately uh, edit photos, create collages. And then because it's actually a 4G LTE device, it makes it really quick and snappy to, to share those. So what network does this run on? We see AT&T up yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been even it's your product, and even you're apologizing. No, for no, it. I, it's it's a common question. Yes. So this is actually this device is just coming to North America now. It's been available internationally for a couple of months, mm -hmm. um, and like all of our devices, we're evaluating ice cream upgradeability and all that kind of stuff. Man, what a screen! This is people are gonna you're gonna have to get clothes makers of the world take note. You're gonna need to make bigger pockets, <laughs> uh, or just ditch the phone and go with yet another lineup. Which one is that now? So 0.7. It's a 7.7 .7 inch tablet. Yeah, so it's a new addition to our seven inch range. Okay. Um, it slots in at the high end. So at 7.7 .7 inches, it's slightly larger than our other seven inch devices. Mm -hmm. But what it what its kind of differentiator is, is the Super HD Super AMOLED Plus screen on that. So you've got 1280 by 800 resolution on there as well. Mm -hmm. So okay. HD resolution big, bright, vibrant colors. So taking those screens that have traditionally been found in our smartphones and brought it up to a tablet. And this has a Verizon logo on it, so this is another... Yep, so another 4G LTE yeah. device, and that one's going to be on Verizon's network. All right. Uh, is this available yet? No, so it'll be out a little bit later uh, mm -hmm. as well. We don't have timing or specific availability announced. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're going to ask the question, that is a honeycomb device. Yes, that is the question I was going to ask. Yes. Yeah. So talk to us about fragmentation. I mean, I've got an, I've, this is my own personal phone here. This one's an uh, ice, ice cream sandwich. Yeah. This one's honeycomb. This one's yeah. just, come on. I mean, we, <laughs> we, we hear complaints about uh, fragmentation in the Android uh, market all the time. But generally, we don't expect to see that much fragmentation from a single vendor. Yeah. So talk to us about what's going on sure. there. Sure, so it's one of those things where this, it's this balance of speed and compatibility. Mm -hmm. So as kind of, the ecosystem evolves as we want to bring products to market quickly. We have to make certain choices about where the operating system and where the software is going to be at the point when we want that software to launch or that product to launch. So for us, obviously, fragmentation mm -hmm. is an issue, is a challenge. Um, I mean, Google's done great stuff with Ice Cream Sandwich to try and bridge the gap between gingerbread and honeycomb and start to bring those diverging pieces back together. Mm -hmm. And you'll see us going forward want to follow that model as well. So over the air upgrade. So if I buy one of these devices, will I be able to upgrade to the latest operating system? Yeah, so it's our intent to allow consumers to do that as much as they can. Obviously, at a certain point, there's hardware limitations around what you're going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't want you to buy a device today and feel like you're going to be stranded with okay. the OS that's got on it. Now, I'm asking all the, 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 the big vendors here the same question about ecosystem and infrastructure. Again, uh, uh, Samsung, giant company, televisions, refrigerators, 
uh, cameras, and literally you guys make refrigerators. Yeah. And do you also make washing machines? Yes. Yeah, so do they all connect and how do you manage to get people, uh, uh, how do you make that all work when there are all these different little ecosystems from Sony, Apple obviously, the big one, uh, everybody's trying to do that. What's, what's your meta strategy there? Well, we've got a, a kind of a core interconnectivity uh, piece called AllShare yeah. uh, for Wi-Fi peer-to-peer -peer communications that will let us send images from our camera to our tab to our refrigerator, mm -hmm. really to the refrigerator. Okay. Um, we just expanded that and announced a show, a, a cloud service called AllShare Play mm -hmm. that enables that these home devices to connect to a cloud server, Samsung cloud server, and connect back. So that if I wanted to, I could take pictures with my camera, send them to my tab, send them up to the cloud, put them on grandma's refrigerator, mm -hmm. so I can expand my, my cloud interconnectivity and device interconnectivity to my friends, family, neighbors, as much as I want to as well. Okay, and that, that would be free for all the your right. Samsung products. Uh, all right, so uh, what else should we be looking at here, uh, I, these are is it, these are both quad core machines. So they're actually dual core. Okay. Uh, this guy is a dual core 1.5 gigahertz, mm -hmm. and this is dual gig or uh, dual core 1.4. Um, okay, so that's the the the, the 7.7. .7. Yeah, 7.7's got dual core 1.4. Okay. Um, eight megapixel rear facing camera. Right. On the Galaxy Note, uh, three megapixel on the rear of the tab. Obviously, you're going to be doing less shooting with a tab than you would otherwise. Um, only three megapixel camera. Only three megapixel camera. Hmm. Tell me more. <laughs> you just want people to buy the cam, the, the, the full-on camera. Do you guys fight with each other over cameras? No. Okay. No, it's actually interesting because they're really complementary strategies. I mm -hmm. mean, when you think about it in terms of cameras, what smartphones give you is that immediacy to capture the moment, right? So you're there and you, oh, I want to capture that really quickly and do it. Right. When you're in a, when you want to capture memories and you want to do something that's a little bit higher quality, a little bit more structured, let's call it, than kind of that immediate thing. We've got the great range of cameras, and it, that falls through to kind of what we we're talking about with all share play, right? Okay. This idea that you can kind of start with one device for one need, add another one. So not everybody's going to have the TV or the washing machine necessarily, but when you right. add them, we want to be able to take advantage of it. Can I send pictures to my washing machine? Um, no. So the washing not machine. Today. Will the washing machine take pictures of my clothes and send them to my tablet? Not that I'm aware of. No, but it will. Your phone will let you know when your laundry's done. It, and really, we can't comment on future washing machines. No, machines. really. Yeah. Yeah. You, so we actually. I'm 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 gobsmacked. Hang on. So your, my my Samsung washing machine will yes. call me and say, "Dude, your laundry is wrinkling. Get down here right now." Well, I'm not sure it will call you specifically, uh, but there is an app available or will be available for your phone that will alert you when it's time to switch the load. I suppose that makes sense. Dishwashers, refrigerators, your food is rotten, you're a bad <laughs> parent, oh, what else will it tell you? We're just trying to make your life easier. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that makes it a lot easier. Um, what else is going on in the Samsung booth? So we've got uh, cameras, we've got uh, a giant phone and a small tablet. You guys also make uh, regular sized tablets, yep. uh, the Galaxy Tab. Yeah, so um, at the booth we've got, uh, obviously we also do a lot of TVs. Yep. We are the number one TV manufacturer, so we've got loads of very beautiful uh, super OLED and LCD and 3D TVs at the booth. Mm -hmm. We've got the appliances that we've been talking about, so mm -hmm. fridges with integrated displays, washing machines, um, and a lot of the technology you don't normally see from us, so a lot more um, either industrial applications or very specialized like healthcare, education, a lot of those kinds right. of things. Great, well guys, thanks so much for coming in and showing us our uh, your new uh, cameras and tablets and phones. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Up next is Buzz Out Loud, but first, more cool products we've been seeing here at CES 2012, and a behind-the-scenes look at the CNET stage. Stay tuned. Hey guys, Brian Tong here at Las Vegas at CES 2012. Now we're just a couple days before the show starts. Everyone's unpacking their boxes and setting up their stages. We wanted to give you guys a first look at what people will see here from the South Hall Escalator. And right away, boom, there you have it. That is our 25-foot Ever Brian screen with all the announcements of what's happening at our CNET booth. 
Then next to it, you have this amazing eight foot in diameter, shiny Arsenet Red Ball logo. We kind of like to call it the Skittle because it looks like you could eat it. But that guy, we want to take that bad boy home with us after the show. You'll also see right next to it, our stage from behind. You'll see a ticker on top that has all the latest information of what's happening over there. But enough about the outside. Let's go inside the booth so we can show you what we have cooking inside there. Hey guys, so we're here at the CES booth. We have all these boxes and crates that we're pretty much unpacked for the most part, but what you guys came to see is, voila, our entire CES 2012 stage. It looks beautiful. Right now we have our first looks due. This is where a lot of our editors get the, the gadgets and the devices that you wanna see. They'll be shooting them here in front of everyone live. Then we're gonna kinda of come out here into our lounge area. This is where all of you guys can kinda of hang out with everyone. You'll see here, our friends of Sprint have provided these charging stations because you know at CES, you need power for your toys. Then we've got this amazing wall here. We have three screens set up here. And then uh, I guess you could call this our wall of fame. Uh, I don't know so much about that. Over here, we have our little lounge area where tablets will be set up and the lovely, the exclusive, you know you want one of these. How, how, how can I get them? Well, if you come by our booth, maybe you will. All right, let's keep on walking over here. You'll see, again, this is our main stage area. Kind of a different look. We'll have our entire setup with our plasma behind there. This is where we'll have a lot of our live content going on. But again, it looks amazing. It's really reaching up high and tall. So uh, we have a, just an excellent presence here at CES. Now in past years, you guys have been able to see our editors hard at work from the outside. This year, you know, they're kind of behind this cloth curtain type wall, but we want to still show you what's happening inside, kind of some of the guts and the stuff that you really won't see at all if you're here at CES. So let's just kind of walk you this way. I'm going to take you over to our editing bay and stations. This is where really all the action happens. All the first looks, all the pieces like the one that you see here, they're all being done. You guys are hard at work, right? Really working hard. Hey, this, the show's in two more days, so you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be hustling and crunching away in a little bit. Now there's also a lot of audio and video equipment that goes on behind the scenes that controls all the screens and all the visuals you guys see here at our CES 2012 booth. So what we have over here, laptops with laptops. These are backups to some of the content that we're displaying. We have our flash animations for our schedules. Over here, this is some of the video content that you'll see that appears on our plasmas. And then this big rig over here, this is the setup that controls that large 25 foot Everbryant screen. It pops and this is all the machinery that makes it work. And then of course, you see a lot of cables, you see a lot of buttons, but over here we love to have the screens within the screens that manages every single piece of content that you see pumped out from here and onto the stage. So that's the back of our huge 25 foot Everbryant screen. But let's take you right here into the control room. You're standing here where all the content is really directed and created and controlled. Now we have this little peephole that reveals the entire stage. We still have people working on the stage. And right now, let me, let me give these guys like a little bit of moral boost. Hey guys, nice job with the tape. See, they like that. All right, now when we come out here also, you'll see where all the cameras are viewing. This will help our director put up the vision that he wants to see on the screen that you guys will see at home. And then we're gonna kind of take you back down here because we have a lot of live content that's streaming out here pretty much 24 seven during the entire CES 2012 show. So what we have on our stage, right? We have all of our podcasts like Buzz Out Loud, the 404. We also have some amazing interviews that we're gonna be doing up here. One of our huge feature panels is gonna be Women in Tech. You'll find that here on our stage. Also huge interviews with LL Cool J and 50 Cent. He's coming back to our stage as well. Now we'll have plenty of things. And the biggest one, of course, is the best of CES award show that you can see right here. So make sure you guys stick with us, watch all of our coverage. At Hey guys, Brian Tong here at CES 2012 and we have an amazing first look, a first time ever. This is the Cube 3D printer from Cubify and joining me is Rajiv Kulkarni. He's the general manager of the Consumer Solutions Division. Uh, I'm, this is just some amazing stuff. We have a lot of these models that this printer has been able to build. And could you kind of talk to us about bringing 3D printing to the consumer? Sure. Um, what we are doing here is we're launching a platform called Cubify.com of which Cube is one part of the solution. The platform essentially brings create and make uh, environment into the homes of people. This is where people can bring their ideas to life in 3D. With this printer, what we're doing is we're making the process of creating digital content and actually producing it in your house quite easy to use and simple and intuitive such that anybody in their house, a mom, a dad, a kid, can actually use it and um, make fun stuff out of it. 
Now, this is a printer that prints out an object five and a half by five and a half cubes square, the space that it takes up. It's gonna retail for $12.99 in the right. first quarter of 2012. Um, it, it makes some of these really intricate products. There's a lot of community that it has support. I mean, look at this. You know, on a larger scale, their service allows you to upload some of these images to a cloud service. So this is this is pretty much a chainmail Michael Jackson glove you have going right. on here. Right. Yeah, you go. So, can you talk about um, bringing this to the masses? How, how easy is it for someone to do this? So, so uh, the, the issue is you you can't just hand a printer to somebody and uh, say go do stuff with it. The, they need digital files to begin with. So, what Cubify.com does is it provides an avenue for the community to come together and upload 3D printable designs on Cubify itself. What it does, it, it takes the entire process of creation and making and brings it and makes it very accessible to any person who wants to do it. So for example, we're taking you know, this platform shoe like this and someone might have submit the base design of the shoe but all this intricate work can be added on by a consumer to Correct. make this theirs, right? So, so this is a fairly complex design and you would expect some of the artists on Cubify to upload this design. Somebody else would add an app which, where you can write a name, put your signature, or add some other aspect to this design. Once you add that, you can either print a small version on this cube, or you can use our uh, cloud 3D print service to have this delivered to your house. Something as large as this trendy belt, this is made from a 3D printer on exactly. a larger scale like in this. In one piece. Yeah, in one piece. Right. All right, well this is amazing stuff. Uh, we'll be looking to launch out at least people getting access to Cubify.com and start submitting the work. What day is that gonna happen? Well, uh, the cube will launch in the next few months. We haven't decided the date. Cubify.com, the platform will launch on the 10th. And then you can even make things like this train whistle from this printer? Yeah, the kids love it. All right, should I give it a try? Yeah, absolutely. You blow hard as you say? Yeah. All right, here we go. Very well. There you go, it <laughs> works. All right, so there you have it. It's the Cube 3D printer coming out in the first quarter of 2012. Rajiv, thanks for your time. Thank you All very right. much.
It's January 10th, 2012. I'm Brian Tong. I'm Molly Wood. Welcome to Buzz Out Loud live from CES. It is episode 1574, our first show from CES. And I know you know us as a newly weekly show, but you're getting three shows. We're going to mix here. it up a little we're bit for you while we're out here. CES. Just the way excited. you like it. Welcome to our like little tiny studio audience, John Strickland. It would not be see buzz out loud at ces without john Strickland. no without a doubt we know a lot of you are inside the show when they open the doors they bum rush here then they'll come back yeah you'll be they'll back they'll come back tomorrow you'll be they'll come back. back the day after that no we're very excited we're doing all an unbelievable amount of live content from our stage every day we did all i'm sure you saw all the press conferences yesterday bt has been out there with his little backpack doing the live shots being a little monkey being a little monkey running around for us. Like, I do want to say during those backpack shots, we, we're one of the, not one of the, pretty much the only kind of media outlet rocking this mic flag. He, if you don't know what this is, this is three OLED screens wrapped with the motion video and our logo on it. Look at that. How this sweet is the is that? best How swag sweet is that? ever. All right. Our buddies from the Recom group hooked us up with this. They said, you want to rock it? I'm like, of course I do. Of course. And so uh, a lot of people are asking about it. It's sexy. It's one of the fun little yeah. knick-knack gadgets, you know, that not only do we get big TVs and MP3 players and phones, but sometimes the simple stuff yeah. is also fun. So. And then, so not only do we have by far the most comprehensive coverage here at CES, including live streaming coverage, but we also have the best mic flag to boot. So. <laughs> We're going to have a good show today. I'm very excited. We have Roku here. We're going to ask them about the new version of the Roku. It just keeps getting smaller and smaller, yep. like it was a deck of cards, and now it's a dongle. Uh, so we're going to bring them up on stage. I have, I have a direct message, at least, from Robert from? Scoble, who says okay. he may drop by the show today. And then, of course, we're going to have all kinds of amazing stage stuff. If you're watching our live stream, you can find it on ces.cnet.com or at cnet.com slash live. All the press conferences yesterday, a bunch of live shows today. LL Cool J is LL coming cool to the stage is going to be today. on the stage here today to talk about a new product he has dropping called Boom Dizzle. So this is a collaboration <laughs> software. So it's really cool. It's you know that, the, the boom report. the boom Dizzle. It's, it's from the, from the '90s. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but you can't call it Boom Dizzle. You can if you're LL. Uh, yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> if you're LL, you can call it whatever you want. Anyway, we're gonna get started with our show. Yesterday we said press day, and the biggest, uh, probably the biggest deal yesterday, keynote wise, was Microsoft's keynote. Yeah, the no, last one. The last one. Now, at their keynote, though, it wasn't like they really shook things up. And it wasn't that we weren't really expecting the shape. That's to a shake pretty generous up. way to put that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Our headline on the story uh, at, <laughs> at CNET was Microsoft at CES. Nothing to see here? I mean, oh. we were hoping that at least, I know they're leaving CES and they announced that they were leaving CES. And then it makes perfect sense for them to leave in some ways because they're really doing. Windows, right? They're doing platforms. They're not doing hardware. The consumer electronics show doesn't make sense, but it was kind of interesting because Gary Shapiro introduced Balmer yesterday. Gary Shapiro is the president and CEO of the Consumer mm -hmm. Electronics Association, and he gave this very pointed little talk ahead of that, and he said, you know, we're, we're expecting Microsoft to be back anytime. I, <laughs> and then he goes, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a leader of Microsoft back here sometime very soon. Really? Oh, no, he well, didn't. How, how did How did Bomber react to that? I don't know. He was backstage, but he probably killed somebody. <laughs> but at, at the same you know, time, even before we came here to CES, you know, we were hoping at least some sort of, you know, a nice bon voyage, a, a bit of do from Microsoft. But some it was news. really, again, Microsoft's platform with Windows uh, 8 and Windows Phone 8, it's all about the vendors that are here showing off their hardware using, using their OS. Yeah. And if those devices that they release will be successful, you know, we'll talk about a couple down in our show later, but uh, that's really the, the question, if they're going to be able to rise from this. Uh, mm -hmm. They're really banking on Windows 8. They really are, and, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Windows is their biggest product by far, now I'm way louder than you. I just keep futzing with this thing. Uh, Windows is their biggest product by far. They're focused on Windows 8 for tablets, not just for computers, uh, and, and Balmer made it very clear that Windows is the biggest thing they have going, and so they talked only in kind of a cursory manner about Windows Phone, mm -hmm. although they did sort of lean on that, uh, and then they only a little bit about Xbox, because to me, Xbox is their other really promising platform. And yeah. they did announce one partnership with News Corp that'll bring some like apps from Fox News and some others, Wall Street Journal to the Xbox, but not anywhere near kind of the content, the level of content announcements I thought they might do. Yeah, and at the same time, we, because the Xbox really, they get all their publicity at 
E3, mm -hmm. and they're kind of there's a lot of rumblings of what Microsoft is going to be doing, and that's really their most successful hardware platform yeah. that they've had out there. And so, with rumors coming out of oh, there might be a new Xbox, they're not going to they're not going to really push anything from there here at CES. Although some of the success from Microsoft's Xbox is being brought over to their computers, where they're saying they're going to be releasing, you know, the open up the Connect. Right. For, for their Windows PC machines. Yeah, that's probably Coming the in only, February 1st. That's that was, the only actual news, yeah. yeah, is Connect, like you said, February 1st to Windows. But we don't know what it's going to do. Yeah. They didn't really say Where, kind what of cameras, what... What will the camera look like for the PC? Right. Right, it'll be different. Will it be integrated? We don't see, at least up to this point, any hardware manufacturer saying there is a Microsoft Connect camera scaled down, integrated into this laptop, integrated into this PC. Yeah. Is it just an announcement? Hey guys, here's the API. Well, we need to see hardware that supports it too. We do, and we need a few. We need a few more details, but that is really interesting, and it really dovetails with a big trend that uh, I'm kind of surprised to see around TVs here. You know, we were all expecting connected TV and 3D and 4K and OLED, and we're seeing all of that. Yeah. But we're also seeing a ton of announcements around voice control and gesture control for televisions. I thought that was at least a year or two out. I'm, I am frankly surprised to see that so soon, but I think it's really interesting, and this seems to be part of that whole movement. Everybody's like, we want to wave our hands in the air and make things happen. Yeah, I can tell you from using, just earlier this morning, I was able to interact with Samsung's uh, smart interaction with mm -hmm. their voice control, with their gestures. When you say, I thought it was a year or two away, I'm going to still agree with you on that. <laughs> Based on what I saw, and you know, they're, they're, they're cool concepts, but the responsiveness, they need a, everyone yeah. wants to add this human interaction, this connect ability. It's going to take some time. I'm not going to lie, I can only think of one reason that I would want to use the voice control with my TV. Even ta David Katzmeyer in our chat yesterday, the live blog chat, he said, I, I really think actually I'd rather just push a button than say channel two. Yeah, to I, I got to fiddle with it for about an hour. You know, we'll talk about it a little more when we get to Samsung stuff, but yeah. um, it's, it's still got a ways to go. So other uh, press conference thing, we're not going to go through every press conference. You can find it all on our site, ces.cnet.com. We covered them all in depth with live blogs and wrap up posts, or most of them. Um, but the, there were a couple other really interesting ones. Probably the, the <laughs> on the live, if you were watching the live stream yesterday, you saw me come out of this press conference, Panasonic, and I was like, I have three words for the Panasonic press conference. What just happened? Were you excited or were you scared? Well, I was excited because it was Justin Timberlake, but I'm, now I'm getting ahead of myself. If you didn't already, so, okay, so Panasonic comes out with this, they, they're going with the press conference, and it's just, it's really, I'm not going to lie, it's dragging. It's yeah. going on and on and on, and it's all about 3D. TV and not passive 3D TV. Like they did announce their first passive yeah. set, but they're all about active shutter 3D TV, which is exactly the technology that everyone said no thank you to. So I'm thinking, okay, these guys are crazy. I don't understand what they're doing. Their TVs look great, but this is nuts and also really boring. And then the next thing you know, they have a one more thing moment. <laughs> and, and, and their one more thing is my space TV. Well, okay. Right now, when, you, when you say that, you pretty and much... And then out comes Justin Timberlake! Just well, at yeah, the moment where we're all is... going, no, this is not happening. This is like kind of a joke, right? MySpace? MySpace TV? Justin then... Timberlake, the face of the investment group that swooped up on MySpace. Exactly, and I don't think people remembered that, that he just invested a ton of money in MySpace. So I guess they have to do something with it, but it was surreal. The, the thing about the, what they announced, right? We didn't see any concept, but the idea that they're going to throw out there or what they're hoping to push forward is social interaction, real time, yep. while watching your TV shows. Now, we've seen pilots of this done. I do feel like there is going to be a place in that, with that, because currently right now, if you, any of you are on the group messaging phenomena, yeah. four or five of my buddies were real time group messaging the entire game. Right. You know, people do want to do that. People do that. People do that. My we, brother we've done and I talk on, on the phone. We do yeah. like live play by play. We just won't even talk. When we used to live far apart, yeah. it was very expensive. And so the execution of that, there, I think there's definitely a, it, it ha, it's not there yet, but there's definitely, I think, you know, some innate thing when you watch a sports game to be able to interact. Now, if it's just yeah. your friends or a large pool of uh, flame wars between who's going to win between the Saints or the Niners, which we know who's going to win that game. <laughs> Niners. <laughs> but, but that's the type of stuff, right? You can either get that down and dirty conversation yeah. or it could be with your peers. I, I like the idea, but again, this, when you just throw the idea out there without any product, well, when yeah. are we going to see it? And let's be honest, I like that idea okay, but I have a pretty good implementation of that now. I like to call it Twitter. But, but I mean, when you're watching it within not, the show? Yeah, I mean, 
Well, that I think that happens now. It I think does, that it does, Twitter, it does. It's you know, trained us. Definitely social networking has revived the idea of appointment viewing because mm -hmm. you do want to watch at the same time as your friends so that you can be talking about it on your social networks. Uh, I find that Twitter is the most useful for that. What they demoed, though, is sitting on your couch with yeah. a little keyboard yeah. and sort of typing messages to each other. And that, I mean, I guess I'm already sitting there with my phone. I don't know. It's hard to imagine. Mainly the biggest problem is I'm not going to join MySpace to do that. Yeah, and if it's, if it's the... Or right away, my MySpace when they said MySpace, right, people were kind of already laughing. The, right. the name MySpace has lost any brand equity now. It's kind of a joke. People laugh. The, na the name of MySpace is kind of a joke. Yeah. Now they they can get rid of that name, and if they implement that functionality on the TV, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. And will are we conditioned to? I I think if it was just something like we could still use our phones, but it would post to this show chat room. That right. that's more something that we would be more you know we're used to that. I think if they can demo it in a meaningful way. That maybe because, like you said, there is that there is that desire. Group I watching like is big. It, There's right? TV check-ins now. You know, it's definitely something we want to do, and nobody's quite figured out exactly. how. Man, though, you got to change the name of your. You, get, you can't be standing up there talking about MySpace. <laughs> that's, you just that's, can't. You can't do that. Like the audience laughed. Apparently, our trailer. I saw a tweet from Lindsay Turrentine, our editor in chief, or edit, yeah, and and Donald Bell's down there. Maybe he can confirm that our trailer erupted into hysterical <laughs> laughter. There's like, nah. -uh. MySpace TV. I don't know though. We're we're I, just so you know. Yes, we are trying to get Justin Timberlake to come to the stage. Yeah, <laughs> we are all over that. <laughs> LL. What? So that, anyway, so that was exciting. That was exciting. Uh, and then the other big piece of news before we bring Roku up that happened just before the show was that my prediction from last year I failed, but then now it's your prediction from this, this year, year, and this you year. win. Toshiba is planning to ship their glasses-free 3D TV to the U.S. To the in US. early 2012. Yeah, sometime this year. That was one of our little predictions. And, uh, you know, they showed it off uh, Sunday night at their show. They, they were really the first company to throw out a concept last year yep. of glasses 3D. And you really had to be it in a bold. sweet spot. But the technology is getting better. I don't know if every... I'm not going to be buying one anytime soon, but it is going to be on the market. I don't think any of us are going to be buying one of those anytime soon yeah. unless our stock options are worth more than we thought. Because apparently these TVs, the 55-inch versions, are already for sale in Overseas. Germany and in Japan, and they cost $10,000. Because not only are they glasses-free 3D TV, which is already on its own a huge engineering challenge, they're also 4K, but sort of a slightly modified version of 4K, so they're HD glasses-free 3D. They're showing them off in the Toshiba booth, so if you're here, go check them out. We were actually there on a corporate tour about an hour ago, and they weren't all turned on yet. <laughs> I was like, come on. <laughs> I'm assuming that you still have to sort of hold pretty still, you know, and, and that viewing angle might still be a problem, but you got to think that on a TV like that, even a 2D picture is going to be pretty astonishing. Well, I, w with what we've seen also, Sony has their own future technology booth. You actually have the ability to move side to side without right. being in a sweet spot with this glass of 3D. So it's getting there. It really, it really looks good, but it's a concept that they're not going to be selling anytime soon. I can't believe. I really, truly can't believe. It feels like this, the biggest disconnect ever to be walking through all these manufacturer booths, especially Panasonic and Sony and the guys that are still doubling down so heavily on active shutter TV. LG made a big deal about the fact that they really think passive is where it's at and where things are going because nobody wants to spend, I mean, the market has so clearly demonstrated, in fact, TV sales charts show it clear as day that the market has demonstrated that nobody wants to pay a premium right now for that particular feature, yeah. you know? Even HD took a long time to, to take hold. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Roku will be on the stage with us, so go ahead and tweet us your questions for Roku. I have a couple <laughs> in the lineup already. Dun, dun, dun. And more news from CES.
Alright guys, welcome back to Buzz Out Loud here at CES 2012. Now we told you we'd have a special guest from Roku, VP of Marketing, Chuck Cyber. Hey. Chuck, Chuck Cyber. Cyber. Best name ever. How appropriate. Not, it's like not a superhero spelled like, name. Not spelled like Cyber Cyber, right? No, unfortunately. That would be way more cool. So yeah. you're here with us with Roku. Uh, before CES, we always get a lot of announcements of products that are coming out. Roku dropped another bomb with their new, if you want to hold it up, your new sure. streaming stick. This is pretty much the Roku in a the, stick. Yeah. It yeah. shrinks it down a lot more. Um, see, can you hold it up by your face and then our camera can Yeah, yeah, that'll give you an idea. Oh, like how, my face? Yeah, right. it'll give you an idea of how small it is. There we go, yeah. Okay. We'll use your face for scale. Now, <laughs> some of the, one of the things that about this, the, the whole Roku interface is going to be on this device. That's right. One of the challenges uh, or, you know, one of the obstacles right now is that the connection it's using is like a mini HDMI port, correct? Uh, it's using a standard uh, form factor HDMI port. Oh, it is. Okay, great. Uh, the difference is this HDMI port is enabled by MHL technology, which, is, uh, which allows it to send control signals and also power. Okay. So that's how this uh, streaming stick can plug into your TV and not require a separate power connector. Now, have there been, I know there weren't, at least up to this point, there weren't, were there that many vendors that have said they will be including that port on their TVs coming out in 2012? Yeah, there, uh, a lot of major television manufacturers have already announced their support for MHL, mm -hmm. including, and, uh, you know, Toshiba and Samsung already have products in the market. Um, LG just announced a range of products which include MHL ports, and we're expecting that it's going to become uh, pretty ubiquitous within the next couple of years. So this is, in, for a lot of people, it's kind of a future product because unless you have uh, one of those relatively new TVs with the MHL support built into the HDMI port, that's right. You in can't really use this guy. That's right. You can't use it uh, for a TV that you've recently bought, for example. Right. But when we launched the product, our launch partner is Insignia brand, which is a major oh, yeah. television brand by Best, Best Buy. Buy, and uh, Insignia will have products with the MHL port, and this product will be. Uh, Merchandise right alongside of it, and it'll be available as a bundle. Now we oh, talk okay. about we talk about Roku, and we love it here at CNET. We've talked a little too much about it sometimes. And <laughs> one one of the things that you're here for is to strike those content deals, right? It's That's all right. about the content. Yes. Um, what can you tell us on that front? Oh well, I'd love to tell you. I'd love Everything. to be able to tell you more. I mean, the main <laughs> what thing can I can. What you and what will you are two different questions. <laughs> well. I I can't uh, talk about specifics, but what I can say is, you know, Roku's committed to having an open platform over time. And so we try to be as developer friendly as we possibly can. Um, there's a reason why a lot of major content partners, as well as smaller ones, pe ones that people may not have heard of, you know, come to Roku first. It's because we're really easy to work with. We get our products quickly to market. We get uh, uh, their services quickly to market. We can support, you know, if they need to have a premium service or if it's free or if it's ad supported. Um, we can make it really easy for them. It's a little bit different if you're trying to work with a very large established company who maybe is maybe has some other objectives. Um, are the so connected TV is such a huge trend here at mm -hmm. the show? Is that a threat to you? I mean, it, it's sort of you know I've definitely noticed with my new connected TV that mm -hmm. I have some of those services built in. So is content really going to be the thing that sets you guys apart? Well, I think it's a combination of content and uh, clever hardware solutions which fit anybody's home. So, you know, obviously we have our streaming players and those are good for basically any TV that's out there. So if you've got a TV, you know, whether it's your primary TV or your second second TV, TVs don't, people hold on to TVs. Even if they move them around their house, they're going to be there for six to eight years. I mean, they're too big of an investment. Right. For people who want a more integrated TV experience, that's what the streaming stick is for. And uh, we think we can see enough momentum behind the MHL feature that, uh, you know, this will be our smart TV strategy. I mean, this is, this is a, in, in our minds, a smarter way to build a smart TV. You don't have to embed, you know, the cost and complexity and, uh, and you know, the snapshot in time that a smart TV is right. and expect that to work for six to eight years. Mm -hmm. Instead, you can get one of these things. You can plug it into a perfectly good TV from you know, any major manufacturer. And in a couple of years, if you want to upgrade the hardware, it's as simple as swapping out a stick. Is, right. is the future of Roku, though, still to be in hardware? Or do you guys, you know, the, the app itself, you know, is great, but is it something that you might just license and, you know, have those deals so the Roku app just lives on these other TVs? Yeah. Is, is the hardware business being profitable for you guys? Yeah, the hardware business is very profitable for us, and and our trajectory has been excellent. Uh, 
2011 was a big year for us. Um, our sales tripled compared to the previous year. Uh, we are now distributed in every major retail outlet. And, uh, and you know, the trajectory for the streaming player market in general is terrific and we're the leader in that market. So, so hardware is going to be a good business for us for a while. Now having said that, you know, I think it's fair to say that you know, you know, the market is evolving quickly. And the good thing is we're very good at hardware, but we're also really good at software and services. So you know, whether or not uh, our business sort of evolves so that it's not as heavy on, soft in, as on hardware in the future, you know, that's, that's possible. Yeah. What's the deal with uh, YouTube? <laughs> that would, that's my big question. We can have some YouTube. On yeah, Roku. well, um, <laughs> we would love to have YouTube too. You know, we're looking. Are you meeting to... with them here? This mm. I think I have a Google guy. I can talk, let you talk to. We're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have Schmidt later. We're meeting later. with somebody that rhymes with YouTube. No, I, um, uh, I, you know, YouTube is clearly a hole in our lineup. We used to have a um, a, a version of YouTube which wasn't officially sanctioned by YouTube, and that's why it's not available right now. Right. But, you know, we think that's something, that's a hole we're going to plug pretty soon. And then uh, the big question I got on Twitter, actually, from four or five people was, is a Spotify channel coming? Can you speak to that at all? Um, we love Spotify. We just launched in the UK today. And oh, uh, Spotify is a huge music service in Sweet. the UK. So it, we would be remiss not to be actively working on something like that. Okay. Noted. All right. All right, awesome. Do you have any other new, what do you, just in terms of this sort of, this kind of connected TV trend in general, streaming is obviously such a big part of the TV experience. How do you see that changing the landscape of, of media overall? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously we think that streaming is just going to continue to become, uh, it, eventually we think it's going to become the dominant way that people consume entertainment on TV. I don't think that's a big surprise. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, industry dynamics that are going to change when that happens. It, you know, it will enable more, uh, competition within a given market, you know, um, it'll enable customers to have a lot more choice. Now, having said that, I think um, one of the things we always strive for is we try not to turn this into a tech technology solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, some people kind of point out how our remotes are really simple and um, the UI is very simple. You know, all these things are going to get better and better over time. But we want to continue to have the mindset of having a product which is so easy to use that you can drop in front of your TV and you don't have to whip out a keyboard or you know you don't have to do any sign language and you don't have to do um, you know know the right voice command channel I, 2 I think you'll, right <laughs> no I everyone, everyone else seems I meant to channel do that. 2 <laughs> yeah not 2 2 not youtube uh, channel 2 just right. kidding just kidding well that won't show up yet uh, <laughs> way to drive it home there buddy no I think, um, I, I think if we can uh, keep it as simple enough uh, simple enough so that Basically, anybody feels comfortable watching TV this way will have accomplished our objective. Great. Thank you so much. Chuck right. Cyber Thanks, from Roku Thank with the new uh, Roku on a stick. Thank you so much. Have <laughs> oh, a great uh, CES. And Thank it'll you. be available in the fall oh, yeah, this the, year, is that correct? It's coming in the second half of this year. We'll work out the exact timing okay. uh, shortly, and it'll be launched in conjunction with uh, Insignia Brand Television. Pricing? It's, we haven't fixed pricing yet, but it's going to be in that fifty to hundred dollars range. It kind of depends on the features that are built in. Okay, okay awesome. Thank Excellent. you. Thanks a lot. Thank we, you. And we're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, a little more wrap up from CES. A little bit extra news. Buzz out loud, live from CES 2012.
Welcome back to Buzz Out Loud, everybody live from CES 2012. We're here at our stage in the South Hall. If you have not been here and you're on the show floor, you definitely want to come visit it. We're above the Starbucks, so we're pretty easy to find. You can go up the escalator. You can't miss it. We and also the 25-foot screen. I was going to say, yeah, also the absolute glow from all our LEDs and our giant glowing red balls. And the, oh, it is awesome. Uh, I think our stage has never looked better, so yeah. I'm completely, I want you guys all to come Kudos, and check it out. Kudos, props to our marketing team. Beautiful. Hands down. Love our stage. All right, so actually, this is one of the rare shows so far where both Brian and I have had an opportunity to walk around the show floor, even though it's the first day. Usually that doesn't happen until like the end of the show, at yeah. least for me. Uh, and you've been on stage duty. So we have seen things. And I got to say, there's a couple like unexpected trends happening here. One is that um, 3D printing is turning into kind of a big deal at this show, which I did not see coming at all, except also I, w I want one. I want one of those. Well, we, you know, we did. We were able to do a first look with, um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, with the Cube 3D home printer. Yeah. And um, home printer, right? What, home. Home. You know, five by five little d d object that you could print out. But it's kind of fascinating because I think it's the gadgetry of it all. Like seeing this thing lay down the plastic row by row, and then the models are extremely detailed. Yeah. This is not like a, a ball or like a step. So it's anything from a train whistle to an elegantly de designed shoe. Right. And so, I, MakerBot's doing one as well. Uh, there's, there's huge, you know, there's the urban vinyl kind of Etsy home craft type community that'll definitely jump on board on this. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, it costs twelve ninety nine around that price point. It's not something that I'm gonna buy anytime soon, but clearly it seems to, it's been capturing people's imagination right. because we've never been able to do this at a home, from a consumer level. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly is not for everyone, and I would have a hard time coming up with a use case for it, except that it's pretty <laughs> amazing to see a printer at your house print out an iPhone case. Yeah. It's just yeah. really, it's just a, it's a flashy demo is what it is. Yeah. Also, you know, we've talked about before the show about the all about the connected the TVs. Um, there's, not, there's one that's, that won't be coming out uh, here in the U.S., but Lenovo threw out kind of an amazing TV that they'll be um, releasing in China. It'll be based on Ice Cream Sandwich. I got to play with it last night at Digital Experience, and I thought, you know, unfortunately it won't be coming to the U.S. yet. They're going to roll it out in China first and see how, see how it picks up. It's called the Lenovo Idea TV. We have the video up on a CNET TV, but I thought out of all the TVs, it had like a touch remote where you swipe things. It, its remote also could be used to play games. Like they pretty much had a ripoff of Wii Tennis built into the TV. Wow. But the interface, the, the sleek UI, and all the functions and features, it, it, was, it was good. You're also seeing a lot of facial recognition with yes. these TVs with cameras. The creating user stuff. profiles, in yeah. addition to gesture stuff, I'm sorry, but. No, but yes, exactly. Yeah, creating user profiles that scan your face, identify your face, know your settings, know your apps. That I, I, I didn't expect to see facial recognition implemented in TVs at the CES. I didn't, I didn't see any. I didn't see that one coming. Same with the voice and the, the gesture recognition overall. And I am, but I am thrilled about the trend toward putting cameras into TVs. I think that's fantastic and like a great way to Skype. I always want to Skype with the family, with my son. And to be able to do that on the TV, that's probably the only way that I would actually get to hold his attention. That, that was my... <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. it's on the TV. I'm paying attention to grandma. That was my prediction two years or a year too early. You know how you had the 3D yes. TV prediction a year totally. too early? That was mine. So now they're here. They're Lenovo, both here. Lenovo is actually doing a bunch of interesting stuff because they also have Ultrabooks on tap and they did this one that they're calling <laughs> the, I want to hate it, but it's kind of awesome, it's the Lenovo awesome. Yoga convertible the, laptop. The Yoga. The convertible laptop, it allows it to flip, uh, rotate on its hinge a complete 360 degrees. So they have like four different shapes, yeah. right, that you can fold this thing. One of them being the, uh, the tent, the where tent. you have bo both sides of the laptop at an angle, like a tent. I don't know why, but I like it. <laughs> I just do. All right, anything else you've seen before we get into some of the other news? That HP, what is it, the Spectre? Yes. The HP NV14 Spectre. Now, if you want to talk about taking it's design hot. to a whole new level, Gorilla Glass kind of made his made their name uh, just being on you know the iPhone screen, but now Gorilla Glasses have the second generation of that material, mm -hmm. and HP is coding the outside of one of their labs of the Spectre completely with Gorilla Glass. Now probably if you drop it, it'll shatter. Yeah. But if you don't drop it, it won't get scratched. But it looks amazing. Yeah, it like, does look it amazing. It looks, you know, so we, we get lured in by the looks. I really te want them to, they're here, Corning is here with a Gorilla Glass 2 display and I am going to spend some time over there because I'm hoping that they're trying to smash things because yeah. that's good TV Yeah. over there. Uh, but they say it's going to be thinner, stronger devices. So. 
Hope Springs Eternal for that. All right, so then yesterday there were some other announcements, obviously. Just two of the bigger uh, press conferences, Samsung. Samsung had a killer press conference, and we definitely think that they're going to have a huge 2012. Uh, I can't believe how much stuff they've managed to pack into a single <laughs> press conference, considering that they do phones, computers, do appliances, uh, Phones, computers, appliances. Oh yeah, I know TVs Laptops. and amazing ones. Uh, the thing I they have I, super OLED, not the, just regular yeah. OLED, super OLED. The thing I like about Samsung though is they they sometimes like you say like to throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks yeah. because they do so many different things. Like they're they're releasing a 7.7 .7 inch tablet. Now we know about a 10. <laughs> we know about a 7. Maybe 7.7 .7 is the holy grail. I but think they have a nine inch too. I think Samsung, like you can get to the millimeter with the specific <laughs> device you want. The the big head scratcher for me, I mean, really, I just saw that OLED TV this morning. It is absolutely astonishing. It's ridiculous. Looking. It's ridiculous. But yeah, to get there, you have to go past the Galaxy Note, which is their 5.1 or 5.2 inch, 5.3 inch baby tablet phone stylus thingy. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was just a vanity project for someone. If you're, if you're a digital, you know, they're, they're, they're bringing the stylus back. They're really trying to promote it as, like, for digital artists to sketch profiles. Back. Yeah, I'm just like, ugh. It's weird. Ugh. It is totally weird, and I don't know who's going to use it. And it, it's amazing, too, in that array of, like, incredible Samsung stuff <laughs> and the, the Series 9, which I just I tried not to lick it. And the, all. then you have this sort of the Galaxy Note, which is just, like, I don't all know. All right. Okay. We'll Good see. Good on you. Good on but you they for do, trying. I mean, they are, they are serious about industrial design. They finally, how many years have I sat on this stage and begged for Wi-Fi in my cameras and asked the question with my fist pounding, why my camera is the only dumb device left in my pocket? Mm -hmm. Over and over and over, year after year. And finally, Samsung rolled out actual Wi-Fi connected cameras. They talked to your other Samsung devices. They, auto they introduced basically their version of iCloud. Mm -hmm. If you take a photo with one of these cameras, it's automatically uploaded to your computer. Yeah. You know, and it's part of your whole, I mean, they're really, they're creating an Apple-like ecosystem. In fact, we're gonna have, boom, Tim Baxter, their president of consumer and enterprise stuff in for Samsung America, on our stage at Next Big Thing later today talking about opposite uh, Google's Eric Schmidt, talking yeah, about sort of yeah. two ways to approach that ecosystem thing. It's going to be, and I feel like we couldn't have a better guest because that was what they were all about yesterday. And on the show floor, you can feel it. It's all about the ecosystem. Yeah. Buy our products, buy apps from our stores, yeah. be locked in, use our hardware. Be locked in. Be locked in. I just, somebody should just put up that banner, like say it like it is. <laughs> be locked in. Lock us in. But you know what, if, it, it, if I'm going to be locked into anybody, at least I want it to be a company that also makes my refrigerator. Because I am, <laughs> but I'm sorry, but this is the year. This is the year of smart appliances. It was last year the year of smart appliances? Well, last year everybody was sort of creeping in and you guys made fun of me. And now this year they are legit. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. everyone can see how awesome they are. And that LG, the closet steamer thing that you put your I clothes don't, I in. I don't even know what that and is. And it dry cleans them and it steams them and it makes them smell good. I will have that by the end of this year. Now, what, what, how much is that thing going to cost? I'm going to get that instead of a new car. I don't know how much. I haven't asked. If your I don't car works, know. you can get the steam closet. I'm not Go ready to it. know how much it costs. All right, let's do a little bit of gadget news really quickly before we get thrown off the stage. Motorola did announce phones here. They announced the Droid Max, which is their, uh, the, hopefully, their long battery life phone because they have all these <laughs> kind of great new phones and they all have crappy battery life. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, with the 4G, it's going to hurt. A lot of the 4G phones are getting just crushed by battery life. But the good thing about this one is that it's still going to retain its thin form factor. Yeah, it's like the Razer, and it is 4G, but they say that it's going to have a nice long battery life. Uh, it will be, though, a $299 phone running 2.3 gingerbread out of the box. Everybody is announcing Ooh. phones that are going to upgrade to ice cream sandwich, which I'm sorry. This just furthers my problem with the Android. Like, get it done. <laughs> Don't be putting out phones that have gingerbread on them right now. There was just an article about how the... the uptake so far for ice cream sandwich is pathetic it's on like two phones anyway sorry it i don't takes mean to, time. I don't mean to take away time. from these great gadgets also time. though for those who want the keyboard where's brian cooley i know he's a big one on this the droid 4 announced the greatest android slider yet this one's actually going to be 4g i couldn't believe that the droid 3 was not 4g so at least the droid 4 will be uh, and then LG announced yesterday, and as part of their press, con press conference, they're getting into higher-end smartphones. LG is mostly known for kind of cheap flip phones, Entry really. Entry-level stuff, yeah. Entry-level phones. They announced the Spectrum, though, that is going to be a 4G phone. Is that the one that has a 16-megapixel camera? 
also? Let me find out. I think it is. That'll be 199 bucks. No, that's an 8, eight megapixel. But um, that one will also be upgradable to ice cream sandwich. Kind of their first foray really into a high-end touchscreen smartphone. Yeah. So, you know, you guys have been hanging out with us at Buzz Out Loud, also continuing through the entire week. We'll have plenty of coverage. Uh, we'll still do continue to do some live hits from the show floor oh, yeah. to show you what's going on there. We'll, we'll be heading out to LG. LG has some actually really interesting stuff this year, a lot of innovations. They've actually created their own camera, like a, their own Kinect camera that's compatible with yes. their TV for you to then purchase apps and games and use with their LG motion camera. They, they're taking uh, cues from Sony where you can take a television set, both have 3D glasses. Again, these are passive glasses right. and play a multiplayer game with two people on the same TV seeing a different image. Plus, so LG they're, they're has built the prettiest kitchen in the world with all those connected appliances. Yeah, LG, LG has a lot of cool stuff going on over there. They have so, real food in the fridge too, so I'm just saying if you get desperate. Also, I believe their 84 inch TV yep. is the largest one on display here at CES, at least from a consumer standpoint. Yeah, and that one is full H, it's full four inch TV. You, if you go big, you gotta go big, it's right? It's ridiculous. It yeah. always gets bigger. When are we gonna, are we gonna hit the 100 mark next year? Probably. 100 inch? You know, and if anybody's gonna do it, it's Sharp. I really appreciate <laughs> sharp, it. Sharp, 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 sharp yesterday, sharp. they had this press conference and they spent 45 minutes just basically saying, you know what, we're gonna make big ass TVs that look really good. <laughs> Boom, and they're gonna be connected to the internet. And I was like, great. Good idea. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to buy one, but okay. All right, that is Buzz Out Loud for today. Uh, you can email us at buzz at cnet.com. We will definitely try to pull some of that out of the mailbox. We won't be taking voicemails this week, obviously. Uh, but definitely send us your emails, questions, suggested guests. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time, 10 a.m. Pacific time, streaming live. And then Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. So uh, The we'll, last day of the show. We'll keep you. Yeah, it's going to be grim. We're going to be tired <laughs> puppies by then. <laughs> Just warning you in advance. We'll see you tomorrow, guys. All right, see you guys. Bridget Carey with CNET and we're here at the Consumer Electronics Show 2012 at the first look stage getting a first look at the Tele HD. This is a device that will turn your television into a Skype video chatting service. It's just a device you stick on top and all you need is a Skype service and an internet connection, a home Wi-Fi and essentially you could just start chatting right away from the ease of your couch or if you're a small business owner or a business professional you can certainly also use it for that too. It just just came out it is now selling on Amazon for $250. Now the very first version of this product will let you have Skype calls and you'll be able to do it in different ways. You'll be able to change the picture in picture. You can have two people talking, be able to look at photos or even watch a television show at the same time. Over the air updates will allow it to have more Android apps on there. So essentially you can have gaming on there. The device itself on top has four microphones so that way when you're on the couch you can really make a cone of sound to get to be able to hear you from far away and the camera here is 720p HD and if you're paranoid about the camera being on there well there's a little slot so you can just shut it when you don't want to use it and if you're not home the tele HD will save a video message from whoever you missed the call from so that's pretty handy now on the back of the tele HD you have an SD card slot which lets you send whatever photos are on that card slot to the person you're having a Skype conversation with and they get the full original quality of that photo sent to them. So if you went on vacation and you want to send some photos to a loved one, just stick in the SD card slot and they can get those photos to them. There's also a USB port so you can do the same thing on a USB dongle. There is an Ethernet port here so even if you don't have home Wi-Fi you can just hook it up to the internet through the cord and there's also an HDMI connection so that way you can get 720p HD connection. We're seeing a few products come out in CES that have a video camera for a television, something that makes it pretty easy to do couch casting. So you can see that it not only makes it easy for a family to talk to their family or a loved one, but there can be some creative uses in here for people who want to do their own web shows, 
for only $250. The equipment's pretty easy to set that up. So they're really making it easier and cheaper for you to be able to connect on a webcam on a larger screen. For CNET, I'm Bridget Carey with your first look at the Tele HD. Hi, I'm David Katzmeyer from CNET, and I'm standing here with the Toshiba Glasses-Free 3D TV. This is going to be the first TV to hit the U.S. market that actually incorporates 3D TV effects without the need to wear glasses. The real key here is the head tracking technology that enables the TV to shoot the 3D image, which actually requires separate right and left eye images, right to each different person in the room without having to use glasses. So if you stand in different sharp on this 55 inch model. Now the TV behind me is not going to be the exact shipping version that hits US shores. This is actually a prototype. Uh, the one that's available in Japan and Germany they released in December is similar to this and I think the US one will also be similar. On the other hand this TV in 2D has 4K by 2K resolution which is a lot higher than current 1080p TVs so it can accept that really high resolution content. There's not much of it right now but when it comes out it'll be able to handle that in 2D. The real play here is the glasses-free 3D TV, which, again, is a pretty cool effect. It had a little bit of artifacts from what I saw, but again, this is a pre-production version, so maybe they'll work that out in the next few months as this TV hits U.S. shores. That's a quick look at the Toshiba glasses-free 3D TV, and I'm David Katzmeyer. Hi, I'm David Katzmeyer from CNET at CES 2012. I'm here to talk about the Media Guide technology in Toshiba's L7200 and 6200 TVs. Media Guide is a new feature that puts an electronic program guide on the TV screen that actually controls the cable box. So you can scroll around the guide and press a button and it'll actually turn the channel on your cable box using an IR blaster. That's pretty cool because the cable box uh, guides found on a lot of boxes across the country are pretty bad. So this guide gives you a little bit more information. It's a nice slick look with a black background, allows you to program a favorite channel selection for example. It also allows you to browse movies and uh, other services and it feeds from Vudu, uh, services like Blockbuster and Cinema Now, so all those are available for searching and browsing. The real cool feature about this is the fact that the cable box will be controlled, although it does not allow you to program DVR future recordings via the box. You can just get reminders with this system. Toshiba is also releasing an Android app that works with tablets and phones. There's also an iOS version that works with an iPad. These apps will actually duplicate the guide on the screen of the phone or the tablet, so you can use that device to control this guide and actually control your cable box that way. So it's a pretty cool extra little feature. Of course, there's searching and all that stuff available on the app itself. That's a quick look at Toshiba's Media Guide, powered by Rovi. I'm David Katzmeyer at CES 2012. Sonic booth at the first day of CES 2012 and I'm here to give you a quick tour of what's going on. So as you can see this looks more like a warehouse than a booth because Panasonic has a ton going on this year starting with this beautiful amphitheater right behind me. Okay so Panasonic has over 60 televisions here with a theater to show off their passive 3D technology. They're also partners with the Olympics this year so they want to show that off. But let's make our way into the booth uh, where Panasonic is uh, showing off some of their eco ideas and one of them is the electric car. So no they're not actually going to make the cars but they're bringing the technology that goes inside. So they've got wireless charging and uh, they're bringing that technology for manufacturers to implement. Uh, they also have an actual charging option uh, but that's a future technology they're working on. Um, over here to my right you'll see they've got their eco home ideas. So how can we make homes greener? Um, what kind of tech can we bring in there? So they've got an actual home set up inside with a theater and uh, doing some briefings about that. But let's our make, make our way over here to the Panasonic Lumix area. Lumix is their actual their flagship brand for cameras and they really want to give you an in-depth experience of what's going on. So to my right you'll see a beautiful wall of photos of uh, taken on Panasonic cameras and over here they've stepped it up a notch with their booth babes this year. Okay, whoop, oh yeah, it's pretty crowded this year. Let's make our way through. This is probably the cra most crowded CES yet. There are about, oh, a bazillion people here. And 
to me, it seems like they're all right here at the Panasonic booth right now. So let's go over here and show off some of the 3D camera technology. So they're bringing 3D cameras to the home. They want to put this on the shelves of Best Buys. So for example, here is one of their flagship 3D cameras. It actually has two lenses right here for that 3D. And you also have the option to take 2D photos. And if you do, you can use one lens for distant, for far away photos and one lens for close up. So you're actually taking two photos at the same time. Okay. Over here, they're showing you what those photos might actually look like once they're taken. So um, you've got the, the active 3D glasses to show you that here. And then over here is their 3D camcorder technology. Again, we're seeing 3D actually come into the homes, uh, making it available for just about anybody who wants to get their hands on it. All right, so out of the camera section, let's make our way down to the, Panas to the second level of the Panasonic booth. Yes, Panasonic has two levels this year. It's that massive. I have never seen anything like it. So down the stairs we go. And as you can see, this entire section is really dedicated to the home theater. We saw that announcement yesterday. They're in introducing some new features like MySpace. We'll see how that catches on. But um, for now, they're also introducing their first, oh, no problem, hey, uh, Panasonic is doing. Uh, they want to bring together the home. Again, this year at CES, I'm really feeling the, you know, how can we bring all of our gadgets together? How can we marry these? So right over here at this booth, um, this guy is demoing here. He's showing you how you can download the Panasonic iOS app to not only control your TV like you would a remote, but you can actually browse the web on your iPad and anything you see on your screen, you can just flick over to your television. But not only that, if you have photos or videos that you've shot on your iPad, you can actually show those on the TV too. So that really brings together you know, all of your devices and all of the content that you have at home. Um, kind of like AirPlay, but Panasonic's version, so I'm happy to see other people do that too. Now, as we make our way over here, we have uh, some of Panasonic's plasmas. Again, they're known for their plasmas, uh, but this year they're really bringing the 3D technology. Um, most of their TVs, interestingly enough, have 2D to 3D conversion. Now, with that built-in Wi-Fi that all their TVs have, you can actually stream 2D content and convert it to 3D on the fly, which I think is awesome because it kind of brings that 3D home a little bit more. So um, over here you'll see the ETs and um, we're glad to see Panasonic do it. So for CDOT.com here from the Panasonic booth, I'm Sharon Vaknin and stay tuned for more live content coming up next. Hi, this is Ray Fiedelman from CNET at CES Unveiled. The night before the show opens, or two nights, it's a Linux-based tablet for the kitchen. And I'm here with Jean-Yves Hep, who is the CEO. Yeah. Really, a Linux tablet? Yeah, this is a Linux tablet, and incredibly, it's working very well. Yeah. Wait, why not an Android tablet? Uh, because when we developed it, we wanted uh, something very easy, very accessible for people, very intuitive. And Linux seemed to us the, the most easiest thing to use. One generally does not consider Linux in the kitchen as two things that naturally go together. I mean, when we're thinking of a kitchen interface, we think about the iPad or something simple. But now it's going to happen, and we master, of course, the, uh, the content. And the content is more than uh, 3,600 recipes and videos with more than 100 chefs that explains you step by step how to do the recipes. And it sells for how much? It sells for three ninety nine US dollars. I can get two Kindle Fires for that. Yeah, the, the Kindle Fire is uh, smaller. It's not dedicated to the kitchen. Here you can use this glass of wine, throw it on the on the screen with no danger. You can throw a tomato sauce. You can throw whatever you want. It will work. Okay. You can use it on an iPad. You can use it on ever a screen you want, but this one is really specified for the kitchen. All right, if somebody wants this Linux-powered kitchen leap pad for the, for the kitchen, uh, where and when can they get it? Uh, for the moment, it's in France, but it's going to come in the, in the U.S. Uh, for the next semester. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Hi, this is Brian Bennett. 
HD resolution. And uh, as you can tell, it has a stylus that you interact with a device like this. You can um, just scroll through the menus um, using the tip here. You can also uh, you know, tap and hold to take screenshots of uh, anything you're looking at on the device. You can also uh, mark up and draw on uh, anything that you capture and send it to, to people. Um, say you want to circle a web page or something like that and make notes, you can do that. It also transcribes. Uh, Hey, Donald Bell here for CNET.com here at CES 2012. Been scouring the floors for uh, new tablets to show you guys, and right here I've got the Pantech Element due out this month on AT&T's 4G network. Uh, it's got a 299 price tag, comes with a two-year contract. Now, usually I, I kind of dismiss the, the 4G tablets and the contracts, but this is kind of a special case. This is a waterproof tablet. It's a rugged tablet. Uh, has Gaskets covering all the different ports on the side. Uh, you've got micro HDMI, micro USB, micro SD card slot here for memory expansion. Dual core processor, currently running Honeycomb 3.2. Um, but the waterproof thing, I don't know. You can call it a gimmick, but I think for a tablet that you're really going to be taking outdoors, taking advantage of the, the mobile 4G network, you kind of want to get have something that you're going to be able to take out in the rain and not worry about it and not have a heart attack if you're bringing this poolside and your kid's going to kick it in. So uh, you're getting you know, all the stuff that you're used to on Honeycomb. Pretty decent price at uh, $299. Uh, and you're getting peace of mind that you know, should you spill your coffee on this thing, uh, it's not going to go right into the landfill. <laughs> so yeah, here we go. I know. This, uh, you, bring, you bring water to the stage, you got to use it, right? It's like a, it's like a gun in, in the first act. All right, so here you go, uh, Pantech element going into the water. At this point you probably you know said a few things you regret. <laughs> your kids are shocked at all the filthy words you've just expressed at dropping your tablet in the pool. Uh, and then I'm going to do a little reset here. I'm going to click it off just to sleep. Make sure it's nice and dry. Click it back on. Look at that. It's working. It's wonderful. It's probably saying don't drop me again. But uh, working just fine. So there you go. It's the Pantech Element out this month on AT&T, $299 on contract. Pretty cool. Now, up next, we're going to be talking with Sony. We saw them just walk in. They've got a briefcase full of amazing gadgets, I'm sure, that we're going we're gonna to find out about. So keep, stay tuned. Come right back. 
More stuff from us here at CES 2012. Hi, Rafe Needleman here from CNET, and uh, I'm at CES talking to the Parrot AR drone, uh, version 2.0. This new, we'll be right back. So, Henri, what's new in the Parrot AR drone 2.0? So, the Parrot AR drone 2.0 comes with an HD camera mm -hmm. and the, the possibility to record on your iPad, on your iPhone, the what the air drone see. Okay. And do you control it the same way? Are there new modes to there fly it around as well? There are new modes to control it, mm -hmm. and especially a new mode called Absolute Control, where it's much more easy for beginners to control the flying device. Mm -hmm. And you do that, how do you control it? Is it a, moving your finger around or tilting the, yes, the device? Yes, you control it tilting the device, yeah. but now uh, you have a magnetometer in the iPhone or the iPad, but mm -hmm. also you have one on the drone, so... ...reality where you're looking here at what your drone sees and there's additional reality exactly. on top of it. So you, we use a camera mm -hmm. to detect uh, enemy tags, and we have drone battles, drone races, mm -hmm. and drone video games, mm -hmm. where uh, the part is the reality, but also added mm -hmm. thing to the reality, 3D images that you see on your iPad. Mm -hmm. But to me, the most interesting thing about this is as a filmmaker's tool. So are people using this to make movies or uh, as part of uh, making new, new types of films? It's a, a new kind of device, mm -hmm. high tech device, mm -hmm. and you have now a thousand of video mm -hmm. taken by the users on YouTube, mm -hmm. flying uh, over uh, uh, um, crocodiles. Or there is a one uh, flying in the middle of the firework by night, where you have the drone uh, flying there, and you have uh, the user who had recorded this. And now you can do it in HD. Now you can do it in HD and put it on YouTube very easily. Hey, I'm Donald Bell here. We're back at CES 2012 at the CNET main stage, and I'm joined by Ransom Burkett. Ransom yes, Burkett hey. from Sony. Yes. Please show us what Sony is bringing to CES 2012. It looks like you've got plenty of gadgets We've here. We've got to a show myriad off. of products here, but one of the main things we don't have in the booth that's really exciting is we were talking about connecting our devices for years, right? Yeah. How do we get them all connected and how do we have a seamless operation? Uh, with, we've really talked about connecting them. Now we have that platform got for the, doing that. The ecosystem. The ecosystem the to do that, sure. and we're, we're really we're excited to bring that to market here at CES. So the Sony Entertainment Network is something you will have to see at our booth. It's the new user experience we're showing off, and the here, I actually have some of these products that will allow you to connect to that network. I can't put my hands on the Sony Entertainment Network, though. Yeah. So, so show me something I can. Let's show hold. you something physical here. Well, this is really what we're excited about here. This is going to debut in the U.S. February 22nd. I'll go ahead and put that in your hands. Okay. And that is our PlayStation Vita, uh, launched in um, just about a month ago in Japan, and in the U.S. market here will be out in just a little over a month. And this is our new foray into portable gaming. So uh, there are some titles that are going to be available, 25, which is the most that we've ever launched with a product launch, and uh, the, it has a brilliant 5-inch OLED screen. So d touch screen, no less. So we actually have a screen here. You can actually navigate through the menu, select your options, as well as the back where your thumb is, that's a selectable touch screen as well. So wow. for different games, you can now, it's portable. So it yeah. will connect to the Sony Entertainment Network, Video Unlimited, Music Unlimited, all that stuff. And I think if I wear my if I wear my extra big pants, I could probably get this in a pocket. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and then pricing for this? So two forty nine uh, coming out in just about a month, February twenty second. Pretty cool. Oh, all yeah. right. And then this is also going to be able to connect up, as you were saying, to your your network of services, network. the Sony network. 
So you're going to be able to get your music unlimited on exactly. this device. And exactly. Your PlayStation Network accounts, etc. Now the cool part about it, you bring up a good point. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, you're starting a game at home and uh, your wife or significant other says, you know what, it's time to go to dinner. Let's go ahead and take <laughs> off. Well, you can actually continue the gameplay online with this device as you travel to your next destination. So you really can continue to play uh, on the go. That's great too. And then it also hopefully would save my, my minor achievements Exactly. The cloud so Ex can... Exactly. Trophies, everything will sync directly to the cloud as well. Very cool. Well, I'm excited about this. I know Brian Tong's probably chomping at the bit to get his hands on this one, too. Um, all right. What else do you want to show me? So I want to show you something that's really neat here. We're actually starting off with a new technology for our Handycam lineup. We're actually announcing 13 new Handycams this week. And uh, the first of which is going to be, this is our premier model right here. It's the PJ760. I don't know if you remember last year, we showed off the world's first camera with a projector built directly into it. This year we've expanded that particular lineup now so that many of our cameras will actually include this projector. But the coolest part about it is that it has a balanced optical steady shot. This actually allows it to cancel up to 13 times or you have a wide angle shot. Right. So if you're extra jittery yeah. or if you're, you know. Extra cups of coffee, extra maybe cups extra cups of wine. We're well, at CES. More so if you're probably like taking shots, uh, you know, in a car or you're, exactly. you're, you're somehow on a vehicle or something that's moving. Exactly. And you just don't want the jitteriness making its way into the video or have to spend a half hour adjusting that in software after, exactly. after the fact. Exactly. Got that built right into the camera. That's one of the beautiful things about it is that there's about 120 different scene combinations. So this thing in automatic mode can determine your scene selections. It can optimize uh, your settings for you so that you don't have to go and menu dive and select those options. It's very intelligent and uh, we're excited to bring an entire line of these Handycams here. Yeah, beautiful looking too. I mean, you guys always nail it on design. It looks like it looks like an expensive piece of gear. Oh yeah. And well, and I absolutely don't know. Is not an expensive piece of gear? Yeah, How much are we talking so we're, here? We're, we're talking about fifteen hundred dollars for this premier model, and they start anywhere from right around four hundred bucks as well. Well, I mean, if, if you're ready to really step up from the camera on your smartphone, exactly. And you want to go big time. This yeah. Is the one to go with. Yeah, and and think of the smartphone. You're really capturing like somewhat snippets and clips. Mm -hmm. Here, you're being able to capture memories, right? You don't have to worry about, well, am I going to be able to get my son's touchdown on camera? Uh, you have, you've got plenty of memory here uh, with capacities up to uh, right about 100 gigs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you, you could actually make your feature length film on this. Thing. Exactly. <laughs> oh, and, and this is for. You bring up prosumer features. This is yeah. a selectable dial right here with everything from iris. Share your memories on a wall with up to 100 degree videos. So, or 100 inch, excuse me, 100 inch uh, videos being projected. Now, the cool thing as well, if you're projecting those videos and you have an audience, mm -hmm. maybe they can't hear that content, you simply slide this hot shoe open. We have an adaptable speaker, looks like a little golf ball, put right on the top of it, and it really gives you some great sound. It probably freaks people out a little bit if you've got a golf ball attachment on the top of your camera. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, they're looking at that video and they hear that sound, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've got the gamer, we've got the, uh, the, the video, Filmmaker, enthusiast. Yeah. Oh yeah, and we're excited to bring to market here now our first LTE phone here with the Xperia S. So uh, subject to regulatory approval, Sony has now acquired Sony Ericsson. And uh, we're really excited and we think that our smartphones are going to play an important part in our four screen strategy. And here, I'll go ahead and put this into your hands. Uh, that is a brilliant piece. I mean, you see how thin and light it is. It's got an aluminum casing to it. Uh, again, as I said, it's the world's first, or our first version of the LTE version of that phone. And it's got a brilliant, what we're calling a reality display, 720 high definition display on it. So your content is going to look brilliant based on our mobile Bravia engine. So that same engine that we put into our Bravia award-winning televisions, mm -hmm. we're now putting that type of technology in our mobile devices as well. Well, I, it's probably smart. I mean, I think CES, one of the things that you, you'll notice more than anything else is everyone's staring into their phone. Absolutely. So you want that experience to be the first piece, yes. how this is tying into the Sony network. Sure, exactly. So now uh, with uh, Music Unlimited is now an Android application. So whether you have a Sony device or any other brand uh, that's Android based, you can actually go ahead and pull up Music Unlimited. Uh, so that keeps your entire library in a cloud-based system where you can access it. Exactly. We even have shortcuts to it here oh, on the screen. Of course, the coverage here is probably not going to work. Yeah, we may not be able to even get on here <laughs> with everybody at CES, but uh, with that strategy, we're also allowing video unlimited on this as well. So all of your high-def uh, movies, where whether you'd like to uh, stream some, uh, uh, some rentals, maybe you'd like to get, uh, have some content on the go, you're able to do that with this device as well. 
That's so, great. yeah, we're really excited about it. And the best part, you're talking about gaming, it's PlayStation certified. Ooh. So you're actually able to play some, again, this is the first time we actually are licensing PlayStation content outside of PlayStation devices. We've right. done that with our tablets, and now we're doing it with our smartphones as well. Now, I remember I, I reviewed the Sony Tablet S yes. uh, just a few months back. And that was also a PlayStation certified device. Yes. Is it the same deal where it's like PS1 content? PS1, but now games? more content's going to be available too. Yeah. So we saw the success with the PlayStation 1 content. More legacy games are going to be available and potentially in the future, even other titles. All right, great. And then is there another part of this where maybe photos you're taking with this are kind of backed up to Sony Cloud system? Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah, we're launching a service in just about a month called Play Memories Online. So immediately, as soon as you take your uh, photos, you can actually have them on the cloud storage system, so where photos or video on the cloud storage system so that they're accessible on any device, whether it's your Bravia TV, your uh, Blu-ray player, or your mobile phone, you can actually see, or your PlayStation Vita, <laughs> let's not forget, uh, the content's going to be available. That's great. Um, and that's going to come out in the spring. So this is kind of a preview of what we're, we're coming out with. This is spring. And, and what was the, uh, the carrier again? Uh, this is uh, LTE. So it's the LTE evolution. So it could be, um, I believe we're could looking be, at eight. It's playing the field. Yeah, it's All playing right. the field right All now, right. yes. I understand. <laughs> All right. Let's see. What else do we have? So this is now our very, very popular. And look at the design. I'll go ahead and put type of camera, 12 megapixels, mm -hmm. right? Um, but also being able to capture 3D panoramic photos as well. So whether you're ready to view some of that content on your 3D television, uh, you're able to capture your panoramic shots and view them directly onto your uh, your, your device of choice. Wow, this is, a, this is an amazing design. And I also like this, it's kind of a clear acrylic bar here on the bottom for being able to do the, the Android navigation. It's kind of hard to see, but um, it's just one of these interesting touches. I haven't seen that before. Exactly. It's got a minimalistic design, but we're also looking at some of the factors that we've uh, uh, we've come to be known for, and that's our design elements. So. All right. So what is this going to set me back? Uh, the pricing hasn't been announced yet because this is going to become available in the second quarter of the year. So okay. we're kind of showing what we are coming out with, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to kind of bringing some of these products to market and actually getting some excitement before we actually have them uh, released. Amazing. And this, is this also an LTE? Device? No, so this is going to be uh, GSM, so basically any carrier, um, you're going to be able to, like you said, it plays friendly you, with you others. Got, you've, got, you've got both bases covered. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, well, this is, this is, again, yeah, it is a beautiful screen. It, it, um, it, it reminds me, this is, wait, is this an OLED screen? No, so no? this is what we're calling our HD reality screen. Mm -hmm. HD reality represents basically our pinnacle design for both these two phones, and it's a 720p resolution. Beautiful. Yes, so we're excited about it. I, um, I also just got my hands on you, another product you guys announced yesterday, the Sony Walkman Z. Walkman Z, yes. Which also is like a 4.3 inch screen and another beautiful screen. Oh, uh, yes. You guys, you guys do that. Uh, stereo bleed, left and right sound channels bleeding into one another to enhancing the bass to actually uh, making sure that the sound is reproduced as close as possible to the original recording. So sound quality is premium focus when we come to the Walkman design. And I'm sorry I don't have one here for you, but that 4.3 inch screen, you'll have to check out. No, in the it's, it's beautiful for sure. Brilliant. All right. Is that everything? I don't know. I might have one more thing <laughs> to show you that. Let's see if I could find it here. Drum roll. Oh, here we go. Ah. And this, I think you may be excited about. I hear I you may uh, have an interest in tablets. So <laughs> this is our foray into uh, the tablet, what we're calling the P series. Tablet P, I'll put into your hands here, sir. That is our foldable design with dual five inch screens. So true black screens in that they're going to represent a very great picture quality. And uh, we're excited to bring that available into the market via AT&T mm -hmm. uh, or Wi-Fi only versions here uh, in the spring of this year. Oh, I hadn't heard about a Wi-Fi only option. Yes, so Wi-Fi or the AT&T version and the um, uh, the price points have yet to be determined, but we're getting a lot of excitement. Again, it's one of the only uh, tablets that I've seen that you can fold up and put in your jacket yeah, pocket as you see here. We've seen waterproof tablets, we've seen them big and small, we've yeah. seen every single size you can imagine, mm -hmm. but the folding tablet we have not seen. Sure. And I remember this was when this was first introduced yes. um, as like a very early design mm -hmm. as like the S2. Uh, we've kind of taken it a step further in that now you can actually have this device on the go. So we're going to go ahead and pull up a game. If you're interested in the games here, we're going to pull up Crash Bandicoot. And you can take a look here and you'll notice that your gameplay is going to occur on the top screen 
you'll have your uh, virtual controllers on the bottom. Now the great part about virtual controllers, maybe you might ha not have the biggest hands in the world, or maybe you do, mm -hmm. you can actually decide how far apart you'd like those controls to appear on that bottom screen. Or vice versa, if you're reading an email and you'd like to have your content viewed on the top screen mm -hmm. while you actually have your QWERTY keyboard on the bottom screen. So you're right, we did have the Adobe chat, uh, app challenge, we had some great entries into that, and we're really being able to see people take advantage of both dual screen uh, Components. So here you can see how the controls are down here on the bottom, the bottom screen. So you've got your, your direction pad and your buttons, and then up here you can actually add your gameplay. So that's pretty neat, and that's a you know entertainment. Now I've played this Crash Bandicoot at least countless a dozen times. Okay, sure. No, I haven't. Yeah. Like I'm not good at. It. I can't get past the first thirty. I've only <laughs> ever played the first thirty seconds are of you the game. Me? Okay, over again. okay, sure. So I'm going to stop actually interviewing. Okay, and we'll just go ahead Bandicoot and have a game go. Okay, sure. Um, no, but it's, it's actually a really cool use of yeah. the screen technology. And again, going back to our kind of the anchor point at the beginning, yeah. this is all tying into the Sony, Sony PlayStation or the Sony, Sony Network. Entertainment. Yes, yeah, so SCN is what we're calling it, Sony yeah. Entertainment Network. So yeah. whether you're PlayStation, uh, you're looking for your content on Video Unlimited, mm -hmm. or you're looking for your music in uh, Music Unlimited, or maybe your memories that you've taken with your cameras on uh, our Play Memories Online, we're going to be able to access all that content on our, uh, with a single sign-on. That's the basic point. You know, you don't want to have all these different sign-ons to get to your content. Well, that's what we're making it easy for you to do this year. Another thing that I mentioned, uh, or I, I forgot to mention that I, I've noticed with a lot of your products is the DLNA support yes, too. Which is, you can maybe you can explain that better than sure, I can. Sure, sure. Yeah, so a number of different devices nowadays are DLNA comp compatible, right? So perhaps you bring this device into your home network where now your HDTV is onto that same network. You can throw content easily simply by if I go to the menu here I'll go ahead and select a video uh, let's take a look in the gallery and we can go ahead and select a video and I'll select this one and once this content begins playing it's literally as simple as pressing one single button here and that content gets displayed directly onto your screen uh, same with music for instance we now have home share in our uh, homes these are individual speakers that are connected to your network. Perhaps you have one in your child's room, uh, one in your room, and then one in, uh, maybe in the backyard. And you'd like to be able to enjoy that sound wherever you'd go. Well, you can actually throw content directly from here to one of those speakers. So DLNA allows for these devices to work together seamlessly without you needing a physical connection. Right. You know? So that's what we're working on. Well, that's what the future was always promised, to be sure. this wired, wireless experience that just predicts when you want to listen to your music exactly and watch movies and whatever device you want i do have one more device that i don't have here but i have its brother if that's okay sure, yeah. um and its brother which we announced last night is the bloggy live apologize i don't have one here but it has the world's first camera to be able to stream live hd as long as you have a wi a wi-fi connection well, that's going to be useful for us. We're doing a lot of live video. There you show. go. Yeah, please, please come by. That's uh, that's a brilliant piece, and we're excited about it. All right. Ransom, thank you so much yeah. for stopping by Certainly. and showing off all this cool tech. Excellent. We're excited for Sony and for uh, for the entire CS experience here. Right. And see what else, uh, see how these products fare sure. for the year. I'm sure I'll be talking to you again next year. Thank you so much. Glad right. to be here. Have a thank good one. Thank you so much. All right. Up next, Brian Cooley will be here with Ford's Chief Technology Officer, in the meantime, Brian Tong takes you on a tour of the Sony booth. of an actual booth in action so our good friends at Sony were here to help us out also you got to dig this new mic flag it's kind of sexy okay so let's go into the booth right now we're gonna start here with Sony you see always kind of a standard affair here at CES 2012 boxes covered with blankets who knows what's in there right all right now we're gonna keep on walking through here and Sony's always been really impressive a variety of cameras television sets blu-ray players they pretty much have everything under the Sun so over here they're showing off some of their Xperia phones digital media players where there everything is still being set up as we speak so we know this isn't the final product but we're gonna see but again everyone behind us is working there's interviews happening all around okay also ooh, look see I can walk backwards and avoid things while I'm doing that this is more of Sony kind of really showing off their music unlimited service and some of the devices tablets that are integrated in it again Sony's always really tried to pitch like this lifestyle of their devices being connected with each other um, so they continue to push that forward and we're gonna walk this way and we're gonna have head over more to the gaming we know that gaming is a big deal with Sony the PS Vita it's out internationally but it's not here in the United States it'll be coming out some
once they hit the U.S. shores. Now, we're going to keep on walking through here. Sony's also known for a lot of their gaming. So what we have here, if you're here at CES, you get a lot of like demos that you'll never be able to get anywhere else. This game is one of their new ones, Starhawk. You're going to be able to get that one. Play it for free here on the show floor. Also, Twisted Metal is another super hot title. This is where cars like destroy each other. You'll be able to check those out in the booth. I think that's honestly one of the highlights for me, other than the cool tech is just kind of playing some of the new games that are at least six months to a year away. Now, as we transition over here, right, look, we see the ladders being stacked up. We see the little forklifts. Everyone is still, this is the central hall, really more towards the end of the central hall. Everyone is still setting up, but this is my favorite section of the Sony booth. This is the future technology booth. So whenever you see the word future, you want to come in and show you what they've got. So over here on my right side, this is a demo. You won't be able to really see it at home, but this is the 3D glassless television set. Now over at Sony and other companies, we're seeing a lot of demos like this. The unique part of this demo specifically is most of them have been displaying them with cameras that track your eyes. There are no real cameras here in these demos. And one of the things that sticks out is when you walk side to side you can almost see the 3d image change on a plane there's like this just subtle move that tells you that you're looking at it from a different plane the viewing angle is pretty impressive so you know we're going to be seeing a lot more glassless 3d televisions down the line now we're going to head over here you'll see really quickly one more glassless 3d tv this is a 46 incher they're getting bigger and better um, but from here it looks it looks really impressive to me you got a little image now over here we're gonna we're gonna come over here this way and we have more demos from Sony with their 3D glasses. Uh, we've seen this for a while, so there's, no there's nothing new and fresh here. This is really more of their future technology. But what we really wanted to show you, um, we'll kind of do it from a distance and we won't walk up to it too close, is over here on this side. Over here on this side, yeah, we have here Sony's demo of the Crystal LED TV display. All right, so. If you look over here on my shoulder, this is kind of their new technology that they're showcasing. This is way ahead of the curve. The difference in what makes this TV set unique with the crystal LED TV display is that there's a backlight, an LED for all colors, red, green, and blue, which really makes it super unique. There's a comparison. It's it'll be might be a little hard to tell which one looks more vibrant, clearer, and sharper. But on the left side, you'll see not only is the image able to be reproduced a lot quicker, the colors pop out of the screen and you know we everyone's talking about OLED TVs everyone's talking about 4k televisions but really this is the type of technology that hopefully will be more affordable and bring it forward so I the crystal LED display well worth looking at um, I was talking to one of the guys who works actually in Sony's 4k booth and he says the theoretical resolution of this TV set is 6k so 6,000 lines of resolution which would make it a, even a more clear picture just really impressive so let's go over here this way real quick um, one of the things that Sony is also touting because they are not only a consumer electronics company but a media brand they're showcasing off kind of the pipeline or the production line of a 4k camera we have over there that's a Cine Alta this is their Sony home theater 4k projector now if you want to know the retail price on this bad boy could you take a guess somewhere around 25 but that's not 2500 that's $25,000 for a 4k projector the uh, internal code name for it insider information scoop was called the Valkyrie so you know it's some hot stuff all right let's just go over here really finally one last peek over in Sony's booth they have a lot of amazing stuff but up here this is the 4k home theater now we can't go inside I must reiterate that I I like peeked through those curtains and I was shoved out, but they're showing a demo on a 200 inch screen of 4K content, um, not in 3D, it does support 3D, but it's 4K content, um, like a scene from some of their movies. This is, this is amazing stuff, so I would say definitely come out to the Sony 4K booth and just check out some of the cool toys they have. Um, we're just gonna kinda take one more look just at the overall floor to give you a bigger sense of what's happening in the central hall. Over here behind me, Polaroid, we know that last year uh, Lady Gaga made her debut promoting the Polaroid brand, brand. We're starting to see more celebrities come out here kind of associating with companies, whether they're brand names from the past or smaller names we may not recognize. Justin Bieber is here with uh, potentially a Bieber bot. Yeah, you'll find out more about that later. But again, this is just the entire setup here at CES 2012. We're still one day away before we finish up with the final product on the floor, but just really give you an overall sense of how massive this undertaking is.
are, folks. All right. Welcome to the CNET stage here at CES 2012. I'm Brian Cooley, and of course, we are in the midst of really just kicking off CES 2012, if you're catching us live right now. Uh, you know my particular specialty and passion within this wide world of technology that we cover, many avenues of it, but I get into the cars. Love the car tech. And joining me now is one of the guys who will absolutely vibe with me on that one. <laughs> Please welcome Paul Mascarenas, Ford's Chief Technology Officer. Paul, Thanks, Brian. Thanks good for being to be here. with you. It's again. good to have you here. Yeah. Now, when you were here a year ago at the last CES, you were freshly minted as the CTO at Ford. I was. I'm one year into the job now. Right. Yeah, I'm <laughs> back, I'm back Happy again, birthday. Back again at CES. Happy anniversary. Yeah. Good to have you here. Thanks. Now, uh, the, the phrase you coined last year is one that resonated in a lot of people's minds. I've been using it and or butchering it ever <laughs> since. I kind of half stole it from you. You said what about the car? I said the car is the ultimate mobile device. And it's so true. And you like that, yeah. We're it, looking it at absolutely is. CES in could sense. in the future be called maybe the car electronics show because yep. we've got such a huge presence of automakers here. Ford, of course, one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Alan Mulally giving the keynote again this year. Catch me up on what you guys have announced. I think you've had more announcements this year. No, now Fusion Energy. Uh, which is a plug-in hybrid. Okay, the plug-in hybrid uh, fusion. Yeah, and continuing the reveal that we had at Detroit yesterday. And then tomorrow... Does that mean you pulled it halfway back at Detroit and the rest of the curtain comes no, off today? No, 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 <laughs> we're going to show it to the tech community today. We the folks who really get it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and then tomorrow he'll be participating in the um, keynote panel, uh, CEO keynote panel with yes. Gary Shapiro and co. But what we're talking about here are really uh, three or four uh, key areas. The first is we're showing for the first time in North America, our Evos concept car, um, which if you haven't seen, it's an absolutely beautiful car. Um, it's a concept in terms of design, showing our future design language for our global products. And actually, when you look at the Fusion production car mm -hmm. and the Evos concept, you're going to see a lot of similar A lot of similar looks. And it's amazing so, how much came across from uh, that prototype concept in, vehicle. Into the production vehicle. So that gives you an idea of where we're taking our design globally. But the fascinating thing um, about the Evos is that it's got almost a, almost a pulse with the driver as you envision it. Very much yeah. interpretive of what the driver's doing, the condition they're in, even some, some health status interpretation, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's about the design, the powertrain, plug-in hybrid. So again, that energy technology, exactly the same technology that we'll be showing on the Fusion production car okay. and talking about this afternoon. But in terms of the technology, it's really about this experience that we talked about, about the quality. We consistently deliver high quality vehicles, affordable, value for our customers, dependable over their lifetime. That's the very rational side of it, great fuel economy and so on. But making this emotional connection. You know, okay, that's the ownership. And, and it's this, what I describe as a seamless experience between the home, the office, and the vehicle. So whether you're listening to music, you might be listening to internet radio mm -hmm. in the house. As you move into the vehicle, our vision is that by connecting the vehicle, you can continue to enjoy that same seamless experience. Whether it's apps that you're using, apps that you would normally be running on a mobile device, your smartphone, tablet or whatever. Now through AppLink, you can access those in the vehicle. Yeah, and again, you guys you were pretty early on that with Pandora, yeah. OpenBeak, uh, one or two others. I know you're, at, you're announcing a couple additional yeah, apps some, the show. Yeah, some new ones this, this week. Uh, NPR, Roximity, iHeartRadio. Um, what is Roximity? So again, I don't know that one. Roximity is a really interesting one. It's actually um, context-based information. So knowing the destination of the vehicle, knowing where you are when you're driving. So if you're passing a shopping mall, you might get access to shopping information. Are you looking for a restaurant? That type of thing. Okay, so it's, so it's proximity and, based. And this is exactly where we're moving now, is providing more of this contextual information to the driver. So it's not just bombarding you with information. Mm -hmm. It's actually providing you with the information that you might need when you need it, based on the location of the vehicle. That's an interesting so. way to attack distraction, I think, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you agree is starting to bubble up as Absolutely. a topic at Absolutely. the regulatory layer. Yep. What did you think of the NTSB recommendation well, that we, phones go away from cars. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we talked about distraction even when we were here last year. Yeah. And if you remember, along with the ultimate mobile device, I talked about keeping your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road and the sync technology that we're putting in with the voice commands and so on. Being part of this solution to people wanting to use their mobile devices, but in a vehicle, mm -hmm and us wanting to enable our drivers to continue to concentrate on this primary task of, of driving. Um, 
There's no traction NTSC for a wide out ban, is there? I, you know, I think our view is, and we absolutely support the ban on handheld texting. You know, we're putting the technology in because we think it's bad for people to be using handheld devices while interface and interaction yeah. with the device that is as much as possible enabled through voice. The key part, I think, is the first part you said, mm -hmm. because a lot of folks get the voice part. Right. Keep your eyes and hands where yep. they should be and hopefully not subdivide your mind too yep. much. But the part about continuity, where the car can pick up where I left off, there's less sort of overhead of me saying, okay, let me rethink what I'm doing when I'm in the car, because the car is still somewhat of a digital island. Exactly. You do different behaviors in the car with media and communication, but if that was not the case, if it followed you more from your other places in your life, mm -hmm. there's less distraction to saying, okay, where am I? Let me get oriented. Because most of us do that while we're already up and running. No, you're absolutely right. And you're, you're hitting on the, the point that I mentioned. It's, it's all about this familiarity, this intuitiveness. Yeah. And as much as we can make it seamless, you, know, you can really then continue to focus on driving. Now, on the other side, I don't want to get too lost in the driver distraction issue because, as I say, we're putting the technology in. But on the other side, we're also putting in a lot of vehicle technologies, vehicle-centric technologies that actually help the driver. Uh, for example, with the Focus launch last year, with the Fusion launch right now, you know, we're launching technologies, active cruise control, forward uh -huh. collision warning, mitigation by braking. It's on the pillars that we've defined of high-quality vehicles, that are safe through the technologies that we put on board, deliver the best or amongst the best fuel economy, yeah. high efficiency gasoline engines, eco boost, plug in hybrids, and so on, um, and also smart features and technologies, and just continuing to focus on those elements. One side of the technology seems to be answering for the weaknesses in the mm -hmm. other, whether it's distraction or whether it's inefficiency. We know that the human driver, left to their own devices, drives typically inefficiently, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of um, high, high change driving modes. A lot of braking, a lot of acceleration, bad mm -hmm. stuff. Both of those dynamics yep. are bad, right? Self or somewhat autonomous driving systems will start to moderate out bad driver behavior soon, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're not too far from that. Not too far from that, and we're also putting in some um, driver assist features. So for example, in our uh, current hybrids, we have the Fusion Hybrid, for example. Yeah. We have the little system where you can grow leaves. Grow the leaves, right. So you can look at your driving style. We have in the Focus That's electric, we've got to the, be busy give people a the, video game they want to yeah, win at, you know, to get the, what we want out of them, right? The, the butterfly feature and so on. So, <laughs> yeah. again, putting things in that actually, it's a little bit of fun. It's not distracting, but it's yeah. encouraging this efficient driving style. Um, there is a, uh, a thought out there that the autonomous car is closer than we think. There's a lot of this bubbling mm -hmm. up. No one's ready to put a stake in the ground right. on when they're going to deliver an autonomous car. What is What's in the way of autonomous cars, self-driving cars? Are we going to get there with one sort of a big jump, or is there going to be a very gradual continuum as we move some kind of self-driving in the market? What do you say? It's, it's a great question. My, my view is um, it's somewhere in the future. Um, I haven't got a crystal ball myself, so I can't. How does 10 I years grab you in like general? Like Crazy. I, I, sitting there. Oh, we have the uh, auto park assist feature, you know, which allows you to mm -hmm. parallel park your vehicle on the Fusion we have a pull-out feature that actually allow, helps the driver to pull out. Of oh, I haven't tried that before. Space. So oh, that's interesting. Is that new? Are, these are all, yeah, this okay. is, and these are autonomous features. The self-parking, I got to say, the self-parking yeah. in an affordable car as you've rolled it out yeah. is, it's the best I've driven. I've driven yeah. a lot of self-parking technologies in cars that are s up to six figures yeah. that can't quite get the nose in. Yeah. <laughs> and no, that's right. and a, a $20,000 Ford can do it over and over and over. So I give you kudos on yeah. that. So but as we look at these, what I call perimeter technologies, mm -hmm. lane departure, right. um, forward collision <laughs> prevention, active park, all the things that work around the sensors, around the outside of the car, mm -hmm. are we at the point where we can start to just roll out more software that turns those physical devices into what we need for autonomy? Or is there some additional tangible tech we need to get to autonomous cars? No, what we're um, very focused on is we've got the hardware in the vehicle. So we've got radar sensing, we've got camera sensing, we've got electric power steering that gives you control right, over the steering. Right, that's a key part. Um, these, these are what we call the fundamental building blocks. The smart thing, the innovative thing then, and this is how we make it affordable, is not to build in more hardware, but it's to develop the software algorithms and the control systems. Right. So for example, the auto park assist, no, no, no extra hardware in the vehicle. That's just it's code, all, right? It's the ultrasonic sensors, it's yeah. the 
power steer electric power steering and a really a smart algorithm. So that's what I think differentiates uh, you know, a smart, innovative company. This starts to put uh, a car company on the innovation cycle of a CE company, a, a right? A technology company, and that's what we've been emphasizing. Yeah. Now, if you talk about full dedicated short-range communications, mm -hmm. very affordable, very practical, uh, a lot of big pilots around, um, you know, not just the country, we've got a, a big program up in uh, Michigan, in Ann Arbor, uh, but in Germany, Japan, so okay. I think that offers real opportunity in the near term. Now, speaking um, of your locations, yeah. let's talk about your newest lab. Mm -hmm. You've come to Silicon Valley. We have. We announced last week that we were opening a, a lab in Silicon Valley. We didn't talk about the exact location, but somewhere in the... Because, you know, I'll be camped Palo, out. That's Palo why. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> yeah, welcome you there with an espresso or something together. But, um, no, what that's really about, it's a, it's a natural extension of the work that we've been doing for the last four or five years to really connect not only with our um, more mature tech partners, people like Google and Apple, Microsoft a little bit further up the coast, but the University of Stanford. Um, but I think most importantly for us, having a presence in this really innovative community. And, yeah. and it's, it's amazing for me. It really is one of the most remarkable innovative communities in the world. And it's everything from you know, entrepreneurial, innovative individuals, yeah. startups working out of their garages, the kind of tech shop type approach, all the way through to the tech giants like Apple. So we've been working in the Valley area for a long time. Um, what but is we just it? felt it was the right time to establish a, a hub for us. Well, especially um, yeah, to be closer to those partners and sources and inspirations mm -hmm. and places where you can hire the best people or right. some of the best people out of those universities. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. is this is also part of the faster turn of product and design, right? You've got to be faster, yeah. which means you've got to be closer to where some of the resources are, mm -hmm. I would assume, right? So again, we, you know, we continue to drive down the uh, development cycle for the, the vehicle program, Yeah. but you still measure that in years. You know, right. it's, it's two or three years. Right. What we're trying to mesh here is this consumer electronics cycle that you're measuring in months, you know, six to nine months. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks don't upgrade on my uh -huh. full touch. Faster, simpler, more functionality but we're doing it purely software-based. You're sending out USB drives Free to owners in many cases, customers, right? Free of charge sending the USBs That's out That's an interesting owners, thing. So. What was that experience like? Last question I've got for you. What was that experience like for you guys to go through what was really, uh, wasn't intended that way, mm -hmm. and then ended up being a little bit of a beta cycle, right? I mean, software companies, technology companies here are kind of used to finding out from the field, mm -hmm. needs some work here and there. Yep. Uh, was that difficult culturally for Ford to deal uh, with, to, to get that kind of feedback from the market very different for us, um, really the vision of where we want to be as a tech company, mm -hmm. the ability to launch industry leading technologies yeah. uh, in a high quality way, robust way, but at oh, the yeah. same time be able to very, very quickly respond to customer feedback, both in terms of the things they really like and then the areas of opportunity for improvement and then get those out quickly to do it efficiently and to do it in a way that is... Um, Obviously free, but not uh, inconvenient to our customers. Free and, and easy. And I think the software-based updates is absolutely a perfect example of the direction we're moving in as a company. Completely. Technology Paul, company. Thanks right. for being here. Good to see you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks much. Paul Mascarenas, CTO of Ford, and looking forward to Ford's announcements uh, through their CEO, Alan Mulally, coming a little bit later here at CES 2012. Uh, in a minute, another live backpack shot here at the floor of CES. You know what that means. BT, Brian Tong is out there somewhere ready to make your jaw drop yet again. Stay tuned. I'm Brian Cooley at CES 2012 with CNET.com, the way forward. through BlueStacks. Here's Pulse. As you can see, that's a pretty quick load, and you can browse your news and everything. But down here at the bottom, you've got your Android control buttons, and this brings up your BlueStacks interface. From here, you can see you've got other apps to play with, and you can even go into the Amazon Marketplace and download new apps. So on Windows 8, you go from having just your standard Windows programs and whatever apps are, are currently available to having 400,000 apps courtesy of the Amazon Android Marketplace. 
It's pretty darn nifty. Another cool app that uh, works with BlueStacks on Windows 8 is Drag Racing. It's an Android game that works great on Android apps and on this Windows 8 tablet. BlueStacks is currently available in uh, limited alpha on Windows 7, and it will be available uh, in February as a beta for Windows 7. Later in the year, it's going to be coming out on Windows 8. At CS 2012, I'm Seth Rosenblatt showing you BlueStacks for Windows 8. We're the only place in the house with something this sweet, so you guys definitely want to check it out. But let's go inside of LG's booth and see some of the cool technology. One of the hottest things that everyone's been talking about is their OLED TV that will be coming out this year. So you can see the massive crowd. This is CES when CES is live and in full effect. So let's just get, take a step back here. It's going to get a little, you know, a little crowded, nitty and gritty. So let's just go check it out. All right. All right this is the world's largest OLED TV. 55 inches away. We're going to try and get in a spot where you guys can see it better. Let's come over here, Charlie. Here we go, right over here. So there we go. Four millimeters thin OLED TV, True Blacks 3D Passive TZ. This is the hottest television set out here at CES right now. Everyone is going gaga over it. All the circuitry and the connections are down on the bottom, but you can see the crowd here around it. Everybody is pretty much drooling over this thing. Everyone from the outside, scoot in here and get a second. Here we go, that gentleman over there, he's using the Wiimote, or sorry, excuse me, the Magic Remote. And this is the new interface. We saw it, you know, it was a little more primitive last time, but they've made a lot of improvements to it. Now at the tip of the remote, you'll be able to do voice search. There's a full-on browser with the LM9600 series. This is a TV that supports both HTML and Flash content through the web browser. You'll be able to view your Hulu content. It won't be blocked, but it's all, there you go. This is the menu navigation of the LG Smart TV. And again, when you're using this magic remote, it's it's a pointer. It makes it that easy. They A lot of companies are doing this connect body gestures and voice recognition to control a lot like connect camera, but that's not a connect camera. That's their own branded camera. We talk about everyone getting locked into the ecosystem. LG will also be having you give you the ability to purchase apps directly through their store. This is a favorite, Fruit Ninja, Slice and Dice and going out over there. All right, so we're going to take one more last look just to wrap this up over here. I know, see, this is, this is the zoo that is CES 2012. Let's just get one more really good look at the OLED TV. This is the 55-inch OLED TV from LG. Four millimeters thin, beautiful color, true box, organic LED, hot stuff. So there you have it, guys. We're going to wrap things up. When we come back, We'll show you some highlights from C Bomber's keynote. But there you have another look on the floor, the crazy floor that is in LG's booth. I'm Brian Tom for CES 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Microsoft and Bing specifically for a number of years. From Microsoft's phone to Xbox to Connect to Windows PCs, I've truly always been impressed. And their recent innovations continue to surprise me. So let us bring out the man in charge, Steve Ballmer. Join us once again, Steve. Come on out. Let's go. Fire it up. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to be here. Thanks for doing this. We're going to have, I think, a lot of fun tonight. I need to raise my stool and raise my voice. Let's go. Um, all right, so it's going to be a fun night. Let's start with Windows Phone. All these phones these days. They all make calls, connect to the internet, email, social networks, blah, 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 blah. If you take a look at it, the other phones all make the sea of icons, the sea of applications, the kind of view of the world. What we've really done with Windows Phone, I think, is have a better way by putting your people, the people who are important to you, right. whether it's dozens, hundreds, thousands, Millions in somebody's case, I might think. They're watching for the judges. <laughs> They're watching for the judges, but we put them right out there in front of you. And really, Windows Phone is the first phone that I think put people first. Uh, here's my Windows Phone right there, if you will. 
Uh, people tweet, they post, they email, they text. It all gets put together right there for you, right on the screen. What's important to you isn't lighting up email or lighting up the text. It's what's going on with brother, sister, coworker, your Twitter feed, whatever the case, whatever the case may be. Can we see the phone in action? Yeah. Uh, let's welcome, please, Derek Snyder. Derek, come on up, Derek. All of my favorite people across all of my favorite social networks. So I don't actually have to do any work. All these people are coming down from my email services that I may use at work and at home, my Facebook, my LinkedIn, Twitter, all of that stuff comes together in one place. And we make it really easy to actually mirror the relationships you have in real life on your phone. So I've actually set up a bunch of these groups right here on my phone. One for my best friends, one for my family, the people I go skiing with. And in fact, I've even set up a group here for everyone that's at CES. Now, when I pop open this group, you'll notice immediately the tiles light up with information. Who's trying to get in touch with you? Emails that are coming in, messages that are being received, uh, lots of missed calls that are coming in at the same time. I'll, I'll get you that Windows phone. We'll, t we'll talk. Um, <laughs> we also have the ability to see what's new in your social networks for this specific group. Now think about how valuable that can be when you have, for instance, your family and you want to see what's going on just with that group of people. You can see pictures just for this group of people as well and they all come together in one place. And so it's really easy for me to see all that right here. And we even do group communication, both with email and also text and chat. But unlike our competitors who have proprietary services like iMessage or BlackBerry Messenger, we actually use the services that you and your friends are already using. Facebook chat and Windows Live Messenger, uh, together with between 500 million and three quarters of a billion users already there today. And so no matter what screen they're on or what service they're using, your message will always get through. Now let's dive right into one of my contacts. Um, I've been chatting with Joe Belfiore a little earlier today, and you'll notice that the contact card comes alive, and it's combined from all the different places I know Joe across all of his social networks. So it doesn't just have contact information, it brings in the richness of what he's up to, the tweets that he's been posting, and I can easily retweet those, no app required. I can see all the pictures that he's been posting. I like to catch up with friends sometimes and see all that in one album. And we even have conversation history. And so this keeps a full log of all the conversations we've had across calls, visual voicemails, text messages, and even IMs. And so we, when you see here that I've gone into this thread, as we call them, it actually looks like a text message. But this actually started out as a Facebook chat. And so it's really easy to seamlessly transition. So Joe actually sent me a message here and wanted to see if I wanted to grab dinner after the keynote. That was sent as a Facebook message. But now it shows that he's offline, and I can very easily switch over and continue this thread by texting him on his mobile. And it all gets carried out in the same place. Now I can go ahead and actually type out that message on the QWERTY keyboard, but we've actually built voice throughout Windows Phone. And so I'm gonna go ahead and respond with my voice. Sounds great. And just like that, it will type in the message and we'll have that off to Joe. So that text message will be sent off. I can continue the IM and everything works perfectly. <laughs> As Steve talked about, one of the other things that we really wanted to do is build in this Metro user interface. And we actually pioneered this on Windows Phone and you'll be seeing plenty of it tonight. Now, if you're curious what Metro is all about, it really is about representing not the icon or the application, but in fact, the people and the things that matter most about you. And so these live tiles are constantly lit up, not just with a link to that application, but the content that's actually behind it. So you can see here I've got the weather for where I want to be and actually where I live, and it's a stock contrast. I can see my recipes here that are coming up. I can see that must-see movie, Twilight Saga, that I've been meaning to see, and all that's pinned to the start screen as well. I've got my expenses, I've got a Spotify playlist, I've got the Groupon of the day so I don't have to get those emails anymore, and I've even got my boarding pass for tomorrow. And unlike other phones, we shortcut straight into the part of the app you care about. So when I tap this boarding pass, it takes me straight to that page. So it's really easy to get around. Now, as you saw in that message with Joe, I actually have to pick dinner out for tonight. So for that, I'm going to actually use Bing. And Bing is to Chuck E. Cheese, but maybe the sushi sounds pretty good. And for that, we'll actually pop into this quick card. 
Now, the really cool thing about the quick card is that it's scraping the web's information, so you don't have to get dropped off into different websites. So all of that information comes into one place. I can see all the location information. I can read the reviews, because we're just compiling all those from Bing as well. And it makes it really easy, actually, to connect up to apps that are really good at handling things like restaurant reservations. So when I go ahead and click Reserve a Table, It'll actually know that there's an open table app automatically on my phone, and it will now pass off the information, in this case, the name of the restaurant and the location, straight into open table, so that with one click, I can actually make that reservation and be on my way. Well, I hope you've enjoyed seeing the Windows Phone experience tonight. As we said, it's really about putting people first and all of your relationships. Thanks very much. Let's go to the area and focus on Windows PCs. Windows has been phenomenal. The product, the technology, the market acceptance, the brand, and in a sense, one of the most amazing phenomena in our business, whether you go back to that first CES keynote or mm -hmm. further back, has been the way that the Windows PC has constantly changed and reinvented and moved forward and spurred other technology innovations. Today, over 1.3 billion Windows PCs are in use around the planet, and that makes it the most popular smart device around. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Marketing Officer, Windows, Tammy Reller. Well, good evening. Hello, everyone. I'm Tammy Reller, and I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about Windows. So here I am on the lock screen of Windows 8. And in the lower left corner, I can quickly see the information that matters to me. These are my new emails, my appointments, and other notifications. I no longer need to unlock my device, open up each program to see that there are new things that I need to take care of. And I can personalize Windows 8 so that it really is my own unique experience even in how I unlock that device. Here, I'll use picture password to unlock Windows. So in this case, I simply touch the first fish, a couple more fish heads, and I'm ready to go. And just like that, here I am. So here I am at Start. In Windows, Start is your home screen. It's your starting point. And with Windows 8, We've reimagined it to be immersive, fast, fluid, personal, and dynamic. The tiles, they act as a window into your apps without you even having to launch them. They are alive and they're always up to date. Windows 8 is designed to work with touch and with a mouse and, mouse and keyboard. So no matter how large or how small your screen or screens, you have what you need. So whether you have a 10-inch screen or four 30-inch HD screens, Windows 8 is going to bring you that no compromise experience. And I can quickly get to the important things that I need to do in Windows with one swipe of the finger. All I do is swipe in from the right edge to reveal charms. And charms are going to connect your app to other apps. They're going to connect to your friends and connect your app to your devices. Charms provide access to key Windows features, and as you saw, they're just one quick gesture or click away at any time. So now I'll actually launch a Metro-style app, and in this case, I'm going to launch a finger painting app. And in, see how the app uses the entire screen, I mean, literally every pixel available. Metro-style apps will have your full attention and focus. And I can easily swipe in from the top or the bottom of the screen to see the app commands. Windows 8 makes sure that the things you want to do are front and center. Windows 8 will run on both x86 and ARM. This tablet that you've just seen me demo on is prototype hardware running on NVIDIA Tegra 3 chip. Silicon partners, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, and Texas Instruments are all working hard with us to bring Windows to ARM, together with our OEMs. 
And this all means that the widest possible range of PCs and tablets will be available for Windows 8 across architectures, giving customers more choice and more flexibility. So apps are what power the new experience in Windows 8, and it does all start here at the Windows Store. The Windows Store will be the source for free apps, trial apps, and apps you can purchase. There will be as many types of apps as there are people's interests. We want to do the best job of connecting people to as many great apps as possible. So it's very easy to launch apps, and then it's very easy to switch between the apps as well. So very seamlessly, I'm able to switch uh, between, all these, between all of these um, apps. And of course, with the Windows Store, I can add new ones whenever I want. Well, the Windows Store will initially open in late February. And it will be the first opportunity for all of you to test out a range of free apps. Um, the Windows Store will be global, available in every language that is offered for Windows. And that's more than 100 languages. Free and paid apps will be available in more than 200 markets around the world. And that's just incredible reach. And the store is not just for consumers. If they want, businesses can actually use the Windows Store to deliver their business apps and updates to employees. The Windows Store is designed to offer something for everyone. Well, everybody loves apps, and we know that they're going to be adding a lot of them, both for fun and for work. And with Windows 8, the more apps, the richer the experience. And one of the cool things about Windows 8 is that you can take these apps and your other favorites and roam across your Windows PCs and tablets. And Windows 8 makes it easy to stay organized with all these apps with a feature called Semantic Zoom. So I can zoom out on this collection of apps, and the tiles become small thumbnails. This is also incredibly helpful for large collections of photos or large collections of files. And with one easy pinch gesture, I'm back. So Windows 8 works great with touch and with mouse and keyboard. Finding an app is as easy as starting to type the name of what I want for instant search results. In this case, here, I'll start to type uh, cut the rope to find the game that I was looking at earlier. And I can rename a group. So let's say this group of applications are the apps that my kids play. And so to make it really simple, I can simply name this group kids so that they can quickly know where to go to find the games that they play most often. So one of the other things I also wanted to show is how apps can work together to create powerful experiences in Windows 8. We built technology into Windows 8 called App Contracts that lets your app opt in to access information from other apps. So let me show you an example of this. I'll open up a newsreader app, and you can see I've got a recipe feed in this case. And so I will select this mac and cheese recipe that I think my kids will like. And so I want to share it with my husband so he can uh, make that for them at home. So I'll swipe my finger from the right to bring forward um, charms. And I'll use the share charm, which lets me share files with other, and other information with apps on my PC. So I'll take this recipe and using a friend send app that we created, send a message to uh, my husband with the recipe. There's veggies in here, so I don't think they'll notice those. And off it goes. And the best part is I was able to share this recipe without leaving the app. And it's great for developers, because now they can write apps that work closely with Windows features, like sharing, and with other apps to make the experience better and even richer for consumers. So let me show you how I can work with two apps at once. So let me bring up the familiar desktop, which is just one click away in Windows 8. And I'll open up this Word document. 
So one of my New Year's resolutions is to do my part to help the family eat even healthier this year. So I've been compiling a list of recipes. I can't cook, but I can compile. So that's what I'm doing. So if I want to refer back to the uh, mac and cheese recipe from earlier, I can bring that in and use Snap and actually view this side by side. And this saves me time, and it lets me see these two apps at once. And apps, they know how to best display their information in this vertical format, as well as with the full screen. Well, there's more information um, here that I want to see. So I'll go to this story in the Newsreader app and launch the new Metro-style Internet Explorer. With Metro-style IE, websites are immersive, as you can see and they use the whole screen. This site has my full attention. And when I want to see my open tabs or the address bar, I just swipe in from the bottom of the screen, just as I do with other Metro-style apps. And when I touch a web page, it is immediately responsive. It literally sticks to my finger. Panning is smooth. Zooming is easy, so let me zoom in on this story. It's immediate, very smooth, and now, in this case, I'll follow a link and actually finish this story. And again, the site uses the full screen and has my full attention. And to go back, I can just swipe, and I'm back to where I was. This is the perfect time to get a new Windows PC. Windows 7 today, Windows 8 tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Stephen Ryan. So uh, let's keep moving. Ten years ago, Steve, if I were to walk up to somebody on the street and, and say Xbox to them, they would probably give me a, a blank stare. Uh, but now Xbox is uh, at the forefront of, of games and entertainment. Did you expect to go from ground zero to a household name when you set out to, to do this a decade ago? Yes. I was optimistic. <laughs> I was bullish. I was patient. All of the above. You know, in a sense, Xbox kind of represents the best of a part of our DNA that we're really proud about. We make these big, bold bets. We invest for the long term. And we make exciting things happen. And we're 10 years later. We're the world sales leader in the last year for consoles, which is exciting as heck. We have over 66 million Xbox users. And perhaps the most amazing thing is we have over 40 million Xbox Live subscribers tuning in on a regular basis for a variety of different entertainment experiences. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Please welcome to the stage Craig Davison from Microsoft's Xbox team to show us what's new on Xbox. Thanks, Ryan. You're looking at the new Xbox experience launched in December, where all of your entertainment, games, movies, TV, music, and friends live in one place. Games. Music. Social. There's all the people I care about. Games. My games. Simply by using my voice, I can quickly pull up games like Gears 3 or Connect Games, where I can burn a hole in the dance floor, fly through Disneyland, or throw the touchdown pass with Connect Sports Season 2. And now with Bing, you say it, and Xbox finds it. Xbox being Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. A single voice command, and I can search across everything available now on Xbox. Movies, TV shows, games, soundtracks, they're all there. How about another search? Xbox being Star Trek. Yeah, it's true, by the way. I'm a total trekker. And there's the movie I'm looking for. Xbox, Star Trek.
We just searched across the entire Xbox catalog to find the providers who offer this movie. You can't get this kind of actionable discovery anywhere else. And now I'm thrilled to add that Comcast will soon be launching on Xbox, providing Xfinity On Demand's huge library of top shows and movies. I'm also pleased to announce a partnership with News Corporation that'll bring Fox broadcast programming, the Wall Street Journal, Fox News Channel, and IGN to the Xbox service. The new Xbox Fox app will feature all of your favorite shows, including Family Guy, House, New Girl, The Simpsons, Fringe, Bones, and Glee, all on demand. All of the News Corp apps are scheduled to launch on Xbox in 2012. These entertainment leaders join our growing lineup of great TV and entertainment partners on Xbox, including AT&T, UVerse TV, TELUS, Telefonica, and many more. But what comes next? At this very moment, we're working with some of the world's best-known brands, creative artists, and production companies to create unprecedented new experiences for the TV. Soon, you'll move away from one-way experiences of just watching TV to two-way experiences, where you'll engage with the TV. To show you what this looks like, please welcome my colleague, Jamie Bauer, and her friend, Ainsley. Hi, everyone. Today, my friend Ainsley and I are going to share with you Connect Sesame Street TV. It's one of our first initiatives in delivering two-way TV. For a decade, Xbox has been a leader in delivering really engaging video game experiences. Well, today we're going to take a little peek at something that is not a game. In collaboration with our partners at the Sesame Workshop, we've taken their current episodes from their season that's running right now, and we're turning them into fully interactive experiences. For the first time, you can physically and vocally impact a TV show. So I have a little one, two and a half year old Tommy, who when he watches TV, he's right in there. He's dancing, he's jumping, he's singing, he's talking to the characters. Do you ever do anything like this? Yes. Has the TV ever responded? No. Would you like to see what happens when it does? Yeah. Okay, let's go watch and play Sesame Street. Oh, okay, so here we are on the street. It looks like Cookie's getting distracted by Baklava, and he's left his skateboard on the street. I sense something's going to happen. Now, what was the number of the day? We knew this. Four. Yes. And for the first time on Sesame Street, Elmo introduced a move of the day, which is? Throw. Okay, so let's see how this goes in the episode. Oh, Grover. <laughs> oh, dear. I seem to have spilled all of my coconuts. Please help me pick up a coconut and throw it into my box. Okay, so at this point, I think he's asking you to do something, Ains. What do you think? Throw a coconut right to me. Throw a coconut. Okay, good toss. Right in the box. Now I have one coconut in the box. Three more coconuts to go. Get ready to throw another coconut. So now sometimes watching Sesame Street is fun when you're just watching. So what do you say we give it a try to not do something? Okay. Yeah, sit back. Coconuts, thanks to Cookie. Your turn. Throw me a coconut. Okay. Want to do it again? Yeah. Okay. See the arm. Oh, you bonked him on the head. Okay, good one. He'll recover. One more to go. 
Let's see what happens when you really get into it. Big okay, one. like a big one, like a granny or something, something big. Well done. You got it. We did it. Now there are four coconuts all together in the box. Let us count to make sure all of the coconuts are back in the box. Let's count. One. Two, three, four. Perfect. Okay, so this was an example of totally interacting in a different way, two-way, TV way, uh, with Sesame Street, where we get to throw something with our favorite characters, Cookie and Grover. Now, there's another kind of experience you're going to see us deliver. What do you say we take a look at what happens when we bring Sesame Street into our living room? Okay. All right, well, we know this kid. This is Tommy's favorite. Where are we going, Ains? Elmo's World! You got Elmo's it. Elmo's World! <gasps> We're in Elmo's World! There we are. Rainbows! Oh, look what happens when I do that. Okay, <gasps> nice. What <laughs> So just play around, kiddo. Oh, can you can you get the tiger? Make him scared? Good job. Oh, a monkey. What happens when you touch the monkey? So there you have it, a first look at Connect Sesame Street TV. TV for your living room in a two-way fashion is coming later this year and only on Connect. Thank you very much. So I, I think we're almost out of time. So one final question uh, on your final keynote event this evening. Uh, what's next? There was a real level of finality in that. What's next? What's next? You know something. We Windows 8 ah, is what's okay. next. <laughs> the next milestones in late February, and then boom, on to the shipment of Windows 8. There's nothing more important at Microsoft than Windows and delivering the kind of no compromise experience with the dynamic Metro user interface uh, that Tammy described. You saw Metro in the phone. You saw Metro in Windows. You saw Metro in Xbox. It's everywhere. Tablets, PCs, phones, TV, and Xbox. And you'll experience more and more natural user interface through Metro as we had a chance to see in the Connect the new magic across all of our user experiences. In the new math at Microsoft, Metro means that one plus one really does equal three. So in 2012, what's next? Metro, Metro, Metro. It's all right, I got you. And of course, Windows, Windows, Windows. Well said. And by the way, I think that is the, the perfect spot to end right there with that conviction and passion. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for, for your time. Thanks for the great work that you guys are doing and sharing it with us. Very exciting. And it's a pleasure to be on the stage with you, you guys. are fantastic partners. So thank you very much. Thank you thank all, all of you here. and thanks to Ryan. Pleasure. Thanks everybody for watching online.
Hey guys, it's Ray Beetle here from uh, CES in Las Vegas. Uh, this is the first episode of CES in depth, and we're glad to be here. I'm glad to be joined today by Ty Pendleberry and David Katzmeyer, our TV experts, and today we're going to be talking about Android tablets. No, that's tomorrow. Today we're talking about TVs, because we have our TV experts here. Uh, there's a whole ton of new TV technology that was shown or announced here at CES. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to go through. When I was looking through it all, I was just amazed by how much new TV stuff there is here. But I, I do want to start with what I think is the big news of the show, which broke a few days before the show actually kicked off, which was, of course, the... OLED. Yeah. Or OLED. Uh, yeah, OLED is the display technology that's similar to plasma and LCD that are available on the market now, but OLED has the advantage of giving you essentially infinite contrast, so those black levels that we always talk about for picture quality, really, really, really dark, if not imperceptible compared to actual black. So that really gives it an advantage, a lot of pop. Pe people who see OLED in person are really impressed. Uh, it actually exists, AMOLED technology, on some phones right now, mm -hmm. and uh, Samsung actually announced a tablet that has it uh, a little bit later in the year, but this is the first time we've seen these TVs in a real 55-inch uh, screen size, so it's pretty exciting. Now, that was the LG OLED display. Did you, did you, have you guys seen this TV? I have not. Tell us uh, how it Not yet, not yet. Yeah, been I out saw it this yet. morning. So, yeah. um, in person, it looks really, really, really cool. Uh, I reviewed the first uh, OLED TV to hit the market in the U.S. a few years ago. That was the Sony. That was 11 inches. That was, this, I saw that one introduced. It was this thin, and it was, it was like, a technology demonstrator, yeah, but yeah. this LG machine is for real. Yeah, this, well, you know, that's not a TV, this is a TV. You know? <laughs> and, right. and the real coolness is that, you know, you get this great picture quality, but you also get incredible dimensions. So yeah. LG is talking about a one millimeter bezel, which is the thinnest possible thing, so it's pretty much all picture, the mm -hmm. most compact you can get from a 55 inch TV. It's also what I'm told, 7.6 kilograms, so math, 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 hey. I don't know how much that is, but like 17 pounds, something like that. <laughs> we do a lot of lifting televisions in and out of boxes, so that's going to help us. Just yeah. as a side note, I was at the Sharp press conference, and they said one of their big focuses is going to be making their televisions lighter. About, I think it's Sony is showing this one. It's called, what is it, Crystal? Crystal Display, I believe it is. It's essentially... Yeah. What you see at the baseball games, you know, the huge screens that they show the, the plays on, shrunk down into a 55-inch television. That seems to be the, the magical number this year, 55. Mm -hmm. So essentially it's little LEDs, similar to what you get behind an LCD TV, but they are actually used to display the, the, the pictures, I similar think, to OLED as well. So I think we need a little technology refresher here because we are sold all the time at the, at the stores, oh, this is an LED TV. Uh, Tell us the difference between an LED TV and an LED TV. Ah, so LED TVs that we know are actually, it's a marketing ploy. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's just using LEDs like you'd get uh, on the power buttons of your television, for example, mm -hmm. used to light the screen itself. Because LCD doesn't emit its own light like you got in a digital watch. Mm -hmm. You actually have to press a, a button to get the thing to display. But an LED TV is actually using those LEDs as the picture, as the pixels. So there's six million LEDs in this television, mm -hmm. uh, micro, micro uh, size, uh, and it's going to be expensive if it ever comes to market. Oh, you uh, think there's a chance it won't? Absolutely, you know, they're, they're pushing it as a prototype, which I don't think Sony has done in a long time. Yeah, this TV, it's basically a CES kind of, you know, come check us out thing. They haven't talked about marketing this thing at all. If they do, it'll be really expensive. The difference between that and the OLEDs we just mentioned is the OLEDs are actually shipping. Samsung and LG both, you know, assure us that they're going to come out with oh, these 55-inch OLED TVs by the end of the year. LG says, uh, you know, third quarter, and Samsung will probably be around then as well. Now, when um, I, I just got a new TV, and before I did, I talked to the guys at CNET about what kind of TV I should get, and they said, get a plasma set. Now, there's only one or two vendors, I think, actually making plasmas, but uh, one of those being Panasonic, and they're, they're not stepping away from this technology, is that right? Why is plasma still a, a thing at Panasonic? Well, uh, the re main reason we like uh, plasma TVs is uh, a couple of things. They have excellent screen uniformity, so they, they have the even brightness across the screen. They're also superb from off angle, so as Ty was explaining, with the LCDs, you have this backlight issue where they shine through to the LCD and it actually makes the picture be uh, less fidelity for kind the Kind of angles. fuzzy. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you miss out on a lot of fidelity when you sit at Musa Plasma, which is energy efficiency. So, you know, all of these things are, are supposedly better for the 2012 uh, Panasonic line. And I called the ST30 from last year the best 
value I'd ever seen, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much in terms of picture quality for the money that you're going to spend. It's an excellent bargain, uh, and I think Plasma is going to continue to occupy that niche. What, what I can see happening is that OLED's going to come up like this, and Plasma's going to go down like this. You'll see LCD start to fill up the lower, uh, under $1,000, maybe some budget plasmas as well. But OLEDs, probably in 2015, 2016, uh, companies like LG are saying that it's going to be the same price as an LCD. So you think that OLED will take up the mantle as the high end where plasma Absolutely. is right now? Plasma yeah. will eventually finally make its exit? Uh, I, I think so. I think okay. it's a kind of technology that's probably on the back end of its lifespan. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, plasma is still going to give you the best picture you can buy right now without spending $8,000, which is what I think these OLEDs are going to mm -hmm. cost. Um, so that's still like a really, really high end technology. As Ty was saying, you know, they're expecting it to come down pretty fast, and there's a lot of impetus to do that because, again, you get the lighter screens, you get the smaller size, and you give people a, a chance to buy another TV. Now, we're looking here at uh, TVs for the next year or two, but just for the moment, uh, let's say that somebody's looking for a TV today in the sweet spot, which I guess is about 46 to 55 inches. What technology would you recommend, and what's about the price point for a really good display, good value? Um, you can get excellent values. I would say the value price point started under $1,000 for 50 inch uh, and up screen size. So, you know, that's where these, uh, some of the better uh, L LCD and plasmas are hovering right now, like I was talking about with that Panasonic ST30, $1,000. That's actually got down to $900 for a 50 inch that we gave an eight in performance to, which mm -hmm. is excellent and, you know, one of the best pictures we've seen. So that's a pretty good combination right there. But I wouldn't actually wait for this year's TVs to come out. If you're you can always wait, you know, yeah. uh, you know, in six months there's going to be another TV, it's, a, you know, it's an unending cycle. So if you're looking for a TV now, probably February when these models are going out and the ones we're going to see at this show start coming in, you're going to see really cheap TVs, really good TVs. Yeah. So I wouldn't wait for this year's technology if you need a TV right now. That's good because I just bought one. And I just bought, <laughs> this is just so I didn't feel bad about it. <laughs> now, for you, Rafe. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, um, Speaking of weird stuff that's going into TVs, uh, so we've got four different techno display technologies. We've got uh, Plasma, OLED, and that's actually a big differentiator for videophiles who want the best picture quality out of their LED-based LCD TVs. It's good to know the differences, but you know, there's still a lot of stuff out there. I think some manufacturers do thrive on that confusion. People just go, screw it, I'm going to buy you know, whatever's expensive. Hence, our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> manufacturers, thank you very much for yeah. being confusing. Please keep it up so we can continue to explain things <laughs> in ways they can understand it. Thank yeah. you. Uh, now, Panasonic, in addition to uh, being the holdout with plasmas, also, you said they have a dual-core TV? Yeah. Ta this is, Ty, this is crazy. This. You know, yeah. we went through the whole dual core was the savior of computing. Then it went into our phones last year, yeah. and now it's in our televisions. Next year, it's going to be juicers. Next, in our juicers. Yeah. Okay. But and Android juicers is going to happen. Now, essentially, what, what they're trying I to do is put it past them. They've tried the 3D is really amazing. They've yeah. tried the uh, it's got 60 percent more black, which doesn't yeah. really mean anything. So they're going for the technology angle. They're going for okay, it's got a dual core processor. But actually what it's doing is that because there's so much technology in there, you've got a lot of different um, things like Netflix. Yep. Having a dual core actually makes that sort of process a lot smoother. So do we do, so we want our, our, our big displays to be basically computers. Essentially, yeah. How, how long until they we get Android TV? Well, we have Google TV. We, we do, yeah. 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 We have and it right now. Lenovo uh, announced one a couple of days ago. Yeah, they and, have an Android, Android TV. TV. And a couple of manufacturers are still doing Google TV. LG is actually coming out with their Google TV uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, Samsung hasn't talked about Google TV, but I think they will too. Vizio even said, you know, they're going to push their Google TV to fall this year. So those things are out there. You know, I don't know whether or not people actually want them or enjoy them. We were just talking backstage, and it sounds like the actual apps built into the TV are not that satisfying for you, Rafe. And at the end of the day, you can I just add a Roku. You yeah. can <laughs> add a Roku, and it's fifty dollars, and you get the same thing, and and it's you know you don't have to worry about it. Uh, does anybody make a really good monitor that's just a display panel that says you can put in your signal and we're not going to junk it up with all these apps which we really don't know how to make interfaces for. The last thing that really did that was the Pioneer Kuros, what, three years ago. Yeah. They, they cycle is, mi is mixed up. I mean, the display technology that you get today will be good for another maybe five years, maybe ten. But you know if you buy a dual-core plasma display or dual-core <laughs> anything right now, that's going to be obsolete in 18 months. 
on the outside, technologically. I mean, most of the readers that I talk to are completely unconcerned about those sorts of things. They want the picture quality mm -hmm. first and foremost. Uh, you know, it, it, all these extras that manufacturers add in are a little less relevant. I think to answer your question, you know, guys can't do it. They can't build these, uh, you know, these TVs with just the monitor only mm -hmm. because they're competing directly on a spec sheet by spec sheet basis yeah. with other manufacturers, and they all have stuff built in. So the market really isn't there. And guys, you know, if you have six one half dozen the other, and you look at two TVs, and one is a complete monitor, right. and you have to take the manufacturer's word for it that its picture quality is excellent, unless it's significantly less expensive. Uh, there's really no impetus for that. And of course, the flip side of that is that the TVs are the expensive ones are uh, you know the ones that have the best picture quality. So you know they throw in these extra features. It doesn't cost too much to throw in uh, dual core or all that stuff into these TVs. Now there is one vendor that we haven't talked about and aren't going to hear from here at the show when it comes to television, and that's Apple. It, it, <laughs> it, is it possible that the reasons that there are all these smart functions going into TVs is because people are trying to get out in front of Apple and when Apple comes along and with their whatever it is television if they do do you think they'll kind of eat the lunch of everybody who's building apps in? I'm so sick of hearing about this Apple TV, yeah. this mythical television. Uh, the thing is, we've got an Apple TV now. It's on this show floor. It's, it's Samsung. It's LG to some extent. Mm -hmm. We've got these features now, and what we can participate, you know, imagine is going to happen in the future is happening now. Yeah. Uh, we've got it in Connect. If you've got an Xbox, you can still do those, fu those functions. So I don't think it's worth waiting for an Apple TV. Uh, you know, if you want that sort of functionality, which is still fairly beta as mm -hmm. far as you know, uh, being able to be sold in the, the, work, the marketplace, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can get it now, don't wait for three years. I, I think, Rafe, one of the things thing that has really good fish quality, mm -hmm. so the thinking is, if they do that, it's going to be OLED, it's going to be wow. Mm -hmm. I said when people look at OLED TVs, it is wow. You know, you're like, wow, that, really, that picture really does look better than what I have at home or what I've seen before. So if you're, gonna, if you're Apple, you want that. Yeah. Now, one of the things we haven't talked about is something that definitely is out ahead of the curve in terms of technology, and that is the 4K uh, display technology, which we're hearing about from a couple of vendors. Uh, what is 4K? What does that mean to the, to, to the buyer? What was that movie that came out a couple of years ago? Blade Runner. They actually re-released a digital print that was in 4K. Yeah. So it's essentially 4,000 pixels by about 2,000 pixels. Okay. Essentially, it's a cinema format. So you've got a, a lot of the digital films, a lot of 3D films are actually shown in the cinema in 4K. Yeah. So what they're trying to do is sort of shoehorn that into a consumer television for no real reason. Unless you've got a cinema-sized room in your house, you don't really need 4K. What it is useful for mm. is dividing in two so you actually get full HD uh, passive 3D technology. Yeah, that's so that's the only real reason you. So would when get you go it. see a movie, that a digital movie, that's mostly in that's in 4K today, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So the, the, again, it's for the big screen sizes, and like Ty said, the ability to uh, get rid of a passive TV right now is basically half resolution on 3D. So what LG told me is that they're actually you can get full HD resolution to both eyes if you're looking at this passive display uh, with 4K resolution. So that's one little selling point. But at the end of the day, these are again, uh, it's, you're not going to get any content that's 2D 4K uh, for the near future. Yeah, and I heard about um, where was it? Sharp was talking about 8K. 8K. So 8K <laughs> has, I think, about uh, the same amount of content for the consumer that is available as 4K, right. which is to say, yeah. none. Yeah. If you can get the master discs of Blade Runner, maybe you can uh, watch 4K all day. But uh, Do, would there be any uh, visual, uh, visible dis difference between 4K and 8K? Are we down to that, to what what Steve Jobs called the Retina display, where that's the limit? of our uh, resolution? It's, yeah, it's really hard to see the difference for a lot of people between 720p and 1080p. So, yeah. you know, when you start talking about these resolutions that are four times, eight times as high as that, uh, it's really no payoff unless you're on a gigantic screen or sitting impossibly close to the set. Hey, we got to wrap up, but there's one thing we didn't talk about because I hate it, which is 3D. So really <laughs> briefly, the state of 3D here at CES, if people forgot about it, is it going to be back next year? What's going on with 3D? It's going to be a function. It's yeah. going to be something you have. I don't know if they have teletext here. I'm an Australian, but uh, teletext is a feature. It's just like a tick box, and yeah. 3D is going to be the same. I can see passive really taking off. Yeah. People don't want to pay extra for glasses. If you get six pairs in the, in the box, that's good. And so you can watch a 3D movie once a year, maybe. So you're going to be paying for 3D TVs anyway. Uh, but yeah, I think pa passive is the way to go. It's one of those features that just comes along with it. Yeah. All right. So for more great TV co
And welcome to the 404 Show live from CES 2012. My name is Jeff Bacalar. I'm Wilson Tang. And I'm Justin Yu, and this is the show where we put it all on black. That is correct. <laughs> That's how I lose a lot of money, but we're very happy to be here streaming live from CES 2012. Guys, how are you enjoying the show so far? I'm doing well, it's officially started today. It has. Um, yesterday right. was a lot of press conferences going on. A lot of strangeness at press conferences. A lot of yeah. kangaroos. A lot of kangaroos, yeah. and apparently that's going to get uh, people buying DVRs. Yeah. I, I never put two and two together, but it's brilliant. It's the first thing I think of. <laughs> we talked about laptop manufacturers making TVs. We did. TV manufacturers making laptops. It's Weird. a topsy-turvy world. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yesterday was press day, and there were a lot of really cool press conferences. I think my favorite, though, the Panasonic press conference. A lot of weird things going on. It was like a return of the 90s, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a throwback. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, but uh, by the way, it's really nice to have more than two people in the audience yeah, today. Yeah, this is great. It's really <laughs> interesting. It's fantastic. To people. Uh, so yeah, yesterday Panasonic announced their new social televisions in conjunction with MySpace. When was the last time you even heard those two words <laughs> together? A lot of details about it, but basically you're going to be able to uh, sort of tell your friends on the TV what you're watching on the TV. You probably don't want to do that, though, right? <laughs> well, I probably don't want to do that either. A lot of guys probably wouldn't want to know uh, or wouldn't want to share everything that they're watching yeah, on the Sure, everything you watch on your TV is sort of uh, your own personal experience, right? Yeah. I don't know how willing a lot of people will be to share that information. That's right. Yeah. Well, I watch a lot of Cartoon Network, Wilson. I don't know what you're referring <laughs> to here. But uh, what was really cool is at the end, they had a kind of like a one last thing moment where they brought out a celebrity to promote MySpace TV on Panasonic. Right. That's Justin Timberlake. How about that, man? He came out to a very quiet audience. <laughs> Nobody seemed to care that Justin... If I was there, I would have been screaming in the front well, row. You would have thrown yeah. your panties up there. You're just Come on, man. <laughs> what, what's going on today with this, Wilson? You're, uh, you're blowing me up here. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so Justin is apparently bringing MySpace back uh, single-handedly. Is that something you guys would? Well, you know, I, I was talking to uh, Rafe Needleman about this. Yeah. And, like, MySpace should just stick to what it originally was. And that was like something that bands could, you know, get into right. and really like uh, uh, continue to develop that. For right. Them. Nobody needs another social network. Nobody needs another video service. Right. Um, especially one that's full of crap so far. Right. right. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's it's like the MySpace TV. That's the sort of thing. I feel like they should have like the MySpace, you know, like music player or something like that. Because right. that's what I associate MySpace with. Yeah. That's how I listen to, you know, quote unquote undiscovered bands and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. I really don't associate MySpace with TV ever, <laughs> well, you know, but that's fine. It's sort of in that same vein, last night uh, I was at Digital Experience and I got right. to see a television set sure. that I think arguably is cooler than a MySpace TV, and that was a TV set with BitTorrent built right in. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how they managed to do this. It's yeah. just going to spit out <laughs> citations every time I download something. You just buy it and you go to jail. Right. <laughs> um, but no, uh, apparently BitTorrent has uh, gotten together with a bunch of uh, European and sure. Admit, you know, people won't admit it, but they'll torrent something, mm -hmm. and then they have to hook their computer up, or they have to, uh, you know get a, a, a player that plays the mp4 this is just the bypassing weird. the whole thing making bypassing it easier for 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 you know. straight from the remote you'll be able to search for <laughs> lost you know, right whatever. That's, that's that's a dangerous combination you for know, me as long as it's not in 3d that, that's all i care about <laughs> i just want to hear about one tv announcement that's not in 3d not actually 3D. going back to the panasonic news uh -huh. they announced that this summer uh you know the summer olympics in london they're right. going to be broadcasting that in 3d that's the first Olymp time in the Olympics of ever. Well, they've been all broadcast. been in 3D. Now it's just going to be in 3D. <laughs> yeah, you can watch it in 3D. Not sure the it. Summer Olympics. Uh, I don't know. Do I really want to watch men's weightlifting <laughs> right. in 3D? Or like the shot put. Yeah, like yeah. ping pong, yes. Like men's table tennis. Women's sure. Table. Yeah, definitely want to watch that. I would, I would that. dig that, yeah. I don't know about Not so sure about swimming. the javelin. Thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Well, is it one of those things that really just going to hurt the Olympic brand? At no, I don't day. think so. I think well, uh, I mean, like people tune into the Olympics. There's a lot of national pride. Yeah. Uh, if suddenly a lot of people start watching it on their HD 3D TVs, yeah. and they get nauseous cheering for their team, <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's a good thing for. Uh, All right, not Noah. You're the only one that gets nauseous watching 3D. I am 3D. not. You guys the want only to hear a story nauseous. to our live audience? Uh, Wilson was watching. What were you watching? I was watching an African documentary. <laughs> right, and uh, he got nauseous after what six seconds of watching 3D television. Yeah. 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 
and I threw <laughs> up on the train on the way home. Did you? <laughs> I didn't well, know that. that. Was fun. That's gross. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's move along. Uh, what else do we have going on? Apparently, uh, there is a hand crank powered uh, tablet that is debuting uh, here at CES. Yep, that's so this right. is the like the third after netbooks took off. Uh, nobody really had a good reason to buy a one laptop per child, mm -hmm. and now they're. They're also behind it in a bit with this new product. It's a tablet. Yeah, right? so this tablet's called the uh, XO 3.0. Like you said, it's the third version. It's going to have an 8-inch screen. You're going to have your op your options of uh, two operating systems to put on it. That's uh, Android and then a Linux-based operating system. Here's my question, though. Why don't they just give away touchpads? <laughs> I think that's really what they should have done. I mean, they're gonna, yeah, they're gonna cost about a hundred dollars yeah. per tablet. Uh -huh. yeah. For that price, you probably could have just sent over a 16 gig touchpad, which is what I use at home. Perfectly good. You wouldn't have to manufacture. For sure, and you're not left behind at all. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> well, a little bit, about a year behind. Well, yeah, but you imagine a bunch of kids. The first thing they're gonna do is like root it or right. be really upset. I think they're really? just psyched to have a tablet. I'm not yeah. thinking about rooting. Yeah, all like jokes that. aside, this is actually a really cool product. Uh, Absolutely. The hand crank you mentioned is used to power the solar energy power on the battery on it and uh, you just crank it up or put it in the sun and it'll charge your battery for eight hours. Interesting. Well speaking of a sort of non 3D HD TV tech that finally is sort of taking off. Right. Um, Thunderbolt. Yeah. I was the you know high speed data connector mostly available on Mac so far. There have been one or two other computers that have variants of it uh, but the connectors and the adapters and everything that you could get for Thunderbolt mm -hmm. it was really freaking expensive. Right. Right? Like they're a couple hundred bucks, but now manufacturers are starting to release new products that really take advantage of that. Yep. And Intel has said that they're building Thunderbolt into their Ivy Bridge processors, mm -hmm. uh, which will debut after schedule they with really CES. They should really start talking to each they other. They should maybe <laughs> sync that up because yeah. it seems like you come to CES and you're looking for the latest and greatest. Yeah. And then they're like, no, we, we don't have that. That's going right. to be a little later on. That's a good point. Like there's a huge onslaught of ultra books right mm -hmm. um but they're going to be quickly replaced with brand new processor technology sure. a lot faster to a point where you can get some real heavy duty work done on them right um and the batteries are going to last forever essentially now, what's really cool though is that uh, i was walking the floor earlier today and there's a new drive that came out at the show called the elgato uh -huh. that's a solid stage drive that yeah. has a thunderbolt port on it and it's self-powered by the bus so now you can attach that to just a drive you won't need an external battery source and it'll power itself well, you know, I, I really think we're getting to a point where Thunderbolt, um, in a lot of ways, is finally going to be able to fulfill its prom promise. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, the, I think the coolest thing is the Apple Thunderbolt display. You know, like you like to carry your computer around, you go to a meeting, you, you want to sit and write in the part, right. product announcements um, over here at you know, CES. A uh, big one that's on a lot of Android phones that we've seen is uh, this new Gorilla Glass. Mm. Yeah, and this is something I'm really uh, psyched about because I feel like every cell phone, everything I've ever owned has always just eaten it totally. <laughs> you know, a week later I look at my new phone and it's just scratched to, to all hell. I feel like now that, uh, you know, this new and improved Gorilla Glass 2, they were throwing, I heard they were throwing <laughs> them against the wall, right? Is that, is that what they were demoing? Yeah. They were like literally having people <laughs> stampede over, you know, stuff like that? Right. Just to prove how scratch resistant that stuff Just is. Just to prove how careless people really right. are. Right, yeah, be like, oh, you'll probably, you know. Encounter a, you know, some Yeah, you'll drop there. your phone off in the middle Absolutely. of the street and a dump truck will run over <laughs> it. And this is what's uh, going to have to I was thinking right. they should just do a product demo right behind the stage over this ledge and just start dropping phones. Right, not <laughs> just letting sort people of letting know. them go and seeing what happens. <laughs> it's raining, seeing right. with the, uh, the displays. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, well, I think uh, we're going to take a little break. Take a little break, yeah. Uh, hopefully, we'll have uh, Kevin Pierre from G4 on the second half of the show. He's but supposed to be here somewhere. I don't yeah, know where he is, yeah. but maybe he's on his way. We'll find him. <laughs> okay, we'll find that out. And then we'll be uh, doing a couple giveaways with everyone who's here. So if you want something for free and you like free stuff, like everyone does, you'll want to stick around. We're going to give a lot, of, a lot of stuff away in the next segment. Cool. All right, so we will be right back. This is the 404 Emmer Effers, the show where we all sing songs.
404 streaming live from CES 2012. We're very excited to welcome our guest. Contain the... that excitement because yes. they're <laughs> spilling out of the crowd. I can't even. No we really appreci no appreciate you being here, man. I, I yeah. always love being here, man. Yeah. This, is, this is my yearly pilgrimage. Yeah, Not just like... CES, but to this table right here. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's becoming an annual sort of tradition. we got to break it immediately. This is Absolutely. for everybody involved. You take care. We'll be... no. <laughs> so, uh, how long have you been here? I, uh, three and a half minutes or so since getting mic'd up, but it's oh, CES. Okay. Uh, see, yes. <laughs> several years now. I don't. Yeah. They were asking me what my first year of coverage was, and I don't remember. But I'm oh, sure 3D was the next big thing <laughs> when I was here, right, right. and it still is probably six to seven years later. <laughs> Forever. Yeah. Has so, anything you know, that you've seen so far really captured your attention? Or I mean, I'll you know, I honestly haven't had a chance to catch much yet. Um, I'm really, I'm an audiophile, so right. I love new audio technology. I love that noise cancellation is finally getting good, where it doesn't muddy up. The actual sure. sounds you're trying to hear, Absolutely. and they're taking like you know, headphone manufacturers are putting multiple drivers and headsets. It's not just one speaker that right, right. and you lose all the resolution. Did so. you have Absolutely. a chance to go check out Monsters' new? Uh... <laughs> no, I saw Parrot has a has a set um, that sort of uses the jawbone jaw movement sensing technology plus right. three microphones built in to handle ambient noise cancellation when you're talking and listening. <laughs> right. um, that's a lot of technology there. Plus. You can uh, do volume up or down by swiping the side of the headphones that are oh, wireless. Cool. Oh, okay. Skip through tracks as well. It's going to be hours of listening time. I mean, it's headphones, yes, but the technology is getting better. Where it won't blow his eardrum. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then the other one is the one who really wants like high fidelity audio. Sure. And that's where like the the difficulty is in the middle, right? Like mm -hmm. you want if I and I'm the latter guy. I'm the guy who wants to know what it sounds like when they mixed it in the studio. Right. You know, versus like the bass being so high, I can't even hear the words that are in the song. Right. Wilson also thinks he's getting stopped because people are, are, are impressed by his headphones. They're just very <laughs> ugly. <laughs> Everything you wear is just disgusting. Yeah. So uh, my personal tech resolution for 2012, I'm going to stop collecting meaningless wires and USB <laughs> sticks and just every freaking <laughs> adapter you've ever seen. Yeah. I have a... you got to have a drawer or a case yes, or an ammo sir. crate filled that looks like knotted Christmas lights, yes, right? Yes, I, right. like, I bought... <laughs> what am I going to need that for? And you keep, like, the parallel port cables. Like, yeah, I have an old printer. Ones, right? like, parallel port. like, when are well, you, you ever going to Well, you never know. You might, you know, travel back in time. Because <laughs> he might years. come back into fashion, You man. never it's know. Like the new retro. I bro. said it went down that. too early, okay? <laughs> So that's my personal resolution. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna give them away? Are you gonna burn them? I, gonna... I don't know. I, I, I just sell them like... back to Radio Shack where they came from. I am Radio Shack. <laughs> exactly. I am Radio Shack. That's what happened. That's you the open your own one, on the and door. it just spews out. It's like a, it's like a, a jar. It's like a confetti of just all these different <laughs> wires and it's cables. It's also funny. It's also... thinging uh, just now. Uh, a, I gotta leave. A, uh, is there any? Sponsors I need to be aware of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We promise we won't hurt you this year. <laughs> um, so I got to get rid of them. And then the other thing is that I I pride myself on, a, again, I'm an audiophile. I like high-def graphics. Sure. So you got to have the latest and greatest. And yet, for some reason, I'll spend money to go out of my way to have a seed box in Lithuania so I can get <laughs> BitTorrent of low-quality XVID movies that are probably available on Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> I like yours, actually. Yours yesterday, you were saying you didn't want to... You wanted to stop labeling people random descriptions. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I have a habit of uh, renaming people in my contact book. Yeah. Uh, things that maybe sh shouldn't be said aloud, and someone wants to <laughs> borrow, their, borrow my phone and find out that I've labeled them something just, just awful. <laughs> uh, what is Kevin in your book? <laughs> oh, I want to know. We haven't reached that point in our relationship. Okay, yeah, right. so, so that'll, for, that will for happen. For uh, me and Justin, and there's Asian and other Asian. Yeah, yeah. Right. Just, the two, just the two guys. That, A1, A2. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works for us. All right, uh, let's 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 switch gears and do another segment that we're calling. No. This is this is a little up close and personal. I think I spilled too many beans, but don't you worry about that. <laughs> uh, so tech confessions. Uh, I believe Justin, you have oh. a tech confession you want to share with us. It's gonna be hard for me right now. You know, it took me a long time, but I think it'll help that I'm saying it in front of a huge audience. It's right a here big deal, Kevin. <laughs> um, so my confession is that I still record music off the radio onto cassette <laughs> I still do it. I have literally hundreds of boxes, what? Nike shoe boxes of Maxwell cassette tapes. Look at the way we're <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Wait a minute, wait. There's no, music on the radio? 
Okay. Yeah, there's that a lot of retro cables. Yeah, man. What the, I mean, I'm, I'm not even that bad. <laughs> Let's open up a museum. How about that? <laughs> the bad thing, though, is not, it's not even one boom box. Yeah. You've got the two next to each other, one right. with the record and one actually with a radio tuned in, right? Well, it's like, nice because then I can make cassette tape mixes, you know? I can label them like, now that's what Justin calls Kevin music. Kevin is losing <laughs> his <laughs> <rap> <laughs> <rating>. <laughs> It's free. Cassette tapes are cheap. Everything's free. It's not an argument anymore. Just in case, I mean, in case someone invents a time machine, yes, then you can go back to the... I think we had this group of tapes where, like, you'd have some uh, track on there, and then you'd have your mom screaming in the background. Right. <laughs> Shut up! I got Green do Day's you, on the radio. Now, so once you have a mixtape, do you then encode it and dial up to a bulletin board system? Somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> somebody post it in their file section? Yeah, so it's, it's all cataloged. It's cool very, yeah, he still exactly. has his Prodigy oh, account. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my confession. That is a pretty terrible, it's, it's terrifying... It's pretty pathetic, what, I know. Kev, is there anything that you would like to disclose with our uh, live audience and people no, watching? No, I mean... To me, it was, I mean, the seed box thing is something I really got to kick. Yeah. I got to get rid of that. Um, no, I, you know, I don't, I'm pretty upfront about my, you know, it's not like a, all right, I used to be the there guy, would, I'm sitting down for a dinner, a meal or whatever, sure. I haven't seen you in a long time, the phone would come out and it would be face up and oh. any little distraction or I'd constantly yes. hit the home button looking for, I'm not <laughs> connecting with people, right, right, I don't yeah. do that. It's, or did you say something interesting? Let me see if you said it in a tweet. So I'm trying to get I'm trying to get rid of that and get through that because I find that so many uh, friendships that I have with people that I truly feel like are good friends with. Be, right. Hey, did you see that thing that I tweeted? Yeah, yeah, I did. Cool. And that's the entire discussion. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the article was or the sure, photo was right. or the experience. It was just, oh, did, did you see it? Right. Well, great. So that's my confession. I'm guilty of doing that, yeah. and I want to try to get away from that. Yeah, this guy too. Bad news. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, no. That was my resolution actually. That I would. Uh, finally start looking people in the eye right. when I'm having a conversation with them instead of uh, looking at my iPhone. I'm yeah. going to lock eyes with people this year. <laughs> that is something that I really want to get going. Touch. Absolutely. Uh, so I think we're ready for another break. And then when we come back, we're going to be uh, uh, getting a few people from our live audience here to participate in a brand new game that Justin spent three minutes developing. <laughs> wow. All right. A lot of preparation on All this right. show. Well, he's playing Farmville right now. So <laughs> hey, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, so we're going to do that and give the audience a chance to win a really cool prize, a CNET sweatshirt. Yeah. And a mixtape. And, and a, a, a personal <laughs> Justin Liu. Now that's what Justin calls music mixtape. We're going to see you right after the break for that contest. We'll be right back. Now that's what Justin calls music. <laughs>
one box. This one. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the 404 streaming live from CES 2012. It's game show time. That's We've right. developed a, a very cool uh, contest for people to partake in. What we're going to be doing is something we're called blexting. Blexting. <laughs> right? And that's blind texting. Yeah, so this is going to be an updated version of that game, Telephone, which I looked it up on Wikipedia. Apparently, it's also called Chinese Whispers. That sounds a little bit That's odd. news to me. <laughs> to me. That's a little yeah. weird. That's a little, yeah. So we have, we have Ray, That's Nathan. That's like an Adam and Eve special <laughs> of the week. Right? I'll, yeah, I'll be impulsed by the Chinese whispers. <laughs> we got to watch that on TV so, live. So what we're going to ask you guys to do is take out your smartphones, and we're going to read you a sentence. Now, without looking at your phone, you must text this sentence. All right. right? Whoever comes closest to getting it correct will win this awesome CNET hoodie Ooh, that's got earbuds built into the drawstrings. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. I don't that's know how they did this, <laughs> but they did it. Okay. And to make future. sure that you're not looking at your cell phones, we're going to put these CNET TV t-shirts over your faces. If that's okay with you guys. Can we just put these that? over your faces? Just, okay. Don't I like worry. How you get consent live. <laughs> <laughs> just sign your name oh, right here. Cool? We're going to put these burlap sacks over your exactly. Don't worry about these it. These are connected to a car battery. We're going right, to so, these to you. So if you want to pass these out down to our three uh, lovely go, contestants right? here. All right. All right. All right. Megan. So Megan, Nathan, and uh, Ray. <laughs> Get ready. Yeah, get into the texting app. Yeah, we should, be, we should be ready. Yeah, that's the first so if step. you want, open up like an, uh, a blank text or something. You do that first before you're blindfold. You have to. That that would be tough. That would I mean, be really I, tough. Obviously, you're at CES, so we we think that you're pretty tech savvy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, let's see if you got, you know, any right. blind texting. It's so so you guys ready? Texting without a steering wheel. And right. Yeah. <laughs> so Don't weird. try this at home. Is what we really want to get uh, the message across here. So when you guys are all ready to go, and you don't have to cover your set, we'll trust you guys look at us, okay? Yeah. We now need the eye sentence contact. you're going to be texting. All right, look straight at us. Look right? at us. The <laughs> sentence you'll be texting is the Hey, hey, hey. Look. hey there, 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 there. You got it? Anyway. All right, you're, oh, that, that's actually even better. I thought Ray had a Blackberry for a second. I was like, that'd be cheating, man. You have a keyboard exactly. on that thing. So the <laughs> sentence is the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Look at wow. me. The Maybe quick no brown down. fox jumped over the lazy dog. I like Megan's a feeling around. <laughs> <laughs> you got a oh, you're oh, 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 That's we didn't, fine, yeah, right. that's good. The quick brown fuck. When you're up, oh, when you're done, give us your phones. The quick brown oh. fox jumped over the lazy dog. Ray That's every the letter in the ballpark. <laughs> Ray, <laughs> Ray accidentally Ray, opened his it? iPod application. Okay. Okay. Someone had extended right. ASCII somehow. So here we go. All right. All right, let's take a look at this. Oh Let's my compare. god, okay, so this wow. is Nathan's. Nathan says, Ulf Verum Fix Jumped Ice He Lazy Rock. That's not bad. That's, that's not bad, bad at all. Okay. That's, that's not bad. Hand. That's how you round of applause for Nathan yeah, that's here. That's better what than what Ray did. It, can you even read this? Riv Wuguf Soup Dude Gag Jazz Duff. That's not right, bad. Right, right. And then yeah, Megan. Exactly. That's finished. What did yeah. Megan okay. get? Megan, who used a swipe keyboard, got a Jati. Such brown BBC degree C degree C. That's Celsius, not bad. Celsius, Celsius. Celsius. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. Uh, judging the, by the, I think Nathan is the winner. He got the, the he got the most words. Well well right, round of applause for Nathan, ladies and gentlemen. Nathan, you get this awesome hoodie, mm -hmm. and you all can keep those T-shirts as well. Thank We're you so much. Round of applause for our uh, <laughs> you guys. Here. Excellent hey, job. Yeah, as well. All right. Very, Very cool. Very cool. Thank you, Nathan. All right. Oh, you can have your phone back. You can have your phone back. All right. That was awesome. That worked out. I, right. I highly recommend it. If you have an iPhone or even, I guess, with Android devices, that use the text-to-speech feature yeah. and sing it your favorite song as fast <laughs> as you can and watch what Siri does with your lyrics, Ooh. hilarious results will ensue. All right. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, that's like that. yeah, siri -oki, I call it. siri -oki. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Uh, so we've been doing something we're trying out here. You know, CES is a very busy, busy landscape. It's tough to even tweet. Right, we don't even have time to write down yeah. 140 characters. That's way too much. So we're introducing something that we're going to be doing. And we want everyone who's around here to retweet this for us. We're calling it our 404 Too Busy to Tweet, or for short, 2B2T. 2B2T. <laughs> Yesterday's 2B2T was... Uh, right. Just a letter E. Uh, and you can interpret that any way you want. Just uh. Right. right. So, so what is it today, Justin? So today's uh, 2B2T is LL. 
Now, Wilton, do you want to explain what that means? Check this Here goes Kevin right now. Yeah, he's, he's he's LL. LL. He's he only has time it. to do the LL. You can follow that at the 404 for our 2B2T. Remember hashtag 2B2T, hashtag right. CNET. Yeah, hashtag there's more letters in the hashtag. <laughs> don't, just you can't my head yeah, it's just a don't, implosion right don't here. Don't worry about that. But the reason that. why <laughs> we want you to tweet LL is because LL Cool J is coming up onto the CNET stage in just a few minutes. That's right. Absolutely. Jeff, do you know what LL Cool J stands for? Okay, no, I read this one time. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, think, what you're no. I think it's ladies love, right? Yeah. Cool, cool James. What? Cool yeah. James. There you really? Go. Well no. done. All right. Yeah, let's I didn't think you would do it. Look at me, yeah, man. I'm proud of you, man. Thank Congratulations. You. I can do it. What do I win? <laughs> Nothing. Oh. <laughs> I like that you said it like a brother. You win yeah. absolutely. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, that's a Zero. <laughs> So LL Cool J is going to stop by this stage right. right after we get off at 2 p.m. Eastern Fantastic. time. Fantastic. That's right. All right. Cool. Uh, so he'll be on with Brian Tong. Um, got a few more minutes. Uh, let's talk to Kevin a little bit about what he Ooh, thinks nice. of uh, what's coming up at CES. Um, what is coming and up what's at CES? And what are your plans? What are, what are you, I, uh, what are you Well, on? I'm doing a metric ton of live coverage for Attack of the Show. Right. Uh -huh. So I've been running around doing packages. We uh, hit the digital experience pretty cool. hard last night. Have you guys seen the Aurasm stuff? No, oh, what's real that? Time. It's an app that you can go download now on iPhone or Android. It's, it's sort of the, the promise of augmented reality, okay. but it's actually being delivered now. And you can you know, point it at a movie poster and the trailer will play, or put it at a, point it at a concert poster, really? tap okay. it and get access to iTunes or Facebook. Oh. So it's really being used by marketing, but what I love about it is that within the app, which is free, there's an, and I'm not a paid spokesperson yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. 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 Wink, wink, nudge, but, nudge. But uh, within the app, there's an SDK where you can create your own tags. So mm. if someone out there had the app, they could tag this stage. Mm -hmm. It'll upload the image or a, a fingerprint, as they right. call it. And then you can create, shoot your own video and tag it to the spot. You can uh, download from a library of pre-selected like 3D animation, mm -hmm. and you can make logos come to life. Really? You could have video play. Yeah, you could record a message and say, if you pointed at that CNET logo out in the crowd, your head will appear on it and start talking. It works. It really? actually works, and it works pretty well, and it's out now. It's All pretty, right, well, you so sold me. Yeah. It, it really it impressed me. It's, yeah. Don't get me wrong. It's got a ways to go, but, sure. but that is the promise of the future of search, right. cool. where no longer have to look at a bottle and wonder, what's the nutritional content, right. or what mm -hmm. is this beverage? That you point your phone at it, it's going to pop out in real-time display. When you're at a bar, mm -hmm. they could throw out a coaster. You could point it at it. Here are the <laughs> drink specials. Really? Here's what we're known for. Tap it, of course. Yeah, well, and then I mean, you I, get I, that I, into eyewear. And you're set. And it's over. Then it's Skynet. <laughs> and it's over. <laughs> yeah, you know, alternative it reality. Like when it first started coming out, we're starting to see it a lot more nowadays. That's when I realized that we're in the future. Sure. Yeah. Like, that's what I knew. The future is now. Yeah, well, I went to the Lego store uh, <laughs> the other day. There's a Lego store that popped up in yeah. Southern California, where I'm from, and they have a monitor with a webcam in it. If you hold a box, the box of Legos up to it, it'll show you what the completed project will look like on top of the box you hold up. Right. It's insane. Like the, all, all the augmented well, reality stuff. You, is really you mentioned cool. SDK, and I, I'm looking forward to like that time when uh, you know like people can develop things like x-ray vision mm -hmm. or uh, you know <laughs> that falls into the creep category and yeah. I think you feel that quite nicely yes. I'll opt yeah. out just so I can get the growth whatever it is you're using x-ray for I think that's that's cool. I mean, little things like, uh, look, of course, CES is always iterative. We always go, well, the screens sure. are a little thinner. They're a little brighter. Right. They're a little whatever. And, and the promises from three years ago are on the floor today, and sure. they work. And the promises of today, in three years' time, they'll be there. From glass, and in 3D. Glassless <laughs> 3D. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's always been the big thing. But I like the little innovations. I like a, a GPS dog collar that will alert you if your dog gets out of the yard and mm -hmm. texts you. Right. I saw that last night. Yeah. Tag. Like, it's a simple little product. But that could be meaningful. And customers have already you know, bought that product, and it's saved animals. It's sure. reunited families. Or, that, that's cool. Uh, last night at Digital Experience, I got to see a, a lot more of what Fitbit is doing. And yes. that's something that you know can really uh, impact a lot of people sure. in our community because yeah. we sit on our butts for 16 hours every day. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I want to track that. I want to track the complete <laughs> lack of activity <laughs> and cardiovascular endurance it's just in this my life. Steady horizontal <laughs> line. I like that. I, the, the notion that that it, discrete tracking too. Uh -huh. You know, that having to take a picture of your food for the go bracelet or whatever. I mean, mm. it's it's a novelty right sure. now. But the notion that in in a year time, two years time, that data will be automatically collected right. without me having to think about it, and I'll be able to track my progress, set goals compete with other friends on a fitness level, that might be the motivation that people need to keep going or at least make healthier decisions if a bracelet can vibrate as I'm reaching for, you know, <laughs> for shock. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just yeah. give me a little joke. Zach, what's that, a french fry in yeah. there? A shock? That's Done. it. It'll happen, definitely. Uh, so everyone should check out Attack of the Show. Absolutely. It's on weeknights at 7 yep. on G4. On G4. All right, make sure you check that out at 7 Eastern time, correct? That's or, correct, yes. Right, and online, g4tv.com. Yes, sir. Follow Kevin on Twitter, K. 
Pereira. Yes. All right. Make sure you Good do that. Good luck spelling that. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy all the vowels there. Yeah. All right. And uh, if you want to give us a call, we're all about audience interaction. If you're li if you're here at the show at CES 2012, come to our stage every day. 1 p.m. is when we're on. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna have Eliza Dushku. That's right. Oh and God. we're gonna have Wayne Brady. Can I come back? Why didn't he bring me in the Elijah hour? <laughs> well, I mean, they're gonna have a tough act to follow. Let's I can recite right. Bring It On start to finish. <laughs> All right. It. It's cold in here. There must be some Toros in the hour. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen that every time. There you go. <laughs> it's extra. <laughs> time out. Yeah. He's impressed. I Most wish awesome dude at CES or Outed. One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it either way. Either way. That's pretty good. The number to call us is 866 404 CNET. You can follow us on Twitter at the 404. And if you're still doing the email thing, that's cool too. The 404 <laughs> at CNET.com. What's the fax number? We don't do that anymore. <laughs> is there a carrier pigeon coordinates or a smoke signal fever <laughs> number that you come up You know, <laughs> yeah, we found and the whole Morse code thing. Done with that too. <laughs> All right. So that's going to do it for us. Thanks so much to everyone. We really appreciate you checking our show out live. And we will be back tomorrow. Once again, big thanks to hey. Kevin Pereira. Round of applause for Kevin Pereira. Thank you for our audience. All right. Yeah. And thank you to our audience. We will be back tomorrow. Take care. Until then, I'm Jeff Bacalar. I'm Wolf and Tang. And I'm Justin Yu. It's the 404 High Tech Low Brow. We'll see you guys tomorrow.
I don't hear anything yet. Check. You guys, can you guys hear me out there? Check one, two. That's good. Check. Hey, Glenn, can you say something, please? Can you kill the music in the studio? Thank you. Everybody psyched to hear uh, LL Cool J? All right, check one. Doing a quick mic check here. Hey, uh, Glenn, Glenn on the line, can you please uh, just say something? That sounds good. Uh, Chris, are you getting a good? Chris, is your level good enough, man? I can I can give you more. Check check. There he is. Okay, hey, uh, Glenn, can you play, start the music, please? So, Glenn, can you start the music? Test the music. Test the music, please. There you go. Okay, Glenn, I can give you a little bit more level here. Okay, you're live in the big audience, just so you know, Glenn. <laughs> Chris, are you good? I think we need some more level in the studio, though. So, you want some more music? Okay, let's. Uh, Glenn, if you could play some more music, please. We're going to get the levels in the studio, right? How's that? Check one, two. You should probably crank up my mic a little bit more. Check, check, check. One, two. All right. I think we got it pretty good. Okay, let's leave that up. Okay, I think we're good. Thanks. Yeah, we're good. Glenn, you can stop. Thanks. I think we're good. Delete those, Glenn. Okay. Check. All right, guys. Uh, in a few moments, LL Cool J will wish a little more inside. Let's fit as many people we can in here. Let's have some fun. But LL Cool J will be in the house here at CNET. You guys excited about that, right? That's what I wanted to hear. All right, there you go. Okay. Okay, just tell me when, Ray.
How's your CS going, everybody? Good, good. <laughs> around man a little bit keep it awake Tristan and Irene and Greg and Jarrett. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> All right, guys, one minute and counting. You guys ready for this? Make some noise for L. Let's do this. Come on, let's go. Woo! It'll be tremendous when he comes on stage. I can tell you that. everybody welcome to the CES stage here at CNET 2012 we have an amazing guest here we know the ladies love him the fellows got nothing but love for him LL Cool J in the house make some noise everybody what's up what's up, what's up? here you go all right there's your microphone and everything okay. so we'll be good to go good good what's welcome. up everybody how's it going everything good 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 all right, so L, we had a chance to walk around this whole CEA, CES, all the booths and all, you know, a lot of cool, cool technology. Out what there. was it that you said when you saw that asteroid belt at the LG booth? Oh, I said, I said, you know, in a, in a, in a couple of hundred years, it would be like, oh, what 3D? We're going there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, but that's later. Yeah. We all know that. Everybody in this crowd knows that. We're going to do all that. They're going to have big casinos on Saturn. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> we're just, we're just born, we were born too early. That's all that is. Now, you're involved in tech here. We came here, first of all, to talk about Boom Dizzle, yeah. your audio product. Yeah, well, what, here's, here's, here's the premise in, in what Boom Dizzle is. It's a virtual studio. And uh, my thinking, you know, a lot of times when I would be in L.A. or I would be in New York and my engineer would be in L.A. or New York, I would get frustrated. It's like, hey, Dag, man, I, I want to record tonight, but, you know, I can't go in the studio or I'd have to go in the studio. We have to email songs back and forth, tracks back and forth, etc. So what we did is we created collaborative technology where, for example, a, 
a kid in New York and a kid in Paris. It won't just be for professional artists. It'll be, you know, Becky in Idaho and her friend Buffy <laughs> off in college and San LL Jose. LL in LA, me, gonna, me in San Francisco, be, yeah, you know, something be, like that. They're going to be uploading dance tracks and, and, and recording <laughs> music. So, you know, I think it's, it's, the world is getting flatter and flatter, as we know. And uh, this won't eliminate recording studios, but it'll definitely change the way music is recorded forever. Now, it started off kind of as a social music website. That was the launch of it. Yeah, well, the launch of it, what we wanted to do in terms of the social part is just aggregate a lot of um, upcoming artists, a lot of demos, get a lot of these artists online, bring a lot of these artists to our site, because these are the people that will want to use the technology moving forward. So we have, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people signed up already. And it's really exciting, because this absolutely is the future of technology, you know, it's 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 it, you know everyone doesn't have money. For right? You can hear. All right, okay. all right. There so you go. Glenn, um, you know, I'm uh, in Paris right now, <laughs> and you're in uh, Glen Cove, Long Island, since your name is Glenn. Uh, let's uh, let let's create let's create a song right now. So, for example, give me give me a little guitar. Put a little guitar on, on, on in the session. Add a little guitar into the session. Give me some guitar. Now, as Glenn is adding this, rem remember, as Glenn is adding this, he could actually be playing this music live. So, it, you know, in, in my case, a lot of the music we make sometimes can be, uh, uh, you know, it's not always live. Sometimes we use synthesizers, etc. But you can do this with live guitars, live basses. If you're a Grapefruit Dead fan or a Zeppelin fan, you can still do all of those cool things. It doesn't have to be only hip hop or only rap music or anything like that. It's for all kinds of music, all the genres. You might be a Leonard Cohen fan and like his lyrics or something. This is good for you. All right, okay, Glenn, I like that. Uh, you know what, this time I want you to go back to the top, go back to the top, and this time uh, bring, bring in some drums for me when you, uh, when you play the guitar. So start the guitar and then give me a little drums with a little bass, et cetera. Can we turn that up a little bit? Remember, you know, I'm a little kid, I'm on punishment, my mother doesn't know I'm on my laptop, I'm upstairs with Johnny, I'm creating an album, we're amazing, we're gonna be icons in 20 years, and mommy thinks we're upstairs on punishment. This is the future, <laughs> this is the future. Okay, all right, Glenn, go to the top now, Before, go back one more time, before you do that, let me, let me add a little rap to it, and show them that you can actually record some vocals on it. Uh, I don't know these words by heart, so you got to forgive me. Um, <laughs> on just, you know, we'll just rewind it like I do in my real recording sessions. Give me a little something. This is a song uh, called No More, and we, it's, it's about relationships and being on the fence in a relationship and stuff like that. But uh, feel free to write something more uplifting if you, if you feel the need. <laughs> I need to hear, um, give, me, give it to me in my headphones, Glenn. Let me hear everything. Yeah, give, give, make sure I can hear it in my headphones and that, you know, the vibe is there. Make it nice and loud in my headphones and make it sexy. And turn it up in, the, and turn it up in here so we can make it great. Let's go. A lot of fun. You know, uh, Brian, you, my tech guru. The tech guru. I, I can do hooks too, trust me. You can. I, do your thing, I'll, you know, lay okay. something down. <laughs> so I have a little, uh, a little, a little Brian Brown over here. A little, little, <laughs> a brio? A, little, a brio? Yeah, 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 that yeah. with you, right? A little brio. Yeah, the brio. <laughs> a little brio. <laughs> Brusher. <laughs> Asian Usher. <laughs> Got an empty stair, house full of company, but no one's here. We're saying cheers while we're holding back tears to keep up appearances in front of our peers. We play holiday card tricks every year. Blackjack poker, make the joker disappear. The ace can't breathe when there's tension in the air. Three clubs in one night, but nobody cares. Cause it's still not a full house without a pair. You tipped your hand, but the text wasn't clear. You're dealing from the bottom, queen of hearts. Play fair. All right, okay. All right, stop right there, Glenn. Stop, you can stop it. Fist up, fist up. Now go back to the top one more time and let's do it again from the top. See, this is the cool stuff. So whatever, if I had a wonderful, unbelievable voice and I, you know, could get my Frank Sinatra on right now, you know, I could be, you know, I did it my way, but I can't do that. So I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to do it the Cool J way. <laughs> but just imagine I have this wonderful voice, all right? And here we go. You ready? All right, it's uploading. So what happens is, in order for us to configure and deal with all of the latency issues, everything uploads and then syncs up perfectly, just so you know how things are working, so you know. All right. So we're not going to keep that thing, right? No, we're not going to keep it. 
I just, you know, it was horrifying. I just wanted the people to, you know, <laughs> I just want them to, you know, know that it really works. But we're going to, I'm going to record this one. And then after I record this one, Glenn, we'll play this back for the people and show them that the technology works. Great. All right. Let's go. Okay. CES. CNET. The future of technology. Huge crowd surrounding me. Yeah. Dining room has an empty chair. The mirrored staircase has an empty stair. House full of company, but no one's here. We're saying cheers while we're holding back tears to keep up appearances in front of our peers. We play holiday card tricks every year. Blackjack, poker, make the joker disappear. The ace can't breathe when there's tension in the air. And it's the future, it's the future. And you know, you can have your, you know, apple bottom dean. You know, you can, you can, you know, you can have a song playing that's going at 100 miles an hour. You know, you know, whatever you want, you know. Do you believe in love and love? You know, whatever you need, you know, whatever you floats your boat musically. On that, man. You, know. <laughs> you know, you know, you might need Swedish Mafia or something or whatever you need, <laughs> whatever you need up here. That's a DJ group, by the way. You know, <laughs> just want to put that out there. You know, I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, what is it? It's technology for Mafia? <laughs> huh? Is that how they talk? <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> All right. All right. Is it, are we uploading, Glenn? Look at Glenn. He's never been he's never been on television before. Look at his face. He's looking good. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. I'm gonna play it back. All right, play it back for me. C E S C N E T The Future of Technology. There you go. Huge crowd surrounding me. <laughs> Dining room has an empty chair. The mirrored staircase has an empty chair. <laughs> <laughs> We're saying cheers while we're holding back tears to keep up appearances in front of our peers. We play holiday card tricks. Can you believe this? I mean, seriously, think about it. You're in Chicago, your friend is in Paris, and you're actually recording. No plane tickets, no hotel. Oh, my son's a singer. I got to get him a hotel room in, in, in Boca Raton. He's going down. There. No, you don't have to do any of that. The world is flat now. So, Glenn, add Neo to it. Give me another singer. Let's say we had somebody somewhere else. So put Neo in. Just add Neo's vocals so they can see that you can sing over it as well. Well, you don't need Neo right now. With your way is L Cool J. And this is how we play on the scene as stage. Oh, really? Oh, I really? I tell you what. I tell you what. I I tell you what. you know boy. what, Glenn? Glenn, forget Neo. <laughs> I love Neo, but forget Neo. Tonight. Forget that chorus. We <laughs> My man is going to sing on the court. He's oh, going to sing man. right now. We're going to make gonna this get your <laughs> CES. Mm -hmm. See that? That's baby, baby. It's El Cool J, baby. Me. All around me, baby. Dining room has an empty chair. The mirrored staircase has an empty oh. chair. Oh. I say, yeah, it's the way with my Uncle Jane. Clap your hands! Oh, let's go. Cause this is how I do it in the holidays. But can you breathe? Can you breathe? Uh oh, we'd have to redo that one. <laughs> Bring me up! This is how we do it on the scene at stage. It's the only way with L Cool J. Cause he's keeping it cool. We like to play, play on the scene at stage. And now I'm going all around in the Vegas world. CES Co, baby, can you hear me, girl? Uh, you know, he's laughing it up. Cause hey, this is how we do it. It's the scene at two days is up. <laughs> Yo, you gotta love it. Yo, oh, man. Oh, man. I just, you know, you know what? I want you to hear that back. Oh, I want to show you that it works. Glenn, oh. yeah, you. All right, so um, yeah, Glenn, you ready? Can you play that back? <laughs> this is so play fun, that back guys. This is fun, play right? That back. Go now on. think about it. Me and now he doesn't have to be next to me. He can be in Philadelphia. I can be in Albuquerque. It's crazy. Play, it, Glenn. Let's do it. You look red, Glenn. Almost done. It's, it's all right. Still, it's still uploading. Okay. All right. He's uploading it. You feel good right now? Oh, you that feel was excited? hot. That was. Come on. You just blew it down. I, uh, you know. Hey, Glenn. We, you know we what? Blew it down together. Glenn. Yeah, yeah, just do it. Yeah, just play. <laughs> just when play, when you got yeah, it uploaded. Yeah. 
You know what? Why don't you combine him and Neo? Give them a vibe. <laughs> yeah, combine him and Neo. After he sings, then let you know. Let I Neo didn't even know. I didn't even know what Neo's hook actually sounds like. I know you don't. I didn't. Yeah. And you didn't. And if you did, you could sing it as good. You got a good voice. Thank you. you. Got a good voice. <laughs> you're all right. Simon Cowell, you know, you know. Look out. But you, you're good. You yeah. know, but, <laughs> you know, Simon Cowell's kind of hard. You know, I'd have, to get you, I'd have to get you in the basement before we put you in front of Simon. But you you, you yeah, got to work yeah, me out a little good. bit, yeah, right? Yeah, there you go. But you're all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're all right. All right. C-E-S. C-E-S. The future of technology. Huge crowd surrounding me. Ballet room has an empty chair. The mirrored staircase has an empty stare. House full of company, but no one's here. We're saying cheers while we're holding back tears to keep up. See, this is amazing. And then on top of it, we have Dolby Technology. Dolby has actually allowed us to utilize some of their technology so that the mix and the sound quality is amazing as well. So not only will you be able to you know, record and actually it's functional, but Dolby has given us their state-of-the-art technology in term for audio so that it will sound great. So after you record it, you know, you can mix it and make it sound the way you want it to sound, the way it was meant to sound, and Dolby partnered up with us for that. So it's, it's fantastic. That was good stuff. You got your thing. Hey, you did you, your thing. we did our thing. We did our thing. I did it with the LL Cool J with the Can BTZ. we hear it for the future of technology? This is beautiful. You can't make this up. You can't make this now, up. Now, oh, I, I did want to have a few follow-up questions. You okay. Know, you were here before you know, the internet ever existed. Is this something right. that just and create and breathe and make great things happen? And I think we're doing that with Boom Dizzle. So I thank you guys. Um, I'm, I thank you for seeing what we're doing. You can do it all around the world. And, um, you know, it's the future. And I hope you enjoy it. And there are a lot of other great things that I have in the pipeline. So you'll see more. <laughs> I'm telling you. I, all right. I'm going to shock you. Now, there's we're one coming. last thing. There's okay. one last thing. Um, rumor on the street has it that you're an amazing hugger. An now, amazing uh, hugger? Like the best hug ever. Okay. I, I'd like to experience an LL Cool J hug. In, 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 a, in, a, in an agape brotherly love. In an agape? You use the yeah. word agape? <laughs> yeah. Agape love? Yeah. That could oh, be yeah. a hug. There man. you go. See, that's what I'm talking about. There you go. All right, my man. My man. My man. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, LL Cool J here at the CNET yeah. stage. Congratulations, this is beautiful. You, yeah. I got you All on right, that, yeah. right? Simon, yeah, yeah. Simon, help! <laughs> Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoyed the technology and uh, enjoy it. It's really good. It's called Boom Dizzle. I'll be at the Dolby booth at 4 o'clock to kind of talk about it some more, do another demo, and you can get an up-close look at the technology. Take care. All right. Times a minor to a major dude. We all lose sometimes. I call it paying dues. Now you're searching other clubs for what's available. A year ago, my slot was unassailable. My feast is a famine without you to cater to. If these walls could talk, what would they say? To don't you? understand what we're going through, but it's like you don't know me, and I don't know you no more. Not no more. It's like, damn, how the hell we get here? No idea, but we're not what we were before. Could it be that I don't love appearances in front of our peers? We play holiday card tricks every year. Blackjack, poker, make the joker disappear. The ace can't breathe when it's tension in the air. Three clubs in one night, but nobody cares. Cause it's still not a full house without a pair. You tipped your hand, but the text wasn't clear. You're dealing from the bottom, queen of hearts, play fair. Don't understand what we're going through. But it's like you don't know me, and I don't know you no more. Not no more And it's like, damn, how the hell we get here? No idea, but we're not what we were before Could it be that I don't love you And you don't love me no more? Not no more yeah, yeah, yeah. That girl, no. no Slip in the door, you home, I hope so. All I hear is love, don't live here anymore. We could tear the house down or build some scaffold. We're sitting on the fence, so where you wanna go? You're the architect of your life, it's your show. You create the blueprint and how the rooms flow. Before you burn a house down, think, take it slow. Even arsonists need shelter, let me know. Don't understand what we're going through. But it's like you don't know me, and I don't know you no more. I'm here, baby. Not no more.
I am Seth Rosenblatt at CES 2012, and today I'm going to show you a new Inhone Ultrabook 11.6 inch. Uh, Inhone is a Taiwanese company. This is a new laptop from them. It's coming in March 2012. Uh, it, the big thing about it is that it's really light. It weighs less than a kilo, um, which is amazing. Uh, it's got an SSD that goes up to 256 gigabytes. It's made out of carbon fiber, which is why it's so light. You can throw it even. Uh, it comes with a, uh, a Core i3 up to a Core i7 chip, which is, uh, means that it's very powerful. Um, and the webcam up at the top runs uh, 720p, super thin. We've got USB here. We've got micro, uh, a headphone jack here. On the flip side, we've got a MacBook style magnetic PowerPoint here, USB, and then HD out. Not a lot to it. And when you open it up, if you're familiar with the MacBook Air, you can see that the layout and the design is extremely similar to the MacBook Air. Uh, down to the touchpad, you've got backlighting on the keys. Uh, even the layout of the keyboard itself looks almost identical to a MacBook. But that's OK. We like that. Uh, and later in the year, it's supposed to be coming with Windows 8. So don't be surprised if it winds up with a touch screen up top. Inone has yet to announce a price point for the laptop or even any official branding. At CES 2012, with the Inhone Ultrabook 11.6 inch, I'm Seth Rosenblatt. Hey there, I'm Josh Goldman, Senior Editor with CNET here at CES 2012, and this is a first look at the Panasonic Lumix SZ7. Given its slim size, you probably wouldn't think it has much of a zoom in it, but uh, it's packing a 10x Leica lens, starts off at a uh, ultra-wide angle, 25 millimeters, goes out to 250. Thankfully, this camera doesn't just stop at that lens, uh, you get a fast 14 megapixel MOS sensor. Uh, it records in AVC HD at full HD, or you can also record in MPEG 4 if you want. Uh, get one touch record on that too. So, along with that lens and uh, all the movie stuff I just mentioned, you get a lightning speed AF system, allowing you a better chance at capturing the shot you want. And one last cool feature, in years past the uh, Lumix, you, you needed to pop out the battery to charge it, but now you can charge by USB. So no longer having to worry about finding that charger, you just need to plug it into a USB cable and you're done. So if you're looking for a fast, lightweight, uh, ultra compact without sacrificing zoom, the uh, Panasonic Lumix SZ7 looks like a safe bet. I'm Josh Goldman, here at CES 2012, and that's the Panasonic Lumix SZ7. Hey, I'm Donald Bell at CES 2012, and I'm here with the Samsung Galaxy Tab 7.7. .7. If you think you've seen this before, you're not crazy. Last year we saw the Galaxy Tab 7, Galaxy Tab 7 Plus, Galaxy Tab 8.9, and the Galaxy Tab 10.1. If you haven't seen this one before, this is the 7.7, .7, and the big deal here is that it has a Super AMOLED screen that gives it a HD resolution at 1280 by 800. So you've got a beautiful high resolution display here, also really rich blacks, really rich colors because of that AMOLED screen. It's going to be available only on Verizon, so you're going to, this is going to come with the contract. We don't know the price yet, we don't know the availability yet, but it's a great size. I do like this size. Um, and it's very thin, very lightweight, and you're getting the 4G network behind this too. So if you're a big fan of 4G and you want that mobile speed, you're going to have it here. Uh, other than that, it's running Android 3.2, so it's still a honeycomb tablet, but it's very well done. It has Samsung's TouchWiz interface on it, so there's a lot of little nice extras and details that Samsung has added to this. Another interesting thing to note here is that there's an IR blaster on the side, a lot like the Galaxy Tab 7 Plus. In fact, it's exactly like that because it comes paired with the Peel software that lets you change the channels on your TV, view programming guides, so you can use this as a universal remote control. So that's about it. It's a beautiful screen on a fast tablet that's small enough to fit in your hand, and you're going to see it on Verizon on their 4G network later this year. For CNET.com, I'm Donald Bell. Hey 
guys, I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET.com, taking a first look at the Vizio all-in-one PC. Now, as you can see, this is a super thin display because the computer is built into the base. This base includes USB 3.0, an SD card slot, and two HDMI in. And what that does is it lets you use this display as a TV. So when you're not using it as a PC, you can actually plug in your Xbox and use it as you would a television. Now, we don't have any specs about what's actually inside the computer. Vizio will tell us that later. But the computer does come with a wireless keyboard, touchpad, and a remote to control the different channels and the media center. The computer also comes with a subwoofer because it is a 2.1 audio system, and it also doubles as the computer's power supply. Vizio hasn't given us any information about pricing, but we should expect to see it sometime after May. For CNET.com, I'm Sharon Vacken, and this has been a first look at the Vizio All-in-One PC. Hi, I'm Bridget Carey, and we're here backstage at CNET's booth to get a first look at a new product from Samsung, the Samsung InTouch camera. Now, this is something that turns your existing television device into a smart TV by putting a camera on top of it, and it lets you do video chat conferencing with Skype. So what you need is an HDTV, Wi-Fi at your home, and a Skype account so you can talk to people anywhere using your television instead of being hunched over your computer screen. And this is a trend we're seeing now at CES. There's a lot of companies having these devices that you stick on top of your television to do web conferencing because, let's face it, how many times are we buying a brand new TV? So this makes it easy for you. It's going to be $200 coming out in March and has several features right now. It actually runs on Android and has a couple apps for YouTube, web browsing, photos, a camera, you have Google News and Google Weather, and in time, they'll be able to add more different apps to it. So there you have it from backstage at CNET's booth. We have the Samsung InTouch camera. Hey there, I'm Josh Goldman, senior editor with CNET here at CES 2012. And this is a first look at the uh, Sony Vloggy Live. Now, the uh, looks like any other mini camcorder you can find on the market. Shoots 1080p at 30 frames per second. Um, has a 12 megapixel still photo capture. Um, record button, flip out uh, USB for easy connecting to your computer. Um, but the live is set apart because it has built-in Wi-Fi and that built-in Wi-Fi allows you to do a few things you can uh, upload quickly to Sony's online cloud service called Play Memories Online um, you can with an app directly connect to your smartphone to transfer videos and photos straight from the camcorder to your smartphone or in the coolest thing which is the live factor uh, in the name is that you can stream live directly from this device to quick.com. So that means anywhere you have an open Wi-Fi connection, you can use this mini camcorder to stream live to your friends and family, whatever event you're at. So while regular mini camcorders like this are losing ground to smartphones, that built-in Wi-Fi is gonna come in handy and set it apart from the rest of the ones on the market. I'm Josh Goldman here at CES 2012, and that's the Sony Bloggy Live. Hey guys, it's Sharon Vacken for CNET.com here at CES 2012, taking a first look at the Vizio M3D 650SV. It's a Razer LED TV, which means it has a thin bezel and a tapered edge. This TV also includes theater 3D. So it comes with these four glasses with no mechanics. It's like the glasses you get in the theater. The TV is also stocked with internet apps like Pandora, Vudu, and Netflix. And Vizio tells us you can also stream 3D movie and TV content through Vudu. Now there's nothing groundbreaking about this television, but what sets it apart is its price point. You should expect to see this TV in January for $24.99. For CNET.com, I'm Sharon Vaknin.
Hi, I'm Seth Rosenblatt at CES 2012, and today I'm going to show you BlueStacks for
Thin and stylish, the original Razer flip phone was a huge success, and Motorola hopes the first Razer smartphone will also be a hit. I'm Bill Detweiler, head technology editor at Tech Republic, and I'm going to crack open the Motorola Droid Razer. To open the Droid Razer, I used a thin metal blade to pop. I then removed the screw. The rear cam against. So what do we love? Bluetooth and GPS capacity. The battery. Well, Motorola are forced to release the newer back several months. Are forced to release the newer better. Thin is in when it comes to laptops. And Acer is jumping into the ultra-thin category with a new line of Aspire laptops. I removed the speakers. Yeah, and then, oh. And now, wait a minute, I'm not finished. Come on. Come on. Hey, now, watch it. Uh, you, you think that's something? Look at that. that, that that's that? the, here's the, the iPad version of the top. Well, that's, uh, that's and the here's the real. Right there. Here's the real. You, can you tell the difference? No. No, you, you can't. can't tell How the you, difference. What are you going to read off here look tonight? At, when, oh, look, look at that. that. See, it look at that. that. Look at that. Now, watch It looks this. like a blue car. I'm not done. Blue car. <laughs> this is like a, an electronic slinky. It's oh, what the hell? Wait a Now. Now what? I'll be with you in a minute. You do that. <laughs> mm. What are you? What are you doing over I'm there? Getting, I have my Twitter device here. Oh, you're t you're tweeting now, right I on have a the feeling, show. And, and I, uh, here's something. You uh, are like Ryan Seacrest. Yeah. You're the Ryan Seacrest of okay, Channel wait a, Two. Wait a minute, please. Now, when you're twittering at home, you should you're supposed to be wearing a lead apron. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> okay. All right, there. Now, how do I send it out? You push tweet. Okay. <laughs> it's right there. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Ah. All right, here it goes. My, my, uh, it's, uh, and then what do I hit? Enter? Huh? I can click it with what? I know, there's, there's a hundred things on here I might click. Show me what to click. I'm ready. <laughs> Just tell me what to click. See, there's tweet, there's the thing. What am I gonna click? No, that, see, you don't know either. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try, here, now close that. Okay, oh, now close that again. Okay. No, it went, it went somewhere. Yeah, you went out, yeah, to your followers. You tweeted. Everybody probably knows that this is how uh, uh, publishing, how uh, literature and books and everything, this is the new face of, uh, you know, years and years ago when Steve Gutenberg invented movable type. <laughs> uh, but see, and then you just, you, just, uh, you just whisk it away like that, and then, and then, but look, what do you see? Do you see a page number? No. no. You don't see no yeah, page number. No, there is. How do you know when you're done is what I want to know. <laughs> Or somebody, somebody asks you, are you reading the, the book? And I say, yeah, what page are you on? I don't know. I don't know what page I'm on. For example, this I'm reading now, the Alex Trebek story, and I have no idea. Uh, no, that, I, I can't help you, sorry. Oh, I'm so excited about this. Do you have uh, Apple products like the iPhones and the iPads? I do, yeah, I got This those. is the uh, brand new Apple uh, iPhone. 
This is uh, what they call the Apple. Uh, can you see this? This is the Apple 5, uh, and it's fantastic. It's thinner, it's lighter, it's, it's smaller, easier to lose in a cab. It's fantastic. Uh -huh. And if you happen to be uh, hungry, look at this. Uh -huh. Wow. The blueberry. Treat. It's blueberry. I'm sorry. I, I, just, I just got a call. This is what I was talking about. This is the original... Uh, What's the next big thing? 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 Higher technology. The next wow. The next OMG. The next, seriously? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. CNET knows. Find out at the next big thing. Welcome to the Consumer Electronics Show. Welcome to CNET's Next Big Thing Super Session. Wow, that was really good. Yeah, it was, it was all right, wasn't it? And it's the biggest trade show in the world. This is more than 120,000 people uh, in Las Vegas for this event and for, you know, uh, hookers and blow. Awesome. Mm -hmm. The uh, first previews of the new technology will be available to you uh, today. The highlights over the years uh, that have, have been here are the uh, VCR, the camcorder, the DVDs, the HDTVs, uh, tablets. The hell? <laughs> <laughs> the, the abacus? <laughs> what are you talking about here? Yeah, the abacus was originally introduced at this event over 5,000 years ago. <laughs> That's true, and it wowed them on the floor. It did. It wowed them on the floor. Everyone in Vegas was like, Burr. <laughs> Much as they are now. <laughs> Everyone's very excited this year about the 3D TV, the new Xbox system. And now, uh, please uh, welcome our hosts from CNET, Molly Wood. That's her real name, Molly Wood. That's a great name. Yeah, it's like Molly, Molly Wood, but it's Molly Wood. <laughs> Hooray for Molly Wood. Molly Wood. I bet she's never heard that before. Probably not. No, no, no. Molly Wood. And then Brian Cooley. The hell? <laughs> Molly Wood and Brian Cooley, everybody. That's Hi, a, everyone. Hello, we'll see you at our CNET stage later for the unedited version right. of that song. <laughs> you want to see the outtakes. That monologue. That's the next big thing. Welcome to CNET Presents, the next big thing. It's our annual CES Super Session, where the CNET team lays out the hottest trend in consumer electronics technology. This isn't uh, long enough to get you through the year ahead, maybe the year beyond that. These are about technologies and trends and layers of both of them that are going to define consumer electronics and media and advertising for many years ahead. Mm -hmm. And in this case, this year, the next big thing is the ecosystem. And I am fairly certain that if you've been here longer than a few hours, you've heard that term at least 100,000 times, which uh, means we feel pretty good about this decision. We're talking about that essential, essential connection between the actual consumer electronics, the hardware that you see all over this show floor, the content on it, whether it's books or video or television or games, the apps, the operating system, and the connectivity. And the ecosystem is this dream that in some ways 
all combines to get us closer to the vision of the always on, always connected, do it all device. All right, how long have we been heading toward that one? Uh, those devices alone just don't cut it anymore. That's the big story here. The Consumer Electronics Show is very much about electronics, but now we can get those devices to sort of leave the ground a little bit, to transcend where they come from as tangible devices. And today we're going to try and figure out this ecosystem era by talking to some key players, one-on-one uh, -on -one with some of the biggest names in technology, really none of which will need introduction for you. And what this trend and what this era going forward, very deeply means for consumers, uh, established companies, and also upstarts that are on the make. Please join the conversation by tweeting your thoughts about this panel. Let everybody know that you're here, although I don't think that we can get anyone in or we're <laughs> going to cause a stampede. Unless your laps uh, are free. You can as we dive a little bit deeper and explore at least how we see this concept of the ecosystem. Four gigabytes of RAM, a terabyte hard drive, 4.3 inch QHD touchscreen, eight gigabytes of flash memory. Consumer electronics used to be almost solely about the electronics. But that's changing fast. After months of rumors, Facebook's new app for the iPad. Now, the syncing of media content is the slickest part. Blurs the line between what's on the device and what's in the cloud. And it integrates with your Gmail and your Android. Now, specs are basically the price of admission. And winners are built on the shoulders of what you can't touch, their ecosystem. That refers to the combination of device, services, apps, content, and operating system. When consumers buy a device today, they're really buying into a way of using it. Smartphones and tablets that are gateways to media, games, social networks, video chat, and more. TV sets, set-top boxes, and Blu-ray players that talk to the cloud, your mobile devices, and each other. It's media that is in place and in sync wherever you go, whatever you're using. But when consumers buy into an ecosystem, they're investing in much more than just a device and a few apps to put on it. Hardware, operating system, apps, content, and provider form a complicated matrix. Consumers first need to be able to understand it, then decide which one they'll use, if one. Apple arguably started the modern ecosystem trend with iPhone or iPad that makes you part of iTunes, an app store, and now iCloud. Amazon built a media empire first, then devices on its shoulders, most recently the Kindle Fire. Microsoft has all the pieces, led by Xbox, but so far struggles to put them all together. And traditionally hardware-centric makers like Samsung must figure out how to create ecosystems out of collections of services and partners and surface those to consumers. Then, of course, there's Google. The company that has created an ecosystem that is closest in weight to the Apple juggernaut, but distributed across many makers, devices, and interface interpretations, yet keeping Google services and software at the center of this federation of experience. But before any of us can pick a winning company, we must first spot winning strategies. How to do that is why we're here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Google Executive Chairman Eric Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you all. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It seems only appropriate now that we've given our long vision of what we think of as the ecosystem uh, for you to, I guess, tell us what ecosystem means to Google. Well, hopefully it means scalable network platforms that really provide tremendous customer value. It's funny that I would say the same thing by saying when I look at my, in this case, Android phone, I don't see one phone, I see a supercomputer of at least a million computers that are out there in the cloud somewhere connected by very high speed networks, tremendous amount of content and algorithms which are conveniently accessible to me on my four inch device. So when you talk about devices, I think in traditional language, you really are missing the fact that these are simply portals for, to use an old word, uh, into literally all the world's information. Right. That hardware is nothing without software, or in this case, services and information. And what's happened, of course, now is that all hardware strategies involve some kind of a software strategy and vice versa. 
I think in the Android case, we were particularly fortunate that we were able to make the Android operating system free. And so hardware manufacturers uh, could, could sort of buy in at essentially the right price, which is zero, uh, and get something that's dysfunctional. Right. And of course, there's value from having everybody in the same ecosystem. That seems to us to be the sea change, though, this idea that the standalone device uh, is maybe even less useful than it ever was without well, those content and services. Well, but, they know, have to be powered by a no, but computers universe. that are but, but computing devices that are not on a network are lonely, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes no sense to have anything now that's not on some sort of Wi-Fi net. Um, uh, one of the more shocking things is that Wi-Fi now is used to control all the lights in your house. You know, nobody designed Wi-Fi for that. There were, remember, there were all these specialized networks and so forth and so on. But in fact, there's a new generation of devices which are being premiered here at CES, which just get onto your Wi-Fi network, they talk to the other devices, and off they go. Right. So is it just about being networked to you? Is it cro Because you've talked, obviously, the smartphone is maybe the center of it all, probably. Uh, but uh, we do seem to see a universe in which all devices speak to each other maybe more than they ever have, and Android seems to power an awful lot of those devices. Well, that's, of course, our goal. Um, but our real strategy is actually somewhat different from that. We want to sort of move from talking about devices, which everybody loves to talk about, to rather talking about how it solves problems. Uh, what you really want to be able to do is walk into your house and have, as you arrive in your house with your Android device, all of the things that have computers in it sort of adjust as necessary. And so when you go into the family room, the television knows it's you because your Android device authenticates you as opposed to the other family members. A text message comes to you and it goes to the television because that's your preference or not, mm -hmm. right? And it all syncs together. And all of the previous sort of discussions about this have assumed some Uber uh, home server, some central master that would watching what was going on in the house and all the different devices. But in fact, that's completely wrong. Um, the right model is to think of these as peer-to-peer -peer devices that talk to each other and they understand roughly what their function is and what people want. They can be configured in an opt-in way, obviously, uh, and it, it becomes seamless. The trick to consumer products is to make them work. Right? It is remarkable to me that we've spent, and I've been coming here for 20 years, building products that aren't very good. Right? The, the, the products that require enormous amount of technical knowledge to keep them running. Mm -hmm. right? So we've now seen in the last few years with a number of vendors, Google obviously being one, where the product is so simple it just works. And underlying that simplicity is extraordinarily difficult and expensive engineering, which is what's happening in these large platform companies that you see. So is Android your vehicle for getting to that end product? Or, you know, is it your goal to, we've seen Android TVs announced here, obviously tablets, obviously smartphones. Is it your goal to have Android in refrigerators? To re, you know, to, uh, is that the um, vehicle for Google to get there? Well, the, you know, refrigerators do need some automation, mm -hmm. right? If you think about it, uh, they need to actually deal with in, their energy costs. There's been a lot of surveys about getting your energy bills down and so forth. And indeed, there are companies that are putting Android in refrigerators. So there. Uh, now, are these, because they're, are these because they're brilliant and they've done a full evaluation of all their choices, or did they simply choose Android because it was free? You know, you never know. Um, and one of the key things about the Android platform and our licenses is often these are things that we don't know until they get announced. And so when we say open source, we mean take it and have a good time. Um, and that's, I think, one of the sort of core strategies which differentiates us from the other vendors. To that end, actually, much uh, in a different fashion from Apple or even Microsoft, the, uh, cert, let's talk about, let's start with smartphones. Uh, the carriers, the manufacturers have a great deal of influence over Android. Is that a positive, do you think, all the time? You know, there's always a balance between what the carrier wants, what the consumer wants, what the vendor wants, what the advertiser wants, and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. We've taken the position that uh, you can take the Android operating system and you can do whatever you want to with it. If you want to use our certification, you have to essentially be conformant to the principles of the Android market. And our reasoning, uh, which I think ultimately, uh, you know, I wish people had invented this many years ago, I think the, the first company to really do this, is that what people really care about, using in your language, is that there's an interoperable, oper um, an interoperable ecosystem of applications. There's more than 300,000. Remember when, when, when Apple was busy talking about they had this many, this many, this many, well, now we have more than 300,000 applications on top of the Android ecosystem, so there. Um, a scalable model really means that you could start building these things quickly. And it benefits the whole to have an application that runs on every device. Uh, I asked our users what they were interested in hearing from you to that point. And the, the single most common question, especially on Google+, was whether you would ever offer a stock vanilla option for every Android phone, maybe a second ROM. 
right. that users could, and so that fragmentation does appear to be well, maybe hampering. You want to be careful about the word fragmentation. Okay. When I use the word fragmentation, I'm Differentiation? Uh, yeah, differentiation is different from fragmentation. Differentiation is positive, fragmentation is negative. Um, differentiation. So differentiation, for the sake you. of the room. D differentiation means that you have a choice and the people who are making, and let's use phones as an example, people who are making phones, they're going to compete based on their view of innovation and they're going to try to convince you that theirs is better than somebody else. Fragmentation means that you have some application that you care about and it only runs on one and not the other and you, only, and you don't have a choice. This is an important, important subtlety. Sure, but isn't some um, of that happening to some extent uh, with no. Android? It's not. Um, what's happening is our, our core strategy is to get everybody under the ice, um, ice cream sandwich, which is the new release, which is on this phone. Um, and we, al we absolutely allow, as part of our normal standard business, our, our partners to add or change the user interfaces and so forth as long as they don't break applications compatibility. We see this as a plus. It's an area for a differentiation. They can adapt their software to the necessary hardware changes that they want. And it's given you far, far more choices than any other strategy we could have imagined. Do you think that ice cream sandwich is an opportunity for maybe a little greater control, or do you feel like that's not necessary? Well, the, at least uh, over the, when, over the skinning when and you some say, of the differentiation. When you, when you say control, it's absolutely a, 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 an opportunity to standardize the APIs and the basic level of services that Android phones offer. It is not a requirement that one use exactly the same user interfaces and so forth. Although we certainly hope everybody will use the standard user interface, people are free to make the necessary changes as they see best. And what's great about it is if you don't like it, you don't have to buy that phone, you can buy it from somebody else. You actually have a choice. Competition provides value, drives costs down, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about the living room a little bit. That seems to be a bigger and bigger part of the ecosystem, right. certainly relevant to this show here. Uh, how do you get there? And we've seen now Google TV, a bigger part of LG's lineup this year. Yeah. Also Android on TV, do you, is there crossover? Is, you know, is Android the road? How do you get in the living room? Well, of course, Google TV is doing very well. We, uh, LG just announced, uh, Samsung has announced that they're working on some stuff. We have a whole bunch of additional partners coming. We released Google TV in roughly September. Uh, it's the only, uh, only offering I know of that fully integrates the television experience and the browsing experience. All the ones that have been debuted previously have had limitations. This is a full function browser, a full function platform for combining internet capabilities, internet viewing, as well as traditional television viewing. We've argued quite strongly that people will watch more television because of Google Television, because they don't need to go somewhere else. They don't have to go to their other screen. It's all there. They can go back and forth and integrate and cross-integrate uh, them. Google TV is an example of the point I was making earlier, which is that the more and more of the devices that you have in the home, the more they can talk to each other to configure around your needs. So if your TV is running Android, your phone is running Android, they can talk to each other. How important is content in that scenario? Well, of course, content is what drives everything. Uh, we've been fortunate that we've now, uh, and I think it took, quite a, took us a long time, to complete the necessary pieces we needed. Uh, we were able to launch a couple months ago Google Music. And if you haven't tried it, I encourage you to do it. Three of the four major labels, more than 1,000 of the independent labels, all, there's lots and lots of music in a partnership that you can purchase. Um, there are, there's also a mechanism for people who are truly independent who don't want to be uh, labels themselves to publish their information into that ecosystem. And it's available on all the new, on all the new um, Android devices. We had previously done books and movies. I think we have a full offering now. So uh, you obviously have a long list of products. How important is integration? We have a lot of users saying, can I get a dashboard, a unified dashboard for G+, for Gmail, for, for, but also true convergence between Gtalk and, and voice? And this has been Larry, you know, uh, Larry as CEO decided to much, much more focus on, on solving this problem than I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, since essentially April or May has been leading an internal effort to completely standardize, standardize both the UI and the expression across this for precisely the reason that you're in. Historically, Google has but sort of reasonably independent units of creativity. It served us very well, but it driv drove this slightly different feeling to everything, and we made a decision to cross-integrate it. And you're seeing that roll out now, product by product. If you go back and look at Google, the sum of Google today, you'll see it's really quite different. And how big a barrier is that? Microsoft, for example, seems to have all of the pieces in place for sort of a true integrated ecosystem strategy and yet is not there yet. Are you concerned that you may end well, up with a lot of trapped, pieces of a whole? Microsoft's trapped in an in a, uh, architectural transition problem mm -hmm. that they may not get through. 
uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, no, no, keep it coming. Uh, really, feel free. But uh, in, in our case, we were, we were in the right architecture structure, and our issue was just literally there's so many choices presented by this web architecture mm -hmm. that you do need some level of standardization. Uh, my sense is we're going to get there. The designs are there. We're rolling it through. But it's um, not just designs, right? I mean, the idea of integrating is much more than design. It's, it's a problem of user people with great taste, right, and, and they exist, mm -hmm. getting them into the company, doing the testing is what is both beautiful and expresses in all the things that you can do, press different buttons. That's where we all came from. Right. The new model is much, much cleaner, much, much more pristine, much more spare, and it does enough can find it. Oh, I hate to keep going back to this, but how do you do that if Android looks different on every phone? Uh, because, the, b because the base icons and so forth are typically not changing. Okay. What's happening now, if you look at the partners, is they are adding things, but they're typically adding them at the iconic level, not at the basic UI mechanisms. One of the everybody's using the same way to draw a ruler and draw and do kerning and the things that you have to do to make a but let's talk a little bit about those competitors. Apple uh, and, and actually Windows Phone seem to be taking a much more controlled model, a much so, more sort of consistent interface model, lockdown model, if you will. Uh, what do you think about this? Well, Apple, of course, has done very well. And of course, I'm a, a very proud uh, former board member of, of Apple. Mm -hmm. Um, and their, mo their model works with some limitations in terms of you only have one source of your hardware supplier and that kind of thing. Um, and they do, a, they do a very good job of essentially checking everything that goes in. We chose an alternate model. Our model was that we would allow, we would be much looser, if you will, and people would report if there were problems. Uh, this leads to the situation where Apple, for example, can, has to pr essentially pre-approve your app, whereas in our case, the app can show up, and unless it violates our, our very guidelines, you can leave it up. Uh, we prefer the latter model, which is more open. I think both models will do well for a while because it's such a large market. Uh, that give you some of the numbers. Uh, Android is activating stations a day. Uh, there are more than 200 million Android phones in the world today. We activated 3 million phones on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Few weeks and you'll see that that Android in my view is on on what are your thoughts on as long as we're talking about the competition what are your thoughts on the Kindle fire sort of another approach to the ecosystem building that content back in first and hardware to follow has also done well um, it's important to note that it's based on Android uh, but but they chose and they did so legitimately and this is part of what open systems means they've chosen the various Android guidelines and the Android marketplace so the Kindle fire comes with some limitations which have been well documented by CNET and others. And it looks to us as though it was largely derived to well as well. And I think it's another validation um, of the Android strategy. Uh, and then another method, we're going to talk to Samsung next about their approach to this ecosystem. Hardware driven, the idea of all these devices talking to each other, which you have laid out. Hardware makers can get there when they're not, for example, a platform and content provider. I'm going to say right now that Samsung has become one of our strongest Android partners. Right. And so I. I so you're not going to say anything good? <laughs> uh, good in your sad in mine. The, okay. Gets it. They yeah. understand the vision that I'm describing, and my guess is that uh, they can actually articulate it even more clearly than I can, because they can talk about the device that you'll get in six months and how it's better integrated. The device in twelve this model. So, if how much of a concern is? lock-in, media lock-in to some extent. If you buy, in fact, a, there was a, an Apple legal representative quoted in court in Australia. Lawsuit was primarily about ecosystem, that it was about, you know, customers who would buy a bunch of media that wouldn't work on an iPad. Okay, this Convoluted, reason, I know. Yeah, th this, this reasoning is only the reasoning that a lawyer who was paid for by Apple could have come up with. <laughs> Apple, I don't know, Apple though, if worked, everybody Apple, buys a bunch of stuff Apple worked very hard to block choice in Germany by trying to prevent Samsung tablets to becoming available. Right. right. That's called prevention of choice. Consumers should want choices. I don't mind if you actually prefer the other guy's product. I'd like you to evaluate mine fairly and make an appropriate decision as a consumer. It's called competition. Right. Well, and you, the, the, the media that you sell is primarily open formats, right, that can be transferred to other devices. That, I think, is the, where customers worry about lock-in. Do they have to buy all Samsung forever Well, with it, for well, everything to work? Well, certainly with Android, you, the Android platform is media interoperable. And so all the products that I was talking about, the movies and the music and so forth, work on non-Samsung as well as Samsung devices, right. and that's part of the promise. 
Uh, if you're asking what does a consumer think about media law, again, a consumer is pretty straightforward. It's pretty well understood. They want to be able to purchase, and I hope legally, uh, copyrighted information. They want to be able to repurpose it on every device in their home, in their office, without any hassle. And why it's so hard for all of us to understand that is beyond me. Um, and a lot of them are unwilling to, to do things which are illegal, various forms of copying and so forth, because they're prevented legally to pay for it. It would be much better, much better for the industries as a whole to organize themselves to allow that to occur and to get an appropriate fee for doing so. All right, last question. If you had to pick one element of what we're calling at least the ecosystem, hardware, content, services, or software, what do you think it would be? Well, they work together. The thing that, I'll answer a different question, which is what was the most surprising thing in 2011? Okay. And, <laughs> and, I, and I think that... I, that I, was also my question. And, but I, but, I, but, I, but I, think it will, I think it will also answer that, frame it differently. Absolutely. That, sorry. Um, the, <laughs> Do what you want. The, the power of the ecosystem that you're describing, it's always a surprise to people when they discover how powerful these ecosystems are, which I think is the point of your panel and, mm -hmm. and your whole meeting today. Um, and it's even for me, and I've done this for 20 years, I was surprised again at the power of the ecosystems that have been built. And I say this with respect to the Amazon ecosystem, to the Apple ecosystem, even to the Facebook ecosystem, which have similar characteristics in this regard, as well as obviously the Google one. And the reason they're so powerful and the reason your argument is so right is that it's the fact that everyone is working against this sort of cloud model, platform model, means everybody's a winner. And because everybody's a winner, you get enormous, uh, essentially, growth effects. You get this person helping you, and you get this person helping you, and you get this application helping you. And all of these people can operate without your knowledge and control. The secret in computing and these platforms is to make them open enough, and we would argue as open as possible, so that you can enable, enable the creative people, whether it's the content people, the apps developers, the software developers, or the consumers, to use them, to love them, to extend them, and so forth. Not only do you build tremendous value, you, tremendous, you build tremendous loyalty, they are economically very, very valuable to all of the players, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We haven't talked very much about the other component, which is the ability to bring in money, right. to be able to pay, to pay for all this infrastructure, which is not cheap. So it's the sum of all of that and the rate at which it has occurred that I think has been the biggest surprise. Great. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you all. Thank note. you, Molly. Good question. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you. Stay here for just a minute, if you would. Thank you so much to Eric Schmidt. Now, that is, of course, the Google vision of the ecosystem. Now, though, as you walk the halls of this show, obviously, you see consumer electronics manufacturers everywhere, people who have built their brands and made all their money on electronics. So that brings us to a slightly different take on the ecosystem. <laughs> We've seen how ecosystems proceed when they're service-centric, offering search, video, social, and more on a largely hardware-agnostic basis. But what if you're a leader in televisions or smartphones and more? How do you keep wielding that advantage while offering an operating system you didn't develop, apps you don't write, and content you don't own, and still come out on top and stay unique? Hardware takes on a different role in the ecosystem era, but never assume it doesn't matter. Samsung is behind a lot of the best-selling smartphones and TVs, with computers and even connected refrigerators rounding out the mix, all available with one flavor of ecosystem or another. But integrating outside platforms on your hardware while maintaining your edge through it and creating a unique proposition is another flavor of the ecosystem challenge and on the minds of many in an industry with deep roots in the device. All right, now if you'll join me now in taking the ecosystem coin as we've seen it, and if not, turning it completely over, turning it largely to a different side, and join me in welcoming Tim Baxter, President of Sales, Marketing, and Operations for Samsung Electronics America. Right, have a seat. Have a seat, Tim. Hey, grab a few and he toys. brought toys, or should I say he brought crack? That's we've got the note. We've got we, Ultra. We brought what? <laughs> Have a seat. We don't want that to get in the headlines, That's do we? Right. They couldn't Tim get Baxter the, uh, brought crack to CES. <laughs> I could not get the 75-inch TV in my pocket. Yeah, I asked so, him when he uh, came in, I go, where's the 55-inch yeah. OLED at least? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring a few goodies out. All right. Now, Tim, we've heard one 
Still pulling him out. Just to, <laughs> he's still, you're like, yeah. like a cop. You got a belt full of goodies there. It's fun time. Um, you brought out, I'm surprised you didn't wear your imperial margarine uh, crown because you are, and I'm not blowing smoke, you guys are emerging quickly as the king of CES in presence, in breath, in scope, and in ecosystem across the widest product category. As Molly was mentioning, from connected white goods all the way to the OLED televisions, laptops, tablets, smartphones, connected camera you announced here as well. Uh, tell me... Right off the bat, your first reaction is you're watching and listening to Eric's vision of how they see the ecosystem. I know that the definitions vary. You guys are in a very different space. You make and live and die on hardware. That's your game. Uh, how can you be even in the same uh, mindset as a Google? I know you guys are touching in the same place in the industry, but it seems like these companies would be so completely disparate in how they get there. I, but I think what, what ties things together in terms of the thinking is a consumer orientation. Right? And, and it really starts, in my mind, with the, the reality that, you know, the average consumer has about 30 consumer electronics devices in their home. Mm -hmm. You know, and think about all the devices you have uh, there. Um, but very few of them are connected to each other. Right? Uh, so really the opportunity uh, and, and the expectation consumers have is to bring that together in seamless and relevant ways. So I think that guides all of the participants uh, in, uh, in the value chain associated with this. So I see you guys come into that picture, absolutely, and most people in this room are probably gonna think, yeah, Samsung's gonna do a piece of that. Maybe they're gonna bring in the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the beaming, the linkage, the infrastructure. Tell us why you have a birthright to be in the software, the media, the content, and this kind of gossamer that ties that together, the experience, as we call it. Yeah, no, I think, you know, what guides us uh, is a continual passion and desire to enhance the value of the products, right? Uh, and you start there and coupled with what the consumers are looking for, right? Um, so you really need to have that as, as really the starting point on it. Uh, and in then trying to add value, uh, that value comes across in being able to share across devices, we believe, uh, and recognizing that everything isn't built um, in a common way, right? Technologies are evolving at different paces, uh, and we're bringing in a lot of disparate categories, what have historically been disparate categories, uh, a refrigerator. Right? and a television, and what is the glue that starts bringing that together is the thing that really motivates us, uh, and it's, it's really, again, driven by those expectations from a consumer standpoint. Which brings up a comment you made to me when we talked a couple of weeks ago in preparing for this, and you said, right now, uh, companies, paraphrasing, walking a tightrope between universal and proprietary to build your own value and not just be bringing Google on your platform like your competitors might be. Uh, you talked a lot about being nimble. Is that another way of saying we don't have all the answers either right now? Oh, I don't think anybody really has all the answers, right? I mean, the pace of change uh, in our industry is um, pretty remarkable. Even though <clears throat> we have been talking about these same things for decades, and I've been coming to the show for several decades, uh, and, um, uh, but it's really happening now. But it's happening in so many different ways, and the, the level and the amount of innovation uh, creates new possibilities and new challenges. So you have to be nimble in being able to seize those opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we focus on. So I want to I, I, I wanna get back to this idea of you building in, you, Samsung, building in the technology uh, largely from Android. We know that so well in your products, uh, smartphones and uh, tablets, of course. Then there's Samsung apps. You see something missing in Android, or you wouldn't have launched that platform. What is missing? Well, I don't think there's, it's a case of it's missing. As, uh, as Eric said, we have a great partnership uh, with many people in this quote-unquote ecosystem that we're talking about here. We have a great partnership with Google uh, in phones. Uh, we're partnering with them uh, and developing things in the Google TV space. And it's all recognizing that this is continuing uh, to evolve. We partner with them, and we're one of the launch partners uh, with Chrome OS and the Chrome uh, um, PC, uh, so we see that as a uh, as a big part of this. But remember, you know, we've been in the smart TV category since 2008. So we are really been in it quite a while. Uh, we have a leading position in it. Uh, we have about 1,400 apps available. Mm -hmm. Now that's not 300,000, but that's this is a television, right? So you need to make the apps relevant to the entertainment experience. 
uh, and that's what we focus on. Uh, and so we have continued to develop our strategy uh, in smart televisions, and we'll continue to do that, but we're looking for new ways and always looking for new and innovative ways uh, to further develop that. I think you just crossed a 20 million download milestone yes. on Samsung apps, so let me put it this way. What are consumers finding that is missing somewhere else by going to that app space? Well, I don't know if it's, if it's a case of missing. I think the consumers are or continuing. Or better or different. Yeah, I think consumers are just continuing to learn, and, and the phrase, the term that best describes it is discover. Right? They want to discover things, uh, and they're discovering ways to use the television uh, in, a, in a multitasking society. Right? Uh, we are bombarded. I mean, just look at you know, the CNN or the ESPN window, and you have lots of different content. There's four or five different stories going on. Consumers have adapted to that. You know, our kids have adapted to that faster than we have, um, and we are embracing that discovery and letting consumers discover new ways to add value to that experience. But we think it has to be related to the entertainment experience. It's not a productivity experience, per mm -hmm. se. Uh, it's not a pure web surfing. Uh, I want something that relates to the experience that I have, or I want to discover new ways uh, to be entertained. Uh, across device categories, is that the mission for Samsung apps and discovery in general, or is that just a television statement? I think if, if you think about uh, our strategy and our sort of view of the ecosystem, uh, and I sort of describe it this way, is uh, you know, if you imagine a house, right, uh, in one of the rooms, you know, we have a content room. Right? Uh, and that content is all the content that consumers are comfortable dealing with, whether it's Google or Netflix or Amazon or our own uh, media hub uh, that offers a library of 5,000 uh, movies and shows. But that is one room. Right? Uh, there's also another room that we're focusing on, and we call it our signature services, which are unique services that we're developing uh, specific to, the, to our um, cross-category strategy. And underpinning all of that uh, is this glue or this tissue, and we focus there on how do we make it seamless for consumers to move from content mm -hmm. from device to device or get content from the cloud, whether it's a cloud service that Netflix manages or some service that we might offer. And so our job really is <coughs> about... The middleware statement I'm it, hearing here. It is. Um, it, and, and we are, you know, we are not a cloud infrastructure company, mm -hmm. right? We are an entertainment company. We are a company that's focused on adding value in hardware and recognizing the industry and the market and the consumer expectations have dramatically shifted, you know, from these discrete devices mm -hmm. to connected devices. And all of that innovation is happening in a lot of great places. Our job is to try to bring it together for consumers in a seamless way and take out some of the angst and frustration in that process and thereby let them discover new experiences. Some of the angst and frustration, I think, comes from going to your specialty in hardware, device chop. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at Apple and their roadmap for products, they're at a, uh, a watershed high for a number of phones. They have three mm -hmm. right now actively mm -hmm. in the market. Uh, I would imagine, in aggregate, the Android manufacturers in general release three a week right. through the year. Uh, where do you detect a risk of device chop where the consumer has a hard time saying, I don't know which Samsung device I want. Maybe I can be distracted by that confusion. Isn't there a risk to that? I'm, I think it's a case of choice. And I think consumers want more than a couple choices. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and you look at it in the car industry. You look at it in, in the electronics industry. You look at it in the clothing industry. People want choices. And we're about giving them choices. Right? Uh, so I have uh, here my new Galaxy S2, which is an Android-based product that has ice cream sandwich, and I love it, and I've activated it. Right? And that works, and I, I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. right? uh, Samsung announced uh, yesterday uh, this Galaxy Note, right? which uh, is actually um, really a, a really unique concept. 5.3 you know, inch. Three, you can do this very well. Android yeah. smartphone. Um, and remarkable it's got ability to stretch a category. But then again, always having to be careful as you talk about the tightrope uh, of not creating, I mean, is, there is too much choice, right? I don't know if it's too much choice. I think it is really not the- this is, but there could be. You know, yeah, but it, there's, yeah, there, there's many choices that exist out there. It's our job to be able to articulate 
the applications and, and, and be able to communicate to the consumer relative to their needs. Mm -hmm. I want a device, maybe, that as a phone uh, and truly is a tablet, and let's create something new. So we just created and, and seen the growth in the tablet industry, right, which morphed as a uh, in between a tablet or a, uh, a smartphone and a PC. Now we've introduced something that's actually in between a tablet and the smartphone. And it's about choice and how many different devices do I want to use and when do I want to use those devices. And that's where a product like this fits in. Choice in hardware happens far less frequently than choice in content, of course. I may mm -hmm. choose a phone every two years, a laptop every three, a tablet every three or four, but I'm choosing content maybe several times a day on a weekend. Where do you get into unlocking the Hollywood? Be a role player in that. Many people are looking at Apple to say they can crack the code to get, instead of the few titles, the many. Right. Instead of the Byzantine pricing plans, the simple. Can you and do you want to play a role in cracking that code? Do you want to beat them at that game? Um, I think our focus uh, really is to work with the content providers uh, and facilitate uh, the, um, the delivery of the content the consumers want on the devices they want. Uh, so that's really our mission. Uh, we're not a content company. We don't aspire to be a content company. But as you mentioned, kind of a middleware, a gossamer yeah. layer in there, can you be the one that brokers uh, the relationship perhaps from Hollywood to Android right. by having some kind of a, a leadership role? I mean, your presence is even far greater than it was three years ago in this business. And, and I think we can, and I think we can do that um, really under uh, the premise that the I believe the content um, community wants choices in their providers and in, in, in who are <laughs> distributing uh, their content. Uh, so we provide that, uh, I think, uh, opportunity for them. Uh, the uh, Google 2.0 Samsung TV, that's coming out when again? <laughs> uh, I we, tried. We, we, right. was, you did. <laughs> I All right. <laughs> I tried twice. You tried. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, the role of, uh, you mentioned earlier, the idea of sync and seamless uh, relationship between devices. Mm -hmm. Right now, that's uh, something of a simple model, the idea that I could pause a movie on my tablet, then when I go in the house, devices know that I want to pick up the movie on the TV. Clever, right now, not even that well done, if doable, but uh, feasible. Yeah. What's more sophisticated is to say I'm going to pause an experience on one device, and when I move to a different user place, the network of devices and services I have will figure out something different that I want to do on that device because I'm not just going to say, okay, I'm navigating in the car. I don't want to carry that to the house. Watching a movie on the tablet, well, maybe when I move to a different room, I'm not in that mode anymore. Uh, is there a place within Samsung apps that you want to be that layer of the next most sophisticated sort of sync or what I think of as intimacy, transparency, and intuition? Yeah, I, th I think if you, um, you know, uh, the evolution of what is occurring here uh, is such that we've gone through a process of, of simply making content available uh, in, in a streamed fashion for the consumer, right? And that was one shift uh, that took place. Um, we announced uh, here several applications in the last 24 hours around um, being able to move the content from device to device mm -hmm. or buy it once and use it in multiple places. Uh, and we think that's the next evolution. Yesterday, we announced a, 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 an application with Technicolor, MGO, uh, that allows me access to, um, to content uh, on the television, but I also get relevant bonus content. Right? Uh, deleted scenes and games that may relate to that experience available simultaneously on my other devices. So you're starting to see that, uh, that transition. And yes, I think the expectation is, uh, and we've worked with MSOs on this um, uh, and continue to do, that I can stop and pause and take it up uh, on, from the TV uh, into the car uh, on my mobile device. So that is it's an area we are putting a great deal of energy uh, and we're working with content companies and, uh, and, and distribution companies to bring that experience alive. Again, it's one we think that is natural in terms of the expectation for, of consumers. You recently uh, took on additional duties at Samsung Electronics mm -hmm. America. You've added enterprise to what was previously a broad consumer role. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure you're very busy. Yes, right? a little bit. Uh, <laughs> The uh, enterprise role is not one that is irrelevant to this crowd anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at your ability to take market share, uh, it's now a BYOD world in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. To some degree, more and more IT folks I speak to here at the show, yes, bring your own device within parameters. Those parameters seem to be loosening within enterprises. Uh, is that 
perhaps the most ripe area you can take share in the mobile space uh, as opposed to going head on after, let's say, an Apple share argument. Maybe it's a RIM share mm -hmm. that you want to see as low hanging fruit for your mobile devices, certainly in smartphones. There's not much of a battle on tablets. Mm -hmm. um, is that yeah. a cross, an enterprise consumer cross play that you can look at? Say, we're going to be the first to really get in there and work with enterprise and be their next Blackberry, their next device that they really trust and work with, but also that delights in the individual employee as an individual. Yeah, I think the biggest shift uh, that I've seen, and now I've uh, been managing the enterprise for uh, you know about five days, uh, and so uh, put that in context. In your but, lengthy experience. Uh, in my lengthy experience, no, but uh, clearly having been in this industry for uh, you know nearly 30 years, um, I think the biggest shift that I've seen is the technology used to begin in the enterprise space. You know, new yeah. technology, and you think about it in the video. Anything is a interesting, great example, dude. right? Yeah. Uh, and now the, it's a consumerism that is driving the enterprise space, uh, and and it is that where consumers are coming in who are also in the enterprise, in in the business world, like we all are here, and saying, I want to use this device, you know, in my network. How do I do that? And the C CIO is trying to figure that out. Um, so I think there's a big shift that has occurred there, uh, and having that consumer orientation, uh, we think is a valuable component uh, in understanding the opportunities that exist for us in the enterprise space, because we've historically been a consumer company. Uh, mm -hmm. But we think there are huge opportunities for Samsung, uh, a company that is doing you know, about $150 billion a year, uh, and we see significant growth opportunities uh, in the enterprise space, and a lot of that enterprise space, we believe, is going to be connected devices, right? Uh, and so having that understanding and, and learnings that we are getting right now in the consumer space, we think will help as, as consumers look for fitness devices or other ways um, uh, to use new technology, and we think the enterprise area is one of those areas. Let's talk about some of your children and how they may squabble. If we look at ultrabooks and tablets, there's been a lot said about how the tablet maybe has a lower ceiling in terms of market acceptance than was first thought. We've gone through the iPad 1 hype cycle. There is large market share. I consider it to be a major minority, a large niche, however you want to term it, for tablets. That seems to be what's happening, especially as ultrabooks are coming out and giving you kind of the tablet experience with the file system, the human machine interface, the more powerful operating system and, pro and processor base. Uh, is, the, is there an uneasy battle between tablet and Ultrabook in terms of your spend on developing the tablet? Um, no, I, I, we look at it as, um, as, as opportunities. And anytime you have a fast growing category like tablets in just the same way like PCs over the past few years, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of segmentation that goes on. You know, and, and that's what we're seeing here, right? And it's, you know, maybe we overdefine uh, it in terms of whether it's this device as a tablet or a PC. It's what do I want to get out of this device, right? Um, I want to be able to get in and out uh, of a device, and tablets have um, provided that. Um, we are just introducing, get the show off, uh, a new uh, Samsung device. Um, this is our new Series 9 uh, notebook computer. And if you just look how thin this is, and light, right? Uh, and what it also offers uh, is a boot up time of less than 10 seconds. And our consumers responding right. to the no compromises here where the tablet has some compromises as a large mobile device. It, it, and it's a function though of what am I using it for, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my kids are using it and I often use my tablet uh, as an entertainment device uh, with some easy in and out access on productivity. I generally use my notebook as a productivity device with, uh, at, at times for me, occasional needs from an entertainment space. Uh, so um, I like the ability uh, to get in and out of a PC, and if I'm going to write a long email, I like that capability. I enjoy waking up and grabbing, not necessarily enjoy, but I have to, <laughs> uh, get the, uh, the emails and get in and out and get a few done very quickly. Mm -hmm. And a tablet or a smartphone provides that. Uh, so again, we're giving consumers choices in a very fast-growing space, um, but we think products like this provide new opportunities and new experiences for consumers uh, that are going to give them choices in, uh, in terms of what they're doing. All right, there's a story from Hardware Up. Please help me to thank Tim Baxter, who is uh, President of Sales, Marketing, and Operations, Samsung Electronics America. Tim, thank you very much.
All right, folks, now we've now heard from two very influential movers on very different sides of the ecosystem argument, uh, largely on the supply side, if you want to look at it that way. But there are other facets to this. You can't even call it sides because there are so many uh, consumers, retailers, wholesalers, and a third sort of a blended group of entrepreneurs and capital. The list of big names in the ecosystem is long. But our next panel will try to help the even longer list of new players and innovators grab a seat before the music stops. Blake Kerkorian is our inventor and entrepreneur. He has been described as a veteran of the Convergence Wars, an inventor, investor, and Amazon board member. Under his belt, Slingbox, a mobile operating system, telecom and consumer electronics consulting, one of the earliest handheld PCs, and a history of growing technologies from embryo to acquisition. Bill Gurley is the money man. He's general partner at Benchmark Capital, and his investment resume includes Clicker, OpenTable, Second Life, Uber, Voodoo, and Shopping.com. He's engineered multiprocessor servers, analyzed the IPO of no less than Amazon, and picked the winners for Wall Street during the tech boom years. These are the guys who make it happen. So whether you're a brand new company or an old established brand, listen up. Let's figure out how to make it all work. Please welcome Blake Kerkorian, co-founder of Sling Media and CEO of ID8, and also and Bill Gurley, general partner at Benchmark I'm Capital. Up already. Yeah, whatever. It's fine. All right. Take this medal. Right, here's here. Here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, guys. Nice to see nice you. To see you. Thanks for joining. You us. like our how we kind of dress? They do everything. It's good. Together. I mean, they got a lot of yeah. Good well, we dress. were going to do the uh, he was going to be Doctor Evil, and I was going to be Mini Me. I was going to come out. <laughs> I was going to come out on a on a baby Bjorn, but, but, but he hurt his back last. That might have been a little controversial. I'm just saying. I think we missed this time. There are a lot of controversies here, so maybe um, <laughs> we can do you, it. You can try that later in the show. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll do piggybacks later. So um, first of all, you guys have uh, been backstage hearing uh, from people you know well, but hearing the latest viewpoint of where they're coming from. Top line reactions right off the bat. What made you? Stroke your chin sagely and saying, yeah, it's very good, or what the hell was that? Anything in either of those cases? I liked notes. I liked the so there comment by <laughs> by Eric. <laughs> wonder, someday I'll be able to get away with that. Um, no, I, I uh, gosh. You know, I I think the way you guys have framed the the overall sort of session is is exactly right. I you know, what I just couldn't help help doing was was shaking my head the whole time that it's finally this is finally happening. And for guys like, I mean, Eric, I, I, um, Eric was on the board of a company that I worked, worked at um, back in the early 90s called General Magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, G General Magic uh, had a, an operating system for, uh, for intelligent devices. Um, Sony and Motorola had both built products, uh, physical products based on them. But they also had a, um, uh, uh, a networking programming language that a whole vision of an electronic marketplace pre-internet was going to happen, and guys like AT&T and France Telecom were going to build. And we always had this saying of sort of, it was, the ecosystem was framed in a different way, which was vehicles, highways, and destinations. And, uh, and it was pitched as a 10-year roadmap, and I was just realizing, it's like, I was, we, the vision was right, it just wasn't a 10-year roadmap, it was like a 25-year roadmap. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and it's, just, it's just finally there, and it's just amazing to see it all you know, come to fruition. And would you say that we're there? I mean, the, certainly the premise of this session is that we're there, and everybody is hoping to be there in terms of connecting mm -hmm. yeah. all the different dots. Do you think we're there, and how would you how Well, would I you think it's interesting. It? You know, I think from having a connected device in your home, we're there, right? So I, I worked with Voodoo there in like 40 million devices now, mm -hmm. installed devices. And, and so almost every one of you have some type of device that allow you to get to YouTube. And, Almost everyone has Ethernet in the back of their television. So from that perspective, we're there. I think there were two things people, people expected to happen, and I even, Brian, heard you mention this. One is everyone expected Hollywood to get run over and that that would be a sign that that had happened, and that didn't happen. Yep. Hollywood won round one of this digital. You know, it, they didn't get their distribution models torn up. Every, they didn't get a la carte pricing. They were able to maintain their power, mm -hmm. and they were very adept at how they did that. And then the second thing is I think we all kind of hoped that some startup would emerge as the UI of the connected television. That didn't happen either. Um, and the one thing I take away from the earlier sessions is just listening to uh, Eric talk about Android. You know, I I'll go out on a limb and say that I actually think Google's Android execution may be the most aggressive 
strategic initiative uh, in the history of mm -hmm. business. Like, not the history of tech, the history of business. What are they protecting? The search. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, search is a fabulous business. Mm -hmm. And if you look at search on the PC, you know, there were threats to it. So Firefox, right, had that little bar, and Google had to pay Firefox to protect that bar. And if it weren't for the consent degree, uh, IE would have been much more integrated with Bing than it has been. Mm -hmm. And so there was this opportunity to be above search in the layer and take Google away from this incredible gold mine that it has called search. Mm -hmm. So when they saw new platforms coming, they decided, hey, we're going to come up with a way to make sure that there's no one standing around us and, and getting in the way of that search. And they've and just... And protecting search beyond just the search we know, the box we're talking about, but to a higher level of discovery, right? Sure, sure. Sir, I mean, that's the, the evolution of search, which might include discovery of content, certainly includes maps, where mm -hmm. they probably invested another $700 yeah. million. Dollars. But, but it's just amazing, you know, the momentum that they have. So what are they doing wrong? If they they seem best positioned to pull it off, although there is a growing there's a growing chorus, despite what Eric says, from users about what they term fragmentation. Well, it, the fragmentation and and I don't think that Eric would deny it that fragmentation of the platform is a challenge. It most certainly is, mm -hmm. um, and I and I didn't hear him say anything different to that. Um, you know, and and of course one person's open is another person's closed from the standpoint of, I want everything to be open so long as, as it's my APIs right. and everything else, right? So there's probably a little bit of that for Merrick, but that's, you know, that's, that's to be expected. Um, you know, I think that, that, that the fragmentation will continue to be the challenge, mm -hmm. um, uh, as, as well as the strength of the platform. And you just kind of see how those things play out. I mean, it was always amazing to me. I remember as a kid growing up in Mountain View, um, you know, very close to where Apple was, was born, and uh, I could never understand why anybody would buy a PC, just because I would say those products did not work. Mm -hmm. um, and why wouldn't everyone buy an Apple? Well, you know, we saw what happened there. And so from, the, from that standpoint, you look at history, you, you think Android, you know, can be, can be and will be hugely successful. That's not, gonna, that's not to say it won't be without its, its sort of growing pains. Well, that leads to another question, actually. I'm hoping that you'll talk to us a little bit about Amazon. Oh, <laughs> Does, do you need all of these devices, or can you do a really strong sort of content? Does Amazon need a phone, or is it okay for them to power sort of a killer experience on a couple devices? Well, I mean, first off, I'm on the board, and I'm not, so I'm not at liberty oh, to probably oh, comment I, I on, on, yeah. on, on behalf of Amazon. Um, uh, but I am a customer, and uh, uh, I, I also, uh, I think that, look, I mean, from Amazon's perspective, I bought my last Android phone on Amazon. It wasn't from Amazon, so mm -hmm. who really cares? I think I think you know Amazon's vision of being the most consumer-centric company in the world remains true, and I think they'll you know they'll pick certain places where perhaps the experience they were trying to provide did not exist. Um, in fact, here's an interesting thing. I, I remember always telling them. Uh, <laughs> our folks at Sling when new people would come in and try to try to talk about the approach here. Because everyone goes, is it hardware, is it software, is it services, right? right. And, and I remember even trying to raise, raise money. Unfortunately, you didn't, I didn't get rejected by Bill. Uh, we got rejected by a lot of guys. Um, but you know, first off, when you're going raising money, people are like, are you a hardware company or are you a software company? And you know, I always say, like, OK, we're both. I, we're an experienced company. But look, if I have to try to put it in buckets, we're a software company who's now selling our software in a box of silicon. Okay, and what we tell, what, what I tell people at Sling is the approach is always, look, you first focus on what's the experience you want to provide. Then off of that, you then say, okay, well, what software needs to be developed in order to deliver that experience? And then off of that is, is there hardware that exists today that can develop and deliver that experience? If there's not, you then go build the hardware. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's cases like the Kindle e-reader where they talked about the reading experience and the buying experience and then the software and they said, look, no one else is making these products with the battery life and visibility and so we need to go solve that problem. Right. Besides that, I mean, they're very much Switzerland as well. It's like, as long as other people are providing fantastic experiences, um, they'll be happy to sell them. But Molly, I think you bring up a good point, which is these, these major ecosystems do overlap. So, you know, Amazon has historically sold analog media, books, 
records. And, and so if they want to be in that future, they have to find a way to do something that Apple's doing, right? right? Um, Facebook gets revenue from Zynga. They take 30% yep. of that game. Apple takes revenue yep. as a distributor of games. So Apple and Facebook, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why Facebook has struggled to get their, their Apple products out on time. Now, I think Apple made one mistake, and I think Apple doesn't, hasn't made many mistakes, yep. but I think they made one crucial mistake in that they got greedy on the rake. So I think the 30% rake alienated Amazon and Facebook, and they shouldn't have done that. With, with Android coming, they should have made Facebook and Amazon their best friends, had them deeply integrated into iOS the way Twitter is, and that should have happened, and that would have helped Apple, and they got greedy on the rake. And now we've got a multifaceted war with lots of big guys out there pounding around. What yeah. does Samsung have to worry about or defend against? We've heard a lot about well, how they're hitting on a lot of cylinders. I think, but I think a few things. I mean, first off, look, Samsung has, has come from, from uh, you know, being potentially out of business back in, I remember, the late 90s um, and to being the powerhouse they are today. So they, they, they deserve a ton of, a, a ton of uh, kudos there. Um, I think Samsung, just like any of, uh, you know, any of these other consumer electronics companies besides Apple, um, back to my comment about experiences, software, and then hardware, all those, you know, most of the companies here, they have it asked backwards. <laughs> they start with the hardware and kind of build up. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that's continuing to be, um, I think, a challenge. Like, you, know, you know, just to, just to maybe point out one little tiny, one, one little tiny nit in a, in, in a product, uh, you know, that, that Samsung created uh, to the point that Eric was making about, you don't just deliver the, the product with the spec sheet and the, uh, and the check boxes, it's got to work. So somehow there should be some rule where you know, maybe people can vote and it's like if a product has a feature and enough people vote and say the feature doesn't work, they have to remove it from the list of things. But you know, so like, so like take the Samsung television and again, I've just bought three Samsung televisions so I, and I thought it was the best TV out there. That being said, I'm really into, into some you know, control and multi-screen sort of things. And I got all excited at first because I said, oh wow, you know, the Samsung TV comes with this um, iPhone interface or iPhone app that lets you control your television set. And I thought, okay, wow, that's great, you know, that's, that really is forward thinking and so forth. And then I went to go use it, and I realized that, well, it, it did do all the things except for it was missing one very, very important command. Probably the most important command of, of anything from controlling your TV. What do you think that command was? Turning it on, actually. <laughs> you couldn't turn it on uh, because, guess what, the, the, you know, the Ethernet, the Ethernet chip was asleep when the TV was off. So therefore, I had to go grab my other darn remote, my R remote, hit the button, and then I could go control it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's understanding that those details are so critical. It's not just about getting the feature and saying, hey, I now have it, just like the other guy does, but do I have it? It just sounds so basic. Do I have it and does it work? And, I mean, and you know, I think that Samsung understands that they need to keep improving, just like all these other companies. I think Samsung and HTC are probably the two that have shown the most progress there. Um, but that's still a huge challenge for these guys. Bill, Samsung, Achilles heels for them as an instructive lesson for a variety of companies that have their general yeah. structure. Well, I think, I think they've benefited by um, almost by not being overly uh, caught up in their own, you know, way of viewing things. You know, I contrast it with Sony who has all these visions of their own software stack and all yep. these mm -hmm. kind of things um, whereby they can't... Um, kind of get their arms around the open standards that are out there or, you know, in this case, Android. And so by being there first, I think that's been helpful to them. I think in the long run, they'll face the same challenges that a, a Dell faced in the PC world. And, and uh, you know, I think it's a very similar, you know, I think it's a great analogy for what's going on here, which is based on what I see, Android's just getting started. It's going to become very dominant in, in every home and car and and all these kind of things. And once that happens, you know, then a whole new set of challenges will arise for how you differentiate. Well, it almost of... seems like you're arguing for, you know, inadvertently arguing for Android as a plug and play solution for these hardware manufacturers. So it's not their core competency. I, I, think, go ahead. I think, yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. no, please, please. I was continue. just going to say, I think it's too late. I think the cat's out of the bag. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at how things become self reinforcing. The one, as I walked around the show today, the one thing that just, really, really blew me away was, you know, looking at the synergy between ARM 
and Android. Mm -hmm. And so you go look at, you know, in the Marvell booth, you know, at what they're doing with the ARM mm -hmm. processor. They've got these little demo boxes for connected TVs. The kits are like 20 bucks, but the point is there's all this ecosystem that's building around that. And, you know, Snapdragon and, uh, you know, at Qualcomm. So Qualcomm, Marvell, you know, all these semiconductor companies are doing these ARM cores that are 99 cents. And, and, you know, and they're all doing it on Android because the Windows 8 thing just got announced last mm -hmm. night and it doesn't exist. And that's just monstrous amounts of effort. And that all leads to experimentation. It leads to cost reduction. And it's just a tsunami. Well, well and, and the point, I mean, Eric, you know, Eric said something else that I think was, is absolutely dead on, which is they have delivered on the openness from the standpoint of letting people actually fragment or differentiate. Right. I mean, he'd rather see the differentiation, but he, they're allowing the fragmentation. But frankly, fragmentation is bad. It also equates to innovation. And, and to allow the innovation to happen. I mean, a perfect little, little project I've been working on the past couple of years was I was trying to do a bunch of home automation and control in my house. And my first thing, I was gonna use iOS devices um, as the main control point. And you know what? When it came down to like using that iPad as a remote control or something, or putting the iPad in the wall, it was a horrible experience because I didn't want to have to walk up to the damn thing and, and swipe to unlock it. It's like the damn thing should like just have the proximity sensor and turn on. And I even know the guys in Cupertino, so I'm calling to see if they could let me kind of work around that. No, 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 no. It you know, brought me over just as a developer, brought me over into that Android platform because then I could just go ahead and just tweak this UI as right. much as I want. And, 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 and Google's investing in developer relations the way Microsoft That's actually, used, that's used a very good 20, point. 20, 25 yeah. years ago. Which, by the way, the guy who runs Android and started Android, Used to, Andy Rubin used to work at General Magic 20, yeah. 20 years ago. So it's, it's kind of interesting to so see how that you, comes if back. You go to, if you go to the Android Developer Relations team, first of all, they're, they're just so happy to see you. What can we do for you? <laughs> you know, just yeah. like Microsoft used yeah. to do. Tails wagging. But when you say, hey, I want a, a device that auto starts, or I want a device that's locked down, they go, here's three o e OEMs yeah. that are developing hardware like that. Here's a, and so you're, you know, you're right in calling them out for the fragmentation, but it's, it won't be a failure. It'll be a benefit. I was in an AT&T store over Christmas, and just looking at the layouts, there were three iPhone stations and 20 Android stations. Mm -hmm. And within there, there's one with a big screen, one with a little screen, one with a keyboard this way, one with a keyboard this way. And, you know, people are walking around and looking at them, mm -hmm. trying to think about what they want. And so the real reason we want to get you guys on stage is because you're both entrepreneurs and, and or the money guys, mm -hmm. what do you do if you're, a new, if you're a new player, right? In this new world where it feels like you maybe have to have a hardware solution, a contact, bunch of content deals, some apps, it, is it possible to break in or are you pretty much just an app developer? What would come across your desk tomorrow that you would get real excited about? Yeah. No, no, it's your desk, not my desk. <laughs> it's your desk. <laughs> it's you're Bill's got desk. the money. Sorry, Bill, it's your desk. <laughs> Let's look at Bill's desk. You know, it's tough. You know, I've, I've, I've worked with two incredible teams, the Voodoo team and the Clicker team, and, and we had good outcomes, but they weren't blow-away outcomes. And there's a lot of power players. I mean, with what Google's doing with Android, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to destroy uh, so much market cap. You know, it's already happened to RIM and Nokia and, you know, and it, you know Telenav and, uh, you know, I think Garmin's, you know, in, got a lot, you know, with the... And so... It's with that big a force out there, it's hard, it's hard to find a high ground. And then Hollywood, you know, has played this game extremely well. So, you know, Hulu took $200 million and a ton of proprietary content to get off the ground. And Netflix is now, looks like they're going to have to spend a billion dollars in content. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to have to, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you an example of someone who has done it. And I've been blown away is the GoPro guys, mm -hmm. you know. So it was off the beaten path. They weren't trying to, to yeah. take over the, the, an old world or one that was highly choreographed. Yeah. They went to a new market and really blew it away, really nailed it, built a product that was differentiated around that use case, but it was a new use case. Yep. And they got out in front of a huge wave, and they've yeah. done an amazing job. Which, they, started which, at, they started at the experience. They started the experience and the lifestyle and worked their way down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can bet, you know, they, they probably don't have much in the way of DSP engineers doing image sensing technology and, and that. That's not what it's about. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, I, I think that there's, I continue to believe that, that there is a huge opportunity for entrance um, in all places in the ecosystem. Um, I happen to, to love gadgets and, and, and love the hardware element, and, and I think that, on one hand, it's, 
it's certainly a tough business and you have to have your act together all the way through, right? It's not just about, oops, you kind of messed up on a DRAM chip and, you know, now you can just hit the reset button and start over. It's you just bought, you know, 100,000 100, units of inventory, you're screwed. So, yeah. so you got to really have your act together and there's huge barriers, but there's still such an opportunity for companies who understand all those pieces, but actually and understand how to approach it again from the experience on down, because I think it's going to take a long time for these traditional hardware companies to really, really re reinvent how they how they how they approach things. You know, besides that, you know, the start it's hard. I mean, and it is getting harder and harder and harder. There's no question. Um, you know, the other the other thing from a, from from startup companies, it's about you know obviously being disruptive, right? If you can find out where you can disrupt in a particular area, maybe there's an established player who's got a you know huge market share, and there you see something some evolution that's going to happen, and it's just hard for them to move. Um, you know, that's uh, I think there's still going to be opportunities, but they are becoming tougher and tougher. Yeah. All right. All right. Great guys. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, thank uh, join us in thanking our two panelists here at the next big thing, Blake Gregorian and Bill Gurley. Thank you. Thanks so much. Stay there for a second. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. So great. Okay. You can go ahead and head that way. All right, folks. Uh, thank you. Not just our awards, we put them together for the CEA. That's coming up Thursday at 11 o'clock on the CNET stage. And Wednesday at 5 o'clock at the CNET stage again, South Hall above the Starbucks. A women in tech panel, our first one ever, will have Google's Marissa Meyer, Padma Warrior from Cisco, and Katerina Fake, the co-founder of Flickr, and most recently founder of Hunt. We'll be talking mm -hmm. about women in tech. That's going to be an amazing panel. So I hope you'll join us. That's at 5 o'clock on Wednesday. And, of course, also at our stage, 50 Cent, Eliza Dushku, LL Cool J today. So <laughs> pull up a chair and spend a day there. You'll be amazed what you find at the CNET stage. And don't forget to go to ces.cnet.com, our official hub for all CES coverage, and to really know where we're going with the way forward. Constant live coverage. We have blog coverage of all the major announcements, streaming keynotes live, and videos of all kinds from CNET editors bringing you their special expertise for all the technology that matters here at the show. Uh, thank you all for being here. And enjoy the rest of the show. Yes, totally. Hey there, everybody. This is Jason Heiner, editor in chief of Tech Republic. And Bill Detwaller, head technology editor of Tech Republic. Today, we're going to do a live cracking open of the Amazon Kindle Fire. So, this is something that we do pretty regularly at Tech Republic. We tear apart uh, technology so that you don't have to, and we tell you what's inside, 
you know, what you can learn from it and what, how these devices uh, are built and, and how you could repair them if something happens to them. So, Bill, why don't you tell them a little bit about what we do in tech, in, on Tech Republic uh, in terms of cracking open and how it started and what the story is. Well, the first thing that we took apart way back several years ago was the original Xbox 360. And our audience liked it so much that we decided that we would keep doing it. And, you know, we do cracking open for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is our audience of IT professionals really likes to know what's inside these devices. You know, it helps them know where the possible pain points are, what things might break, and, you know, how their users who are probably going to abuse these things, yep. you know, might damage them. And if they need to fix it, it helps them, you know, do that. It also helps them, you know, we have a budget at Tech Republic. We can afford to go out and I can buy a Kindle or an $800 tablet or an $800 phone and take it apart. And if I break it, uh, you don't get too mad at me. But if uh, a lot of our audience breaks it, you know, they have people that get kind of angry. They can afford to do that. So That's we right. do it so you don't have to. Yeah, a lot of people actually, especially devices that are, are hard to find and we get a hold of one, people sometimes get mad at us. They're like, I can't believe you took that thing apart and you, um, you know, uh, destroyed it when, um, you know, I can't even get a hold of one and I want to get one. But one of the sort of the secret sauce, there's a lot of companies that do these kind of teardowns. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the things that we do because we're trying to help people also put them back together is we always put them back together, right? We try yep. to get them back together in working order. About 90% of the time, I'm able to get what I take apart back together. For example, the Kindle Fire that we're taking apart today is the one that we had taken apart previously. And, and as there it is. you can probably see, you know, there it is, up and running. So we're going to take it apart again and hopefully get it back together a second time. Yes, yeah, so I should say Tech Republic is a community, online community and trade publication for technology professionals. We are a sister site of CNET, so that's why we're here on the CNET stage today um, doing this, and we're going to be doing another one tomorrow with the Samsung Galaxy Nexus. So, Bill, let's get started and get this thing cracked open. All right. Well, you know, when we take these things apart, one of the things that we always look for, the hardest thing to do for a lot of these devices is get inside them. You know, manufacturers don't want you to get inside them. They want them to be returned to the store to fix. So it's always a little bit of a challenge. Sometimes you have to look for hidden screws or, you know, there are one-time use removable tabs, such as on the original iPad, that you have to break or that you have to crack uh, to get the cover off. Now, on the Kindle Fire, luckily, it's not too difficult to take this thing apart. The back cover snaps off. So I've got a handy tool here called a little metal blade, and it's kind of thin. And what it does is I'm able to get this metal blade inside uh, between the back cover and the front panel or display assembly. And using this blade, as you can see here, and I by can the way, pop before loose. we use this, we used to use a butter knife. <laughs> so you, we've got special tools to do this, but That's right. there are ways that you can do it. We do recommend you use the special tools, though. That, we'll tell you a little bit more about where you can get some of these. Yeah, if you don't want to use something that's metal, I'm not too concerned about marring the case a little bit. There are specialized plastic case opening tools uh, that you can use to do the job, but, you know, like I said, I'll use the metal tools, and sometimes I'll even use my finger to get a little bit, uh, a little bit crazy. So what we're going to do here is we're going to work our way around the Kindle Fire. So, so Bill, wh while you're doing that and you're, you're pulling this open, yeah. um, why don't you talk a little bit about how we choose the products that we do to crack open? Because we do one of these mm -hmm. every week, right? We do. We, we try to choose products, uh, the latest smartphones, the latest tablets. You know, we've even done gaming systems. We've done the PS3. Uh, we've done the Xbox 360 that I mentioned. Uh, we've even done old computers. You know, we've done a Tandy TRS-80 Model 100, you know, an old school laptop. Uh, we've done an old Osborne. We've taken apart lots of uh, tech, both new and old. So we're just looking for things that are interesting, that our audience of IT professionals uh, might have to support in their daily lives or just might be interested in. And some of it's just for fun. We know some of it is uh, that, yeah, that you guys are, are curious. We're geeks. You're geeks. You know, it's, uh, it's satisfying the curiosity. Most people who are in technology got into it because they're curious, naturally curious. And, so all of us are curious to see what, what goes on inside. You know, as Bill said, um, I'm going to toot his own horn a little bit because he won't do it himself. Um, you know, getting these things apart is pretty difficult. And we went through a period where we, were, um, we would hire other people to do these. 
Uh, and what we got back was some of these would come back and they would just be, it looked like somebody used a hatchet to get into these, you know? And, and we have some really good and competent um, contributors that, that write for us and are very highly technical, but doing this is a little bit of an art. It's kind of like brain surgery. And um, so after we trialed a little bit of other people doing it, um, we eventually went back to having just Bill do it because um, he knows how to get into it without <laughs> totally destroying the device and like he said almost always gets it back together and this is a pretty big battery right now if you haven't wow. seen any of our cracking opens before most of the space inside these tablet devices is usually taken up by the battery or the display that runs the entire length of the tablet but the battery has to be big we all like a lot of battery life on our devices so they put these large batteries in here and you'll see here we also have the main printed circuit board we have some speakers which we'll be tearing out and removing here in a, a, a minute but you know this battery on the kindle uh, fire is a good battery um, it's a little smaller capacity than the iPad yeah, or I mean, the Samsung I Galaxy remember tab, but when you it's pretty first, good. When you first got the original iPad opened, you know, the first day that it came out, um, the, the real big shock factor was that it was all, they, it had two long batteries mm -hmm. in it. I mean, almost the whole case was taken up by, by battery, right? That was, um, right. It, it's two batteries, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, okay. it is. Or it's one battery unit, these two large cells. Okay. And so, you know, Speaking of the battery, that's the first thing that I like to do when I get inside one of these devices, and I recommend everybody does, always disconnect the battery. You don't want charge running across any of the components uh, that you might short out, you might damage the device. So you always disconnect the battery first, and then okay. go on to uh, disassembling the rest of the device. So with the battery disconnected from the printed circuit board, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna separate the battery from the internal metal frame. Now, okay. unfortunately, Amazon, when they built the Kindle uh, Fire, they did something I don't like. They used glue. So the battery is held to the back of this internal frame with glue. Now, yeah, that may not be a problem if the battery is actually a solid, hard piece, but it's not. It's actually two battery cells that are flexible. As you can see, I don't know if you can see how this is bending a little bit. Well, that's really the only danger, other than flying pieces of glass poking me in the eye. Um, the battery is really the only dangerous part of the device. If I were to puncture the battery, damage it in some way, these are lithium ion batteries, they could spark a fire, could be something like that. So we don't want that. We don't want that, especially not here. So I'm gonna very <laughs> carefully, using a thin metal blade again, I'm going to try and remove a little bit of the adhesive or separate a little bit. And with that, the battery will lift away. And so now we have okay. the battery uh, for the Amazon uh, Kindle Fire here. Now, if you can get, you know, one of the things, like we said with the uh, cracking open, is we like to show people how to repair these. Yep. And I get at least a dozen emails a week from people that want to know how to repair them. And a lot of them are easy to repair. Some of them are a little more difficult than others. Uh, but the big problem is that you can't get spare parts. Yeah. So if you could get spare parts, yep. and you pop the back cover off, and you had a problem with the battery, you could replace the battery if you wanted. Uh, but it's very difficult to get spare parts because most of the manufacturers don't want you to take them apart, as I yep. said before. They want you to send them back. Or buy a new one. Or buy a new one, always. You know? <laughs> Engineered obsolescence. Yep. So, you know, one of the interesting things that, uh, you know, people often say is that, you know, by us doing this, they get a, a, also a sense for um, how these companies put together their products, how much care they put into the internal design of the products, right? Mm -hmm. And you uh, comment on this a lot. Every time you do one of these cracking opens, you do an analysis piece um, on Tech Republic, on your blog, Cracking Open on Tech Republic. Um, so tell me a little bit about what was your impressions of the design of the Kindle Fire and how it compared to the design of some of the other tablets, especially the seven inch tablets you, you've taken apart before. Well, I like the Kindle Fire. Uh, they definitely put, Amazon definitely put some thought into the internal design as well as the external design. Yeah. So it's, it, it's well built inside. It's pretty sturdy. Uh, it doesn't okay. twist. Um, I'll show you guys why here in a second. Um, it's, it's not filled with masking tape. You know, one of the things that I hate to see when I take these devices apart are just wires that run willy-nilly all over this, all over the inside, and are just held in place with tape. And there are some you and see lots of. Bit, I've even seen like that. some electrical tape, or almost looks like little pieces, not of duct mm -hmm. tape, but sort of you know, um, 
industrial strength kind of tape right. that they put across these things. You didn't have that here. Okay. Um, also, the screen and the digitizer, the front glass panel, are actually not fused together. So you can replace those if you need to. Ah. Um, so right here, I've gone ahead and I've removed the two Phillips screws. The other thing that I really like about Amazon is they use standard Phillips screws inside. There's no tri-wing screws like Apple used on the iPhone 4, yeah. uh, iPhone 4S. Uh, there are no special hex screws inside. It's just really small. And so you have to have a really small screwdriver uh, to take the screws out, but once you do, it's not too difficult. So, so what's this piece you're pulling out now? This is the speaker assembly. So the Kindle Fire has uh, two speakers. You can see them here. Uh, and the wire runs along the sign in its own individual channel. Again, yeah. that's nice. Amazon put some thought into the design. Ah, yes. They didn't just run the wire across the battery, under the battery, and hold it in place with tape. Right. Now, once we remove uh, the speaker from the frame, we'll have to disconnect it from the motherboard. Now, this is where it can get a little bit tricky. Um, removing these connectors can be delicate. You want to take your time so that you don't damage so this is any another, of the sensitive components. This is another good point of the way um, Bill does this. When he takes these apart, there are times when things don't want to uh, come. They don't want to come apart. And so one of the things, I'll go in there and you know I'll be checking on him when he's, when he's uh, doing a cracking open and uh, I'll ask him, you know, how's it going? He's like, well, I just can't get you know, the, the speaker assembly uh, apart, for example. And, uh, and so I'll say, okay, and I'll, you know, I'll come back 20 minutes. And I'll say, how's that going? He's like, boy, I still can't get you know, this, this uh, speaker assembly. I'm trying to figure out, is there another screw or is it adhesive? And um, the thing is, you have to be kind of zen with it, don't you? Yeah. you? You sort of have to treat it gently because um, one of the things that we've noticed when we did send it out and had other people doing some of these for us is if they, they would get impatient with it and they would force it, right, it, and break it. You really can't force it. You really have to take your time with these uh, cracking opens. Otherwise, you're liable to break something. And like I said, if you break it, it's pretty much done. I mean, there are only a few things that you can, uh, that you can repair on your own um, easily. You know, if I crack one of these chips, yeah. if I break one of these contacts, it's done. Uh, this is a break. Yeah. So you really have to be careful doing that. Um, with the, uh, now that I've got the speakers removed, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect all of the other ribbon cables and wires uh, from the main printed circuit board here. Okay. So we've got cables that run from things like, uh, there's a small printed circuit board here at the bottom. Uh, there is a uh, thin ribbon cables for the digitizer and for the uh, LCD display. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna remove both of those. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna see if we can't remove the uh, main circuit board here, or the motherboard, if you will. Sounds good. Now, when Bill, while Bill's doing this here, you know, it's one thing, because um, he's, he, one, he, he's done this one before, um, and you can find the gallery up on Tech Republic. Um, if you just do a search for cracking open the Amazon Kindle Fire, you can find that gallery. Um, but when he's doing it in the studio for the first time, one, he doesn't always know what he's got when he gets in there, and then two, he's taking photos at the same time. So it's a bit like you know rubbing your stomach and patting your head at, at, at the same time. So we've got some pictures actually of Bill um, in the studio working on a cracking open, I think it's of the iPhone 4 or iPhone 4S um, that, uh, that we've got here that we'll put up on the screen in a minute. Um, so we've got some photos of him doing that. We, we also have some photos of you taking apart an Android device mm -hmm. as well. But in the photos, you'll see that he's got this, the device cracked open. And at the same time, he's, he's working the camera um, as well. So, Bill, how do you do that? How do you sort of manage the process? Because there's another thing that you're doing. Maybe you could talk about the third thing that you're doing in the process as well. Well, yeah, when we're taking these apart, like I said, I'll usually remove a component move the device over to where we take our to our photo studio where we take the photos or the photos and we have them right next to each other so it's not too big of a thing yeah um, and then we have to make notes about what we're taking apart yes and then we have to find those components because it, there are very small serial numbers on these components and we're have to be writing them down because we're going to go back to tell our audience because most of the time the manufacturers don't tell us exactly what these chips are so we have to do a little bit of detective work um, on the internet or talking to the manufacturer if they'll tell us uh, and ask them what these chips are. Yeah, so, um, you know, that's another part of the analysis post. I mentioned that when Bill, whenever he does one of these um, posts, uh, one of these cracking opens, he does a blog post with it. And in, in his blog post, he does an analysis of the hardware, and that includes all of the chips um, that 
you uh, that, that he finds mm -hmm. when he looks uh, in, in inside. So he lists the chips that are inside. So that way, you, if you're looking at one of these, you can compare literally what's inside these devices. You know, one to another. And, and Bill will talk a little bit about that um, and and about the things that he finds. You know, in a minute here, we'll talk about the difference between the devices. Yeah, so now that I've got all the uh, cables uh, disconnected from the primary circuit board here, um, we're going to go ahead I'm going to try and lift it out. Now, the circuit board on the Kindle Fire, again, if I've removed all the screws, which I believe I have, uh, it should come loose. But again, it's held together with adhesive. So I'm not really nuts um, on okay. that, but it's okay. You just have to be gentle. You can't just pull this thing out and expect it to come out because oftentimes there are small ribbon cables hidden underneath these circuit boards uh, okay. that can break. Uh, you don't want to rip one of the ribbon cables or break it because, again, I may or may not be able to get a yeah. replacement part for that. So, Bill, why, did, why would companies put this with adhesive and not just put a screw to hold it together? Well, they're often trying to do a couple things. I mean, one thing is they, they want it to be reliable. They want it to be sturdy. They don't want things to move around inside the case. Um, they also, uh, some of the lesser well-designed devices yep. um, may, it's cheaper maybe to use tape and just to run a, a, run to a do cable a screw. than to do a screw. And as I said, these really aren't designed to be user serviceable uh, products. So they intend that when these are going to be taken apart, they're going to be done in a lab for a refurbishment, you know, and to be sent back out. It's not something that the user is going to do. Uh, yep. But luckily, the main printed circuit board here uh, for the Kindle Fire comes right out. Uh, and you can see most of the chips uh, on it here on the front um, and a few chips on the back. And a few, actually, there's a, the, the ports, the power port and the uh, USB port, the mini USB port here, okay. uh, are located on it as well. Very good. So, Bill, let's talk for a minute about um, one of the things that we get the most questions about, which is the actual digitizer that mm -hmm. the, um, the screen itself and the digitizer, which is under it, these are two different things. Because um, we get a lot of people that say, look, I dropped my device, I cracked the screen. Um, I don't want to buy another, you know, a new device. Um, can I fix the device myself? Right? You get this question yeah, a lot. I get the question and a lot. why don't you explain a little bit about the difference between these two things and, and what this process is like? Well, I got an email just this week from a lady who had just that problem. Okay. What she'd done is she dropped the device. She'd actually cracked the LCD screen and not, I'm going to flip this over for a little bit, uh, even though we're taking it apart here. Uh, the front glass panel. You know, there's a glass panel here. Uh, that's not the LCD. The LCD is actually mounted behind that, underneath that. Uh, this is the digitizer. This is what takes your finger and uh, trans translates that into the motion of the cursor, detects the touch, and then you see that. You see the uh, the effect of that on the digit on the LCD screen. So. Sometimes these are a single component. Sometimes they're held together with really strong adhesive. Okay. And other times they're actually like they are in the Kindle Fire. They're two separate, uh, two separate components that you can pretty easily remove. So you just have to make sure that if you crack the front glass panel, um, or if you crack the screen, to make sure which one you actually crack and buy the replacement part for that device. Okay. So how can you tell the difference between whether to know whether you've cracked the screen or if you've cracked the digitizer? Well, the easiest way to do it is honestly to just run your finger across the front screen. Okay. I mean, and if you, you feel if the you cracks? feel that the glass is cracked, then you know you've cracked the digitizer. Now you may have also cracked the uh, LCD, but usually it's the uh, digitizer that gets cracked. Okay. That's what can't take the shock uh, yeah. from it being dropped on its edge or on its side. But if it looks like it, if that not just the glass on the outside, but the screen on the inside, it's important for people to know that those are two different parts yep. um, and that they will have to replace both. What's the cost typically when, some, when you're replacing one of these things? For, for instance, the iPhone is one that we hear a lot. People drop, it has glass all the way out to the edge. If you drop that on a hard surface, it, it cracks pretty you know, commonly. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it can be pretty expensive. Okay. Um, you know, if you take it back to Apple or to the manufacturer, they're going to charge you a pretty penny uh, to replace it. And if you can buy a third party um, or an aftermarket part on the internet, sometimes you can get one for 50 bucks, uh, okay. maybe 100 bucks uh, to replace the digitizer. It really depends on how popular the product is. The more popular the product is, then the more likely there are to be replacement parts available on the internet. And so you're more likely to find a replacement part than you are if the product is, you know, only sold a few parts or isn't that pop isn't that popular. 
Very good. So one of the things that if, if someone is drops an iPhone, um, for instance, um, there are now, and, and, and also a lot of other touchscreen phones uh, as well, there are these third-party um, shops that have cropped up that will fix it for you, right? Mm -hmm. how, how reliable are those? Is that a good idea? Well, it really depends. You know, I have not having until I've worked with a specific one, I wouldn't make a recommendation. Sure. Uh, but, you know, if you go in and you've talked to people and uh, they have a good experience with it, uh, then yeah, you can take them there. If you don't feel comfortable doing the, this uh, yourself, just remember that your product, you know, if it's out of warranty, is probably the only time that you really want to do this. If yep. your product is in warranty, don't take it apart. You know, I've gotten emails <laughs> from people who say, well, you know, my product, I just got it. I'd like to see what's inside of it. Can I take it apart? And I say, don't do that. Yeah. Um, it's a perfectly good working device. If you're not very careful, you can damage it, and I don't want to be responsible for that. So don't do this at home. We don't recommend, know. that's why we recommend that you watch uh, Tech Republic's cracking open so that you don't have to take these apart, um, hopefully, and uh, you know deal with it yourself. So um, we do uh, these every week, as Bill said, so we have done them on almost all of the most products, popular products um, in tech, so you can find these again at the Cracking Open blog on Tech Republic, you can find lots of them. Um, we do galleries, um, we do Bill's, uh, Bill does his analysis post, we also do um, videos often on a lot of these as well, some short videos. All right, Bill, so now you're almost done with the Kindle Fire mm -hmm. here. Um, you've done a lot of tablets. You've really, you've cracked open in, in 2011. Uh, you cracked open pretty much all of the leading tablets on the market. Um, tell us, how does this one compare? Um, tell us a little bit about what you've learned about some of the other different tablets uh, on the market and which ones impressed you when you cracked them open and uh, maybe which ones didn't impress you. Well, the Kindle Fire is a solid tablet. I mean, uh, from a build perspective, it's okay. got decent hardware inside of it, a good one gigahertz chip. It's not the fastest chip out there, but it's a decent Texas Instruments OMAP processor. It's got 512 megabytes of RAM, so that's uh, about average for yeah. a tablet. It's got an eight gig uh, NAND flash storage card in. Again, about average. You know, it's it's not as feature rich as a full price tablet, but then again, it's not as expensive either. Yep, 199. Um, Speaking about other tablets that have pretty quality, uh, pretty good quality to them, you know, Apple, uh, I've taken apart the iPads and the iPhones. They have pretty good quality, uh, or very good quality. They're not the easiest devices to take apart. Very, one you of know, the more difficult, They're one right? of the more difficult devices to take apart. They don't really apart. want you in, in there. No, they don't want you in there at all. Uh, but, you know, the Kindle Fire is good. I really like, and I get this question a lot, what is the best tablet? And, you know, that's kind of hard to answer because it yeah. really depends on what you want to do with it. Yep. But I really like some things like the Sony Tablet S. It okay. has a really nice, underdog. interesting... Underdog. Yeah, it, an underdog. It may not be the best tablet from a functionality standpoint, but from a build perspective, it's really nice. Okay. Now, I remember one that you took apart. Every once in a while, you take apart, and you, can, you, you say that when you take a... a uh, you often say when you take one of these tablets apart, you can tell a lot about what mm -hmm. kind of company built it, right? That's right. So yeah. tell, tell us some more about that. Well, I took apart a couple of the tablets from HTC, the HTC Flyer, which is a small size tablet, and I could really tell that they have, they have their roots, or at least recently, in cell phone manufacturing. In the phone business, Because yeah. the inside of the Flyer looked like a cell phone. A lot of the other cell phones that I've taken apart from HTC, the Flyer just looked like a sized up one. And so you can really tell a lot from the, uh, from the construction about what sort of the history of the device was. When I took apart the um, HP touchpad, for instance, yeah. you know, you could see HP's experience building PCs. Everything was highly componentized. Everything was um, very uh, differentiated. There were a lot of individual components. It was really made to be repaired. Okay. To put back together and to, re to be repaired, more like a PC or a laptop would be. So you could see that on the inside. You could get into it yourself pretty easily too, you right? You could, you could. I mean, about the only thing that's left to re be removed here, and you were asking about the digitizer yes. and the LCD, uh, on the tablet is the display. I've okay. already removed all the, uh, the motherboard, the speakers, uh, the battery. We even have the, um, the frame. But the only thing left to be removed is the, uh, is the display, and then we'll have a fully cracked open, a fully disassembled uh, Kindle Fire. Very good, very good. So 
Bill, what other stuff um, have you cracked open? Why don't you mention to the audience some of the other things? Um, you mentioned some of the old tech. You mentioned some of the um, the, the things that we've done. Um, the original, we did the original Xbox 360 five mm -hmm. years ago. Again, that was the first thing that we we uh, cracked open. Uh, there's the digitizer. Very good. Yep. So here's the here's the digitizer. Okay. This is the front glass panel right here, and then here's the display. This really thin LCD display. Well, how easy that is to see for everybody that's standing out there. But you can see how fragile this is. You know, yes. if I were to twist this or to drop this or to break it, then it's done. But the nice thing is that you know you can replace it. So so you here know. you can see the difference between the glass, which is the mm -hmm. digitizer, and the LCD display, right. which if there's a drop, you may have both. You may so. have to replace it. So, you know, we've cracked open everything from really expensive servers. You know, I've taken open I, small business IBM servers, some of their stuff, that's really popular with the audience. And we've taken apart old uh, computers, like I mentioned with the uh, TRS Trash 80. Uh, we've taken apart um, smartphones and the iPhones, the Samsung Galaxy Nexus which we'll actually be taking apart here tomorrow. Tomorrow, on the stage, we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, so we do Talk that, that, we do yeah. that a lot. I mean, anything that we think our audience is interesting in, anything that you'd see here at CES. So, you know, I always encourage our audience, the people that watch our Cracking Open, if you see something that's here at CES that you want me to take apart, email me. I'll yeah. take it apart. Contact me on Tech Republic, and I'll take it apart. Very good. Okay, so you can also find um, Bill Detweiler and I on um, Twitter as well, that's an easy way to find us and let us know that, uh, you know, what you'd like us to crack open. Um, he's at Bill Detweiler, I'm at Jason Heiner. Um, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, CNET Live's coverage of CES resumes tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Bill and I will be back to crack open the Galaxy Nexus tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Eastern. So good night from CNET Live at, Los at CES Las Vegas. <laughs>